16. The Front Bathroom Incident Winston Blount called a couple of times during the next few days. His cabal was very anxious to talk further about what we talked about. Robert put him off and refused to talk privately. He could almost hear Winnie's teeth grinding in frustration, but the guy gave him another week. Robert had several more interviews with the real, well, he could hope it was the real, Sharif. They were a heartwarming reminder of the good years, and totally unlike his encounters with the mysterious stranger. The young grad student gushed semi-intelligent enthusiasm, except that sometimes he seemed fond of science fiction. Sometimes. When Robert mentioned this, Sharif looked stricken. Ah, the mysterious stranger strikes again. Or maybe there were three entities animating the image of Zulfikar Sharif. Robert began to track each word, each nuance. Juan Orozco's compositions had blossomed. He could write complete sentences intentionally. The boy seemed to think that this made Robert Gu a genius of a teacher. Yes, and someday soon there will be chimpanzees who look up to me. But that thought did not escape Robert's lips. Juan Orozco was working to his limits. He was doomed to mediocrity, much as Robert himself, and spreading the pain of such knowledge was not appealing anymore. The mysterious stranger stayed out of sight. Maybe he thought Robert's own need was the best salesman. The bastard. Robert returned again and again to the references the stranger had given him. They described three medical miracles of the last ten months. One was an effective treatment for malaria. That was not such a big deal, since cheaper cures had existed for years. But the other two breakthroughs related to mood and intellectual disorders. They were not examples of Reed Weber's random heavenly minefield. Both had been commissioned by the customers they cured. So what? Miracles happened in this modern age. What proof was there the stranger could create them? He pulled up the documents the stranger had given him. Their visual representation was as medieval letters of credit, envelopes sealed with wax. If one broke the metaphor, it was easy to look inside and see the lower layers, a few megabytes of encryption. Useless nonsense. But if you followed the metaphor from the top, then you found pointers to magic tools to employ the certificates, and other pointers to the technical papers that explained what these tools actually did with the underlying data. For three days now, Robert had been digging through those papers. The old Robert would not have had the intellect for this. God had taken away his true and unique genius, and perversely given him this analytical talent in return. Playing with protocols was fun. Okay, another couple of days and he would put it all together, and call the stranger's bluff. Meantime, he was falling further behind in his work with Juan for Chumlig's composition class. Will you have time to work on my graphics suggestions? Juan asked one afternoon. Before tomorrow, I mean. That was when their current weekly project was due. Yes, sure. The kid had been great about working to Robert's directions. He felt a sliver of shame for not reciprocating. I mean, I'll try. I've got this problem with some outside things. Oh, what? Can I help? Lord. Some security documents. They're supposed to prove that a, um, friend of mine was really involved in solving a game problem. He made one of them visible to Juan. The kid looked at the wax and gilt and parchment. Oh, a creditot. I've seen certs like that. You, oops, yours has an outer envelope so only you can do all the steps, but see. He grabbed the certificate and pointed where Robert should do what. You gotta apply your own stamp first, and then you tear along the server line and you'll see a release like this. Phantom transformations spread in the air around him. And if this friend of yours is not blowing smoke, you'll see bright green here, and there'll be a written description of his contribution, backed by Microsoft or Bank of America or whoever. Then Juan had to go help his mother. As he faded away, Robert studied the examples. He recognized some of the steps from the protocol descriptions, but how did you know all that? Foolish question. The boy looked a little startled. It's just, it's just kind of intuitive, you know? I think that's the way the interface is designed. And then he was completely gone. 
No one was home right now, so Robert went downstairs and fixed himself a snack. Then he played back the steps the boy had shown him. He had no excuse for further delay. He hesitated a moment more, then applied the steps to each of the credit tots. Bright green, bright green, bright green. The mysterious stranger didn't like to come visiting when Robert was indoors at home. Maybe the USMC was not as incompetent as the stranger claimed. Robert began to look forward to his time away from home with anticipation and dread. Very soon he must decide. Was betrayal a price he could pay for a chance to be his old self once more? Days passed. Still no contact. The stranger wants me right for the picking. When it finally happened, Robert was walking around the neighborhood, doing another interview with Zulfikar Sharif. The young man hesitated in the middle of a question and looked at him. Miri, Arrow, Juan, open SM. I'm locked out. Close SM. Juan, Arrow, Miri, open SM. Again? Close SM. Miri, Arrow, Juan, open SM. Yes, again. Close SM. Sharif's earnest features took on the sly, greenish cast of the mysterious stranger. How is it going, my men? Robert managed a cool response. Well enough. The stranger smiled. You look a bit peaked, Professor. Perhaps you'd be more comfortable sitting down. A car slid to a stop beside them. The door opened, and the phantom graciously waved Robert inside. This is more secure? Robert said as they pulled away from the curb. This car is. Remember, I have powers far greater than your little friends. He settled in the back-facing seat. So, have you convinced yourself that I can help you? Maybe you can, said Robert, a little bit proud of how level his voice sounded. I checked your credit tots. You don't seem to know anything about anything, but you have this knack for bringing the right people together and being around when those people solve serious problems. The stranger waved his hand dismissively. I don't know anything about anything. You are naive, Professor. Our world is overflowing with technical expertise. Knowledge is piled metaphorical light years deep. Given that, the truly golden skill is the one I possess, to bring together the knowledge and abilities that make solutions. Your Miss Chumleg understands that. School kids certainly understand. Even Tommy Parker understands, though he has one important detail backwards. In me, another elaborate gesture, his hand flattening against his turtleneck shirt, in me, you have the far extreme of this ability. I am world class at bringing together to get answers. And with an ego to match. How does he get his way when he's dealing with the Einsteins and Hawkings of this era? Surely he doesn't have everyone by the short hairs. The stranger leaned forward. But enough of me. Winnie Blount and his elder cabal are getting desperate. I'm not exactly desperate, but if you delay more than another few days, I cannot guarantee an acceptable outcome. So, are you on board or not? I... Yes. I am. Twenty years ago, betraying Bob would not have bothered him. After all, the idiot was an ingrate. Now, no glib excuse rose to mind, but I'll do anything to recover what I lost. What is this biometric information you want on Alice? Some sonograms we can't take in public. A microgram blood spot. The mysterious stranger pointed at a small box that lay on the seat between them. Take a look. Robert reached down, and his fingers touched something hard and cool. The box was real. That was a first for the mysterious stranger. He took a closer look. It was gray plastic without any openings or even virtual labels. Wait, there was the ubiquitous no-user serviceable parts within. So? So leave that in your front bathroom this evening. It will do the rest. I won't do anything to hurt Alice. The stranger laughed. Such paranoia. The point of all this is to pass unnoticed. Alice Goo is in public places several times a week. If ill were wished her, those would be the opportunities to take advantage of. But you and the cabal just need biometrics. 
Any other questions? Not just now. Robert slipped the gray plastic box into his pocket. I just can't imagine that 21st century military security can be duped by something as simple as a drop of blood and some sonograms. The stranger laughed. Oh, there's much more to it than that. Tommy Parker thinks he's covering the angles, but without my help, you four would not even get into the steam tunnels. He looked at Robert's stiff expression and laughed again. Think of your part as being the user interface. He gave a little bow. And I am the user. Robert made a point of taking the stranger's gadget through the front hallway bug trap. The small box triggered no alarms he could see. So betrayal was as simple as walking into the first floor bathroom and setting the box down among the bags and aerosols and squeeze tubes that were already piled on the side counter. Modern bed and bath products were a bastion of old-style physical advertising. After all, even the most modern folks had to take off their clothes and their contacts somewhere. But Alice and Bob had no style. They bought the cheapest commodity products they could find. The devil box fit right in. Robert took a long shower. It would be nice to feel clean. He heard no strange sounds, saw nothing strange through the frosted glass. But when he came out of the shower... He noticed that there was no mysterious gray box either. Even when he pawed around the counter, touching every object there, there was no sign of the intrusion. The bathroom door had been shut the whole time. Someone knocked on the door, happily following the family rules about not snooping through bathroom walls. Robert, are you okay? It was Miri. Alice says it's dinner time. Dinner was a nightmare. It was always tense when the four of them ate together. Usually, Robert could avoid such get-togethers, but Alice seemed determined to see him with the whole family at least once a week. Robert knew what she was up to. She was recalibrating, deciding if now she could lower the boom on her father-in-law. Tonight, she was steelier than ever, and it didn't help that Robert had serious things to hide. Maybe she had some special reason to be suspicious. He noticed that Bob and Miri were doing all the running back and forth to the kitchen. Usually Alice helped with that. Tonight she sat herself down in her usual place and grilled Robert in her merciless casual way. How was school going? What about the project with Juan? She even asked about his old friends, for God's sake. And Robert explained and smiled and prayed he was passing the test. The old Robert never had trouble stringing people along. Then Bob and Miri were sitting down to eat. Alice shifted her attention from her villainous father-in-law. She chatted with Miri in the same friendly, interested tones she had used with Robert. Miri replied with precision, a detailed summary of just who and what was good and bad at school. For a while, Robert almost relaxed. After all, they were here to eat. Surely that couldn't give him away. But something was up, and it wasn't just his imagination. Bob and Alice got into a discussion of San Diego politics, a school bond issue. But there was an edgy undercurrent. Some couples really argue politics, but this was the first time Robert had ever heard that from these two. And every so often, Alice's clothing flickered. Around the house in the real world, Alice Goo wore a dumpy housefrau dress that wouldn't have been out of place in the 1950s. When she flickered, it was virtual imagery, nothing like Carlos's old-fashioned smart t-shirts. The first time it happened, Robert almost didn't notice, partly because neither Bob or Mary reacted. Half a minute later, as Alice gestured emphatically about some outstandingly trivial election issue, there was another flicker. For an instant, she was dressed in something like naval whites, but the collar insignia said PHS. PHS. There were lots of different Google hits on the abbreviation. A minute or two passed, and she was briefly a USMC full colonel. That, Robert had seen before, since it was her true rank. Bob said mildly, You're emoting, dear. It doesn't matter, Alice said curtly. You know that. The point is, and she continued chewing on the school bond issue, but her gaze wandered around the room, eventually riveting on Robert. It was not a friendly gaze, and even though her words were unrelated to Robert Goo, there was a sharpness in her voice. 
Then, for almost two seconds, she was wearing a civilian business suit with an old-fashioned ID lanyard. The ID bore a familiar seal and the letters DHS. Robert knew what that meant. It was all he could do not to flinch back. She can't know everything. He wondered if Alice and Bob were silently coordinating all the scary signs, conspiring to panic him into confession. Somehow he didn't think Bob was that adept. So Robert just nodded and glanced casually around. Miri had been quieter than usual. She was staring off into the distance and looked as bored as a 13-year-old can look when she's trapped at home with her parents rattling on about things not important. But this was Miri Goo, and this was not the 20th century. Most likely she was surfing, though usually she disguised such absences when she was at the dinner table. Alice slapped the table, and Robert's eyes jerked back to her. She was glaring at him. Don't you agree, Robert? Even Louise Chumley couldn't glare more aggressively than that. Sorry, my mind wandered, Alice. She waved her hand abruptly. It doesn't matter. And then golden letters spread silently across the air. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. Don't worry, she's not mad at you. Close SM. Miri was still gazing into nowhere. Her hands were in plain sight and motionless. She was that good with her clothes. Okay, but what in hell is going on here? That was the message he wanted to send back, but short of finger tapping, the best he could do was give her a quizzical look. Alice rattled on, interrupted occasionally by Bob, but now Robert was not living in stark terror. He waited another three or four minutes, and then excused himself. Bob looked a little relieved. We don't have to talk so much about the bond issue, Robert. There are other... No, that's okay. I'm the fellow with the homework these days. Robert pasted on a smile and retreated up the stairs. He felt Alice's rifled gaze following him every step. If not for Miri's silent message, he would have run up the stairs. And so far, Alice hadn't ventured near the front bathroom. He did have homework. Juan came over and distracted him for almost half an hour with his explanations of immersive outlines. Robert was supposed to have such an outline ready for tomorrow's progress report in Chumlig's class. Juan went away pleased. So was Robert. He had made up for several days of inattention. He fooled around with Juan's templates till he could implement everything. By God, we should be getting an A for cross-support. The kid's prose had become almost serviceable, and this immersive he had constructed. It was beautiful. He was aware of Miri helping to clean up after dinner and then coming up to her room. Bob and Alice were just sitting in the living room. He set an activity alarm on the first floor, and for a while he forgot himself in the making of more and better refinements to his graphics. Lord, an hour had passed. He took a quick glance downstairs. Nobody had been to the front john. There was a pending message from Tommy Parker. The cabal wanted to know when or if he was going to come through with his contribution. He looked downstairs again. Strange. He couldn't see into the living room anymore. Normally that was on the house menu, but now it was as private as the bedrooms. He stood and walked over to the door, quietly eased it open half an inch, snooping the good old-fashioned way. They were arguing, and Bob was white hot. His voice grew louder and louder, finally breaking into enraged shouting. I don't give a fuck if they do need you. It's always just one more time. But this time you've... Bob hesitated in mid-flame. Robert leaned forward, ear to the door. Nothing. Not even the mumble of circumspect speech. Son and daughter-in-law had taken their spat into ethereal realms. But Robert continued to listen. He could hear the two moving around. At one point, there was the sound of a hand slapping down like a pistol shot. Alice whacking the dinner table? There was half a minute of silence, and then a door slammed. Vision returned a second after that. Bob was alone in the living room, staring at the door of the ground floor den. He stood there for a few moments, then circled the living room and dropped himself down in his favorite chair. He pulled a book off the coffee table. That was one of the three physical books downstairs, and even it was a just-in-time fake. Robert Goo quietly shut his bedroom door and returned to his chair. 
He thought a moment, then tapped on his virtual keypad. Robert, Arrow, Miri, open SM. What was that all about? Close SM. Miri was twenty feet down the hall. So why didn't he just walk a few feet and knock on her door? Or present virtually? Maybe it was the habit of staying out of her way. Maybe it was easier to hide behind words. Maybe he wasn't the only one hiding. It was almost a minute before a reply floated back. Miri, Arrow, Robert, open SM. They're not mad at you. Close SM. Robert, Arrow, Miri, open SM. Okay, but what is the problem? Close SM. Miri, Arrow, Robert, open SM. There is no problem. Close SM. That was the whole message, but then Miri sent another. Miri, Arrow, Robert, open SM. Alice is getting ready for some new job. That's always hard on her. And then Bob gets mad. Close SM. There was another pause. Miri, Arrow, Robert, open SM. This is core business, Robert. I'm not supposed to know about it. You're even more not. I'm sorry. EOF. Close SM. EOF. That was Space Cadet for That's All She Wrote. Robert waited. Nothing more came. But this had been more real conversation with Miri than he'd had in two months. What did that little girl do with her secrets? They were surely more significant than he had ever guessed. She had better communications facilities than all of 20th century civilization, but her prissy standards kept her from sharing her pain. Or maybe she has friends she can talk to? Robert Goo Sr. didn't have any friends, but he didn't need any. Tonight he had plenty of crisis and suspense to distract him. He kept an eye on the front bathroom, and another on the door to the den. Bob was still reading, every so often sliding a look of his own at the den. Is now a good time for us to talk, Professor? The voice came from just behind his shoulder. The shock all but levitated Robert from his chair. He swung on the sound. Jeez! It was Zulfikar Sharif. Sharif backed away, startlement in his face. You could have knocked, Robert said. A did, Professor. Sharif sounded faintly hurt. Yes, yes. Robert still hadn't figured out all the quirks of Epiphany's circle of friends feature. He gestured for Sharif to stay. What's on your mind? Sharif did a creditable job of sitting on a chair without sinking halfway through. Well, I was hoping we could just talk. He thought a moment. I mean, we might continue with my questions about your secrets of the ages. Still no action downstairs. Very well, ask. So who is this? True Sharif? Stranger Sharif? Sci-fi Sharif? Or some ungodly combination? Whatever, it was too much coincidence that he showed up just now. Robert sat back to watch and listen. Um, I don't know. Miserably forgetful? But then Sharif abruptly perked up. Ah, one thing I'm hoping to get at in my thesis is the balance of worth between the beauty of expression and the beauty of underlying truth. Are they separate? A question to be answered in cryptic depth. Robert paused significantly and then launched into flim-flam. You should know by now, Zulfi, even if you can't create poetry yourself, that the issues can't be separated. Beauty captures truth. Read my essay in the Carolingian. Blah, blah, blah. Sharif nodded earnestly. Then do you ever expect an end to one and therefore the other? Beauty and truth, I mean? Huh? Now, that was sufficiently bizarre to derail him. Robert parsed and reparsed the stupidity. Will you run out of beauty? And the answer for me is yes. I can't create beauty anymore. So maybe this was just Stranger Sharif jerking him around while they both waited for the little gray box to do its thing. I suppose... there could be an end. And then he thought about the other half of the question. Hell, Sharif, truth, new truth, ended long ago. We artists sit atop a midden ten thousand years deep. 
The diligent ones of us know everything of significance that's ever been done. We churn and churn, and some of us do it brilliantly, but it's just a glittering rehash. Did I just say that? And if they're linked, then beauty is gone too? Sharif had leaned forward, his elbows on his legs, his chin cupped in his hands. His eyes were large and serious. Robert looked away. Finally, he choked out. There is still beauty. I will bring it back. I will regain it. Sharif smiled, mistaking Robert's assertion for some general faith in humankind in the future. That's wonderful, Professor. This goes beyond your essay in the Carolingian. Indeed. Robert sat back, wondering just what in heaven's name was going on. Sharif hesitated a moment, as if uncertain where to go next. At the UCSD library. How has your project there progressed? Still no action downstairs, Robert said. You see some connection between my art and the librarium? Well, yes. I don't want to intrude, but ultimately what you do at UCSD seems to be very much a statement about the position of art and literature in the modern world. Maybe this was sci-fi Sharif, trying to figure out what stranger Sharif was up to. If only I could use one against the other. He gave his visitor a judicious nod. I'll talk to my friends about this. Maybe we can arrange something. That seemed to satisfy whoever it was. They set a time for another chat, and then the visitor was gone. Robert turned off Circle of Friends access. No more surprise visitations tonight. And downstairs, there was still no action. He watched through the walls for almost fifteen minutes. That was certainly a productive use of time. Think about something else, damn it. He blew off the top of the house and looked across West Fallbrook. Unenhanced, the place was very dark, more like an abandoned town than a living suburb. The real San Diego had less sky glow than he remembered from the 1970s. But behind that real view were unending alternatives, all the cyberspace fun Bob's generation could have ever imagined. Hundreds of millions were playing out there tonight. Robert could feel, Epiphany could make him feel, the thrum of it, beckoning. Instead, he tapped out a command Chumling had mentioned, here and there across North County, tiny lights glowed. Those were the other students in his classes, at least the ones who were studying tonight and had any interest in what the others were doing. Twenty little lights. That was more than two-thirds of the class, a special kind of belief circle, one dedicated to pushing up their cooperation scores as far as possible. He hadn't appreciated how hard these little third raters were working. Robert ghosted over the suburbs, toward the nearest of the lights. He hadn't tried Epiphany's out-of-body feature before. There was no feeling of air flowing past, or motion. It was just his synthetic viewpoint slewing across the landscape. He could still feel his butt on the chair in his bedroom. And yet he understood why the directions said to do this sitting down. The viewpoint swooped down into a valley with a speed that was dizzying. He drifted into a welcoming window. Juan Orozco and Mahmoud Kwan and a couple of others were gathered in a family room, marking out possibilities for tomorrow's exchange with Cape Town. They looked up and said hi, but Robert could tell they weren't seeing much more than his icon hovering in the room. He could be present virtually, perhaps even look as real as Sharif usually did. But Robert just hung in the air, listening to the talk for a few moments, and... Alarm notification! He cut the connection and was back in his bedroom. Downstairs, Bob had wandered out of the living room. He stood by Alice's door and knocked gently. As far as Robert could tell, there was no answer. After a moment, Bob tucked his chin in and turned away. Robert tracked him up the stairs. The sounds of footsteps came down the hall. Bob knocked on Miri's door, the way he did most evenings. There was mumbled conversation, and Miri's voice saying, Good night, Daddy. It was the first Robert had heard her call Bob that. Bob's footsteps came nearer. He paused at Robert's door, but he didn't say anything. Robert watched him through the wall as Bob turned and was swallowed up by the privacy of the master bedroom. Robert hunched over his desk and stared into the downstairs. Alice hardly ever stayed up much beyond Bob. 
Of course, tonight was not your usual night. Damn. You screw your courage up to an act of family betrayal, and then fate dumps problems all over your dishonorable intent. But even if Alice camped out in the den, eventually she'd have to use the bathroom, right? Twenty minutes passed. Alice's door opened. She stepped out, turned toward the stairs. Use the ground floor bathroom, damn you. She turned again and paced angrily around the living room. Paced? There was precision and power in every motion, like a dancer or a martial arts nut. Not like dumpy, frumpy Alice Gong Goo, she of the mild round face and the shapeless dress. And yet this was the real view. It was her real face, even if it was tense with pain and drenched in sweat. Huh? Robert tried to follow her gliding dance in close-up. The woman was dripping sweat. Her dress was soaked, as if she had just finished a long frantic run. Like Carlos Rivera. It couldn't be. Alice never got stuck in a foreign language, or in a particular specialty, in any one particular specialty. But he remembered the web discussion of JIT. What about the few strange people who could train more than once, who became ever more multi-talented, until the side effects finally destroyed them? Where would such wretches get stuck if there were dozens of imprints to fall into? Alice's gliding dance slowed, stopped. She stood for a moment with her head bowed, her shoulders heaving. Then she turned and walked slowly into the front bathroom. Finally, finally. And now I should be overcome with relief. Instead, revelation bounced back and forth in his mind. This explained so many little mysteries. It contradicted several certainties. Maybe Alice hadn't been gunning for him. Maybe she was no more his enemy than anyone in this house. Sometimes things are not as they seem. It was very quiet. The old house in Palo Alto had had little squeaks and thumps, and sometimes Bob's PC playing stolen music. Here, tonight. Yes, there were occasional sounds, the house settling into the cool of the evening. Wait. In the utility view, he saw that one of the water heaters had kicked in. He could hear running water. Not for the first time, Robert wondered what kind of magic that little gray box was. It had not triggered the house watchdogs. Maybe it wasn't electronic at all, but 19th century gears and cogs driven by a metal spring. Then it had disappeared from Robert's own naked eyesight. That was something new, not a visual trick. Maybe the box had sprouted little legs and scurried off. But whatever it was, what would it finally do? Maybe the stranger didn't need a little blood. Maybe a lot of blood would suit him more. Robert sat stock still for a second, and then bolted to his feet, and froze again. I was so desperate. Credibility is not important if the victim wants to believe so hard that truth must be what the liar claims. So the stranger had mocked the notion that hurting Alice would be worth such hugger-mugger. And I, desperate, smiled and was convinced. Robert was out of his room, and flying down the stairs, he dashed through the living room and pounded on the bathroom door. Alice! Al- The door opened. Alice was looking at him, a bit wide-eyed. He grabbed her arm and dragged her into the hallway. Alice was not a large woman. She came easily in his grasp. But then she turned, taking him off balance. Somehow, his feet got tangled in hers and he slammed into the door jamb. What is it? She said, sounding irritated. I- Robert looked over his shoulder, into the brightly lit bathroom, then back at Alice. She was dressed in a robe now, and her short hair looked as though she had washed it. And everybody is still in one piece. No pools of blood, except maybe where my head hit the door jam. Are you okay, Robert? Concern seemed to rise above her irritation. Robert felt the back of his head. Yeah, yes. I'm pretty robust these days. He thought about how he'd come down the stairs. Even when he was seventeen years old, he had never skipped four steps at a time. But, Alice began, clearly she was more concerned about his mental state than anything else. It's okay, daughter-in-law. I thought I was stopping your murder, and now I find it's a false alarm. 
Somehow he didn't think that would be a satisfactory explanation. So why was he down here in the middle of the night, pounding on the door? He looked into the bathroom again. I, um, I just needed to use the john. Her sympathy frosted over. Don't let me keep you, Robert. She turned and headed for the stairs. Are you okay, Alice? Bob's voice from the top of the stairs. Robert didn't have the courage to look, but he could imagine Miri's little face staring down too. As he stepped into the bathroom and shut the door, he heard his daughter-in-law's tired voice. Not to worry, it was just Robert. Robert sat on the can for a few minutes and let the shakes die away. Maybe there was still a bomb here, but if it exploded, none but the guilty would be blown apart. And neither did he have the little box that was the point of the comedy. When he showed up at the library, he would be empty-handed. So? After a moment, Robert stood and looked into the real glass mirror. He favored his reflection with a twisted smile. Maybe he should just bring them a fake. Would Tommy even notice? As for the mysterious stranger, perhaps his spell had been broken, along with all hope. His eyes strayed to the countertop. There, sitting away from the clutter, was a small gray box. It hadn't been there when Alice left. He reached down. His fingers touched warm plastic. Not an illusion. A greater mystery than all the flash and glitter that he was just becoming accustomed to. He slipped the box into his pocket and quietly returned to his room. 17. Alfred Volunteers Gunberg Brown and Keiko Mitsuri. They were top officers in their respective services. Vaz had tracked these two since their college days. He knew more about them than they would ever guess. That was one of the benefits of being very old and very well connected. In a sense, he had guided them into their intel careers, though neither they nor their organizations suspected the fact. They weren't traitors to the EU or Japan, but Alfred understood them so well that he could subtly guide them. So he had thought, and so he still hoped. And yet his two young friends' remorseless efforts to help had become the greatest threat to his plans. As today. Yes, yes, there are risks, Vaz was saying. We knew that from the beginning. But letting a serious YGBM project escape detection would be much more dangerous. We must find out what's going on in the San Diego labs. Plan Rabbit can do that. Keiko Mitsuri shook her head. Alfred, I have contacts in U.S. intelligence that go back years. These aren't my agents, but they would not tolerate a rogue weapons project. On that, I would trust them with my life. I say we should contact them, very unofficially, and see what they can learn about the San Diego labs. Alfred leaned forward. Would you trust them with your country's life? Because that's what we are talking about here. In the worst case, there is not only a YGBM research effort going on in San Diego, but it is supported at the highest levels of the U.S. government. In that case, your friend's best efforts would simply alert their superiors to our suspicions. The evidence would disappear. When it comes to investigating a threat this serious, we simply must do it ourselves. In one form or another, this was an argument that dated from their Barcelona meeting. Today's installment could be decisive. Keiko sat back and gave a frustrated shrug. She was presenting, in more or less her real appearance and location, a thirty-year-old woman sitting at her desk somewhere in Tokyo. She had transformed one side of Vaz's office with her minimalist furniture and a picture-window view of Tokyo's skyline. Gunberg Brown was less prepossessing. His image simply occupied one of Alfred's office chairs. No doubt Gunberg figured that the EU swung enough weight that he could afford a mild disposition. Gunberg might be the real problem today, but so far he was just listening. Okay. Alfred spread his hands. I truly think the course we set in Barcelona is the most prudent one. Can you deny the progress we have made? He waved at the biographical reports scattered around the table. We have hands and minds on the scene, all deniable and ignorant of what is manipulating them. In fact, they totally misunderstand the significance of this operation. Do you doubt this? Do you think that the Americans have any whiff of our investigation? 
Both youngsters shook their heads. Keiko even gave him a rueful smile. No, your she-based compartmentalization is truly a revolution in military affairs. Indeed, and our releasing those methods, even to sister services within the Alliance, shows how seriously we at the EIA view the current necessities. So please, if we delay more than 100 hours, we might as well start over. What is your problem with giving the final go-ahead? Gunberg glanced at his Japanese counterpart. She made an impatient gesture for him to go ahead. I assume your question is rhetorical, Alfred. The problem with Plan Rabbit is Rabbit. Everything depends on him, and still we know almost nothing about him. And neither will the Americans. Deniability is the whole point. Rabbit is everything we could want. He is more Alfred. Gunberg's gaze was steady. For all his youth, Brown had the stolid aspect of a turn-of-the-century German. He moved from point to point slowly, inexorably. In setting up this operation, Rabbit has performed miracles on our behalf. His ability demonstrates that he himself is a threat. Vaz glanced at the results of Gunberg's latest investigation. But you have discovered critical weaknesses in Rabbit. However much he's tried to disguise it, you've traced all his certificate authority to a single apex. Having a single CA apex was not unusual. That Gunberg had managed to discover Rabbit's apex was a triumph. For Alfred, given his own, ah, uh, sensitive relationship with Rabbit, it was miraculously good news. Gunberg nodded. Credit Suisse, so what? So if Rabbit turns out to be a nightmare... You could pull the plug on Credit Suisse and put him out of business. Pull the plug on Credit Suisse CA? Do you have any idea what that would do to the European economy? I'm proud of my people, that they ferreted this secret out, but it's not something we can effectively use. We should have dropped Rabbit after that first meeting in Barcelona, said Keiko. He is too clever. Boz raised a hand. Perhaps, but how could we know? Ya? Yeah? Forgive me, Alfred, but we wonder if you know more about Mr. Rabbit than we. Damn. Not at all, honestly. Alfred leaned back in his chair and took in the nervous postures of his colleagues. You've been talking behind my back, haven't you? He gave them a gentle smile. Do you think Rabbit is really American intelligence? Chinese? They had spent a lot of time investigating those possibilities, but now Keiko shook her head. Then what is your theory, my friends? Well, said Gunberg, sounding a little embarrassed, maybe Mr. Rabbit is not even human. Maybe it's an artificial intelligence. Vaz laughed. He glanced at Keiko Mitsuri. And you? I think AI is a possibility we should consider. Rabbit's talents are so broad, his work is so effective, and his personality is so juvenile. That last was one of the features the U.S. DARPA thought would be characteristic. She saw the incredulity on Vaz's face. Not every threat is a cult or conspiracy. Of course. But AI monsters? That's a boogeyman out of the 20th century. Who in the intelligence communities takes that seriously? Ah, that's Pascal Herriot's hobby horse, isn't it? Alfred's tone became low and serious. Have you been talking to Pascal about this project? Of course not. But AI is a threat that's been totally overlooked in recent years. Correct, because nothing ever came of it. Before the Sino-American War, we know DARPA spent billions on the Little Helper project. It was almost as much a fiasco as their Space Access Denial Initiative. Space Denial worked. Vaz laughed. It worked against everybody, Keiko, the Americans most of all. But you're right. SAD is not a proper comparison. My point is that some of the smartest people in the world tried to create AI and failed. The researchers failed, but surely runnable code survived. The Internet is not the cramped toy it once was. Maybe pieces of DARPA's little helper are out there, growing into what it could never be in the low-tech past. That is science fiction. There was even a movie, more than one actually, said Gunberg. Alfred, I don't agree with Keiko that programs from years ago could self-organize just because decent resources are available now. But here at the IB, 
we have been tracking the possibilities. I think Pascal Herio has a point. Just because most people have dismissed the possibility doesn't mean that it is not real. We are certainly past the crossover point when it comes to computer hardware. Pascal thinks that when it finally happens, it will arise without institutional precursors. It will be like many research developments, but rather more catastrophic. Just another way humankind might fail to survive the century. Whatever the explanation, said Keiko, Rabbit is simply too competent, too anonymous. I'm sorry, Alfred. We think the operation should be shut down. Let's approach our American friends on this. But equipment is in place. Our people are in place. She shrugged. With Rabbit managing things? That could leave Rabbit with whatever we discover in San Diego. Even if we agreed with you, our bosses would never go along. She was serious. Alfred glanced at Brown. He was, too. This was bad. Keiko, Gunberg, please. Just balance the risks. We are, said Keiko. Rabbit loose within this grandiose scheme is a cosmic-sized unsafety. She could be quite full of modern Japanese bluntness. Vaz said, But we could arrange things so Rabbit receives operational information just in time as the action evolves. Fortunately, Gunberg shot that down immediately. Ah, no. Such remote micromanagement, it's a guarantee of disaster. Vaz hesitated a long moment, tried to look as though he were thinking hard, making some hard decision. Maybe... Maybe there's a way we can have everything. The, uh, grandiose scheme and minimal risk from Rabbit. Suppose we don't supply Rabbit with the final details in advance. Suppose we put one of our own people on the ground in Southern California the night of the break-in. Mitsuri and Brown stared for a second. But what about deniability, then? said Keiko. If we have our own agent breaking in, think Keiko. My proposal risks tipping off the Americans, which is something yours guarantees. And we can keep the risk low. We simply put our own agent nearby, in a well-planned position, with essentially zero latencies. What the Americans call a local honcho. Gunberg brightened. Like Alice Kong at Ciudad General Ortiz. Yes, exactly. He hadn't been thinking of Alice, but Gunberg was right. It had been Alice Gong on the ice at Ortiz, almost single-handedly discovering and stopping the free water front. Maybe the front would have failed anyway. After all, no one had ever tried to scale a Saturday night special up to 300 megatons. But if the bomb had successfully detonated, their statement of principle would have poisoned the freshwater mining industry off West Antarctica. Gong remained unknown to the outside world, but she was something of a legend within the intelligence communities. She was one of the good guys. Thank goodness, neither Brown nor Mitsuri seemed to notice Alfred's discomfort at her name. Inserting a honcho now would be difficult, said Keiko. Are we talking a credible tourist or cargo container roulette? Truly black insertions looked like WMD smuggling. They were hair-raising operations for all concerned. None of my agents in place are rated for this operation. It will take a special person... Special talents, special clearance. I have some good people in California, said Gunberg, but none of them are at this level. It doesn't matter, said Vaz, his voice filled with steely determination. I'm quite willing to go, myself. He had surprised them before, but this was a bombshell. Brown sat for a moment, open-mouthed. Alfred! It's that important, Vaz said. He gave them each his most direct and sincere look. But you're a desk jockey like us. Alfred shook his head. Today he would have to let a little bit of his background story come unglued. Hopefully it wouldn't all tear apart. Alfred had spent years fitting in as a mid-level bureaucrat at the External Intelligence Agency. If he were unmasked, then at best he'd end up like the Prime Minister, forced back into high-level political hackery. At worst... At worst, Gunberg and Keiko might figure out what he was really up to in San Diego. Vaz, Arrow, EIA Inner Office, OpenSM, Clear Biographical Package 3 for Joint Intelligence Viewing. Close SM. Aloud, he said, 
I do have field experience. In the U.S., in fact, in the early teens. Brown and Mitsuri both had a long stare. They were busy browsing. Biopack 3 would show them the operations. It was all consistent with what they had known before, but revealed new depths to their Indian pal. Gunberg was the first to recover. I... see. He was silent for a moment, reading more. You did well. But that was some years ago, Alfred. This will be a heavily networked technical assignment. Alfred nodded at the criticism. True. I am not a young man. Mitsuri and Brown thought he was in his early fifties. On the other hand, my specialty here at the EIA is network issues, so I'm not really out of date. A surprised grin flashed across Keiko's face. And you do know this operation better than anyone. So by being on site, you can supply the critical pieces without giving them to Rabbit? Correct. Gunberg was still unhappy. And yet this is an extraordinarily dangerous operation. We great powers compete, that is true. But when it comes to the threat of weapons, we must stand together. This is the first time in my career that that covenant has been broken. Alfred nodded solemnly. We must find out the truth, Gunberg. We could be wrong about San Diego. Then we'll thankfully and silently disengage. But whatever the source of this weapon, we must discover it. And if that turns out to be San Diego, the Americans will very likely thank us. Mitsuri and Brown looked at each other for a long moment. Finally they nodded, and Keiko said, We'll support the insertion of a local honcho, presumably you. I'll put planners on fallback strategies in case you are exposed. We'll provide network and analyst support. It'll be up to you to manage critical data on the ground, and keep Mr. Rabbit from taking over the whole thing, said Gunberg. Alfred sat in his office for some minutes after his friends departed. That had been too close a thing. When the stakes are highest, the threats always multiply. Plan Rabbit was the most sensitive operation that the Indian government had ever knowingly been a part of. Getting the Prime Minister's support had not been easy. Today, Keiko and Gunberg had almost shut him down as thoroughly as the PM could have. As for Rabbit, well, AI might be fantasy, but Rabbit was just as much a threat as Gunberg and Keiko feared. Alfred relaxed slightly, allowed himself a smile. Yes, the threats had multiplied like, well, like rabbits. But here today he had collided some of those threats and neutralized them. For weeks he had been plotting his local honcho role. In the end, Gunberg and Keiko had provided him with the natural excuse to be present on the ground in San Diego. 18. The Myasthenic Spelunker Society The cabal still met on the sixth floor of the library, but that was a very different place now. Robert came up in the elevator, avoiding the Hatsekians and their library militant. Nevertheless, sticking to reality was difficult. Theodore Geisel still held the lobby, but the administration was franchising mind and touch space everywhere else. Scoochamoody characters had infested the basement. H.P. Lovecrafts were said to lurk in the farther underground, in what had been non-circulating storage. And the sixth floor was empty, stripped to the bare shelving. From the elevator entrance at the middle of the floor, Robert could see through skeletal shelving all the way to the windows. The book shredders had come and gone. In the southeast corner, the conspirators were hunkered down like 20th century socialists plotting empire in the midst of their obvious ruin. So what's held up the library militant invasion, Robert said, and waved at the stark reality of the empty stacks. Carlos replied, A delay in finding the newest haptics is the official explanation. In fact, it's politics. The Scoochie partisans want this floor for their universe. The library militant is resisting. The administration may disappoint them both and make this floor a simulation of what libraries were like when they were real. But with fake imagery of the books, right? Yep. Tommy was smiling. What do you expect? Meantime, we still have the floor to ourselves. We are not defeated, gentlemen. Winnie's face was stern. We've known for weeks now that this was inevitable. We've lost a major battle. But it is only the first battle in the war. He glanced at Tommy. 
Parker pointed at the LED on his computer. The dead zone is in place. It's time to resume our seriously criminal conspiratizing. He was smiling, but his gaze swept across them, catching each in the eye. Okay. I've done my research. I can get us into the steam tunnels. I've even arranged festivities that will get the lab stuff out of our way. I can get us to the shredder containers, and I have the aerosol glue. We can cause the Librarium Project and Huertas in particular a whole lot of pain. Of course, it won't stop progress on this sort of thing, but it will, Winnie gave a grunt. We've already agreed that a permanent stop is impossible, but if we can block the jerks who use the most destructive methods, well, that will have to suffice. Right, Odin. That's exactly what we can do. It's all set up, just missing one critical ingredient. His gaze slid across to Robert. Such is the power of common sense that Robert hesitated almost a third of a second. Then he reached into his pocket and retrieved the plastic box the stranger had provided. Check this out, Tommy. Parker's eyebrows went up. Hey, I'm impressed. I expected a paper napkin or something. He glanced at his laptop's display and then picked up the box. This looks like a biosample kit. In fact, the box was now showing colorful labels announcing just that function. How did you do it? Yes, how? Robert couldn't think of truth or lie that would make any sense. Tommy mistook his silence. No, no, don't tell me. I should be able to figure it out for myself. Tommy smiled down at the box for a moment. Then he slipped it into his pocket. Okay, we're all set then. Now we've got to decide on a time. Rivera leaned forward. Soon, there's too much lab construction between quarters. Yep. And there are other constraints. You wouldn't believe the prep I've had to do. I'm netted to consultants up the yin-yang. Don't worry, Dean, none of them see more than a small part of what I'm doing. I'm getting to be a real expert at affiliates. Tommy was having a hell of a good time. I can make this work, guys. Hey, it will be like the good old days. Well, maybe not for you, Carlos. You weren't even born back then. He grinned at Winnie and Robert. Robert had gone on those hikes underground often, but they'd been impressive enough, trekking through hundreds of feet of tunnel and then popping up in buildings that were dark and empty and largely unfinished. Sometimes there had been stairs in the stairwells, and sometimes not. Winnie Blount was smiling a little now, too. Yeah, the Myasthenic Spelunker Society. He frowned, remembering more. We were lucky we didn't break our necks. That comment was from the side of the desk where Winnie had lived most of his life, the administrator with nightmares about liability and litigation. Yep, it was more fun than gaming, and a lot more dangerous. Anyway, that was back before computers at least as we understand the term now. Today things are way different, but with my research and this bio-profile from Robert, I can get us past all the watchdog automation. At least if we get the timing right. He typed briefly on his laptop. Okay, here's the latest. There are three short time slots in the next six weeks when all the security holes line up. When is the first? said Winnie. Real soon. A week from next Monday. He spun his laptop around so the others could see. We'd go in through Pilchner Hall. He launched into an extended discussion of how he would manage the adventure. And here is where the tunnel forks off campus. Once we get past that, we can walk almost half a mile out under the old General Genomics site. Huertas's labs are just north of that, said Rivera. Yep. And ten to one odds we can get in there and do our stuff, and maybe even get out. Neither Rivera nor Blount seemed discomfited by this prospectus. After a moment, when he said, We really can't postpone things. I vote for a week from Monday. Yeah, me too, said Robert. Wo Tony, yes. Okay, then. Tommy spun his laptop back and made a notation. Come wearing, but I'll supply new clothes and all necessary electronics. I... Winston Blount interrupted. There's one other thing, Tommy. Uh-oh. It's not a big thing, but it could get us the right publicity. Hmm. I propose that we bring along a remote presence. That Sharif fellow. That's insane!
Tommy hopped to his feet and then abruptly sat down again. You want a remote presence? Don't you understand? You won't even be wearing down there. Winnie smiled cajolingly. But you'll be bringing electronics, Tommy. Couldn't we support his presence through that? Parker gargled on his indignation. How do you think remote presence works, Dean? Um, it's just a kind of overlay. As far as display goes, that's true, but it's not local. Behind the pretty imagery, there's high-rate comm and forwarding through ambient micro-lasers. There are no random networks down in the tunnels. Everything I've planned depends on us being very quiet, in particular not using any lab nodes. What you want is... He shook his head in disbelief. Robert looked at Blount. I don't understand either. Just a couple of weeks ago, we shut Sharif out as a security risk. Winnie's face reddened, just as in the old days when Robert nailed him in a faculty meeting. Robert raised his hand. I'm just wondering, Winston. Honest. After a second, Winnie nodded. Okay, look, I was never down on the guy. We've met him in person, right here at the library. He appears to be a sincere student. He's honestly interviewing you, right? When he's not the stranger or Mr. Sci-Fi, yeah. Robert realized that just a word from him now and the whole scheme might be abandoned. He had not imagined that betrayal could be such a full-time job. Yes, his questions are often foolish, but they're very academic. There you are. My point is that if things do not go 100% our way, we want an outsider to present our view, ideally someone who has seen exactly what we're doing. It could mean the difference between going silently to jail and making an effective moral statement. Yes, said Rivera. You're a security genius, Professor Parker, but even the best laid plans can go awry. If you can accommodate Sharif, that would be a... a kind of safety net. Tommy pounded his head gently on the table. You guys don't know what you're asking. But for all the histrionics, Tommy had not said no. After a moment, the little guy sat up and glared at them. You're asking for a miracle. Maybe I can do it and maybe not. Give me a day to think. Sure, Professor. No problem. Blount was smiling with relief. Tommy shook his head and hunched down behind his laptop. He seemed just as happy when the other gang members adjourned the meeting and wandered off toward the elevators. Usually, there was an elevator waiting by the time they got there. Apparently, Tommy's dead zone had left even the elevator software in the dark. After a moment spent staring at closed doors, Carlos reached over and punched the ground floor button. The virtue of maintaining antique controls, he said with a weak smile. Winnie was grinning, but it had nothing to do with the elevator. Don't worry, Tommy will come up with a solution. Robert nodded. He always has, hasn't he? Yup, said Winnie, and they all laughed. And suddenly Robert understood why Winnie and Carlos wanted Sharif on board. As the elevator doors opened and Rivera and Blount stepped in, Robert said, Catch you later. Maybe I should see the library militant again. Winnie rolled his eyes. Suit yourself. And they were gone. Robert stood for a moment, listening to the sound of the departing elevator. Beyond the stairway door on his left was the descent into the virtual library. There had been no more faux earthquakes, but the librarian's militant still played with heavy amplifiers. He could hear the sounds of creeping masonry, louder now than the elevator. The floor under his feet trembled to the tune of Yeji Hatsek's fantasies. He waited a moment more, and then, instead of heading down the stairs, he walked back around the sixth floor to Tommy Parker. Tommy was leaning forward, his nose still buried in his computer. His dead zone LED was still lit. In a very concrete way, he looked like a wizard with a book of ancient lore. No virtual realities needed here. Robert slid into the opposite chair and watched. It was quite possible the guy hadn't even noticed his arrival. He really could get totally absorbed by games and puzzles and cracking schemes. I am everywhere, and I appear however I wish to produce the results that I wish. That was the mysterious stranger's brag. After last night, 
After the miracle in the front bathroom, Robert was willing to believe that whatever the stranger was, he might be nearly as powerful as he claimed. I wonder what he has on Winnie and Carlos. Finally, Robert broke the silence. So, Tommy, how badly have we screwed up? Blue eyes appeared over the top of the laptop. Tommy's expression seemed to say, What are you doing here? His gaze turned back to his computer. Dunno. I just wish you guys would make up your minds. A quick glance back Robert's way. But you didn't push for this change, did you? I have... mixed feelings about it. Now the stranger would be on site next Monday, proving again his claim of ubiquity. I've always believed in letting you tech geniuses get the job done your own way. Tommy bobbed agreement. Yep. Actually, the old Robert had never cared about technology one way or another. Now things were very different. I remember you were always good at pulling miracles out of your hat, though. Are we asking too much this time, Tommy? Parker sat up and gave Robert all his attention. I... I just don't know, Robert. In the old days, there's no way I could swing something like this. I could design super ASICs. I could hack protocols. I could do a dozen things outside my narrow academic specialty. But that doesn't count for so much now. It's that... It's that you're working on problems bigger than any set of specialties. Yes. How did you know that? Ms. Chumlig told me. Aloud, Robert said, Nowadays you deal with completely unrelated specialties. Right. Some of my core skills are still important. In those, I'm as effective as I ever was. But by the time I retired, I was almost an embarrassment to my department. I was good in certain niche courses, but when I tried to teach the new integrative stuff, well, all my life I'd been way ahead of the students, even in new courses. But toward the end, I was floundering. I got through my last semester by assigning weekly projects and then having the kids critique each other. He looked seriously embarrassed. Nothing like this had ever happened to the old Robert, but I could always define what quality and performance meant. Anyway... After I retired, I went back to school, at least inside my head. There's a whole different way of looking at problem solving if you want to solve large problems fast. It's like learning to use power tools, except that nowadays your tools aren't just Google and symbolic math packages. They're also the idea boards and future speculations and... And dealing with people? Yep. People were never part of my equations, but that doesn't matter anymore. There are design bureaus that specialize in handling the nicey nice Tommy leaned forward, confiding. Since I started working on this project, everything has come together. Getting into the tunnels would be useless if the staff were still in the labs. So I've turned the political maneuvering between the Hotsekians and the Scoochies into the most spectacular media distraction, a clash of belief circles. It'll be so cool. I've found a design coordinator who understands what I'm after. I make the overall concept, and he farms it out all over the planet. The detailed plans just grow into place. Tommy sat back, his frustration swept away by this vision of his new powers. And look at my computer! His hand passed lovingly across the device. The cabinet was nicked and scratched. It looked like it had hosted generations of burglars. The LEDs along the top were set in little pits hacked into the metal. Old Tommy didn't believe in no user serviceable parts within. Over the years, I've replaced everything inside. Too often the changes were to satisfy new standards and the damned she. But now, in the last couple of months, I've put a revolution inside this box. It subverts non-trivial parts of the secure hardware environment. I swear, Robert, I'm hotter than DARPA and CIA ever were in the 20th century. Robert was silent for a moment. Then he said, I'll bet you will figure some way to get Sharif in. Ha! That would be the frosting on the cake. The obvious trick is straight out of the 20th century. We just lay our own cable. That would support decent data rates, enough for Sharif anyway, and we'd still be all dark and quiet. He glanced at Robert and apparently took his silence for incredulity. I know, it's a long walk, and the tunnel security will be mostly live, but there's a kind of slim-clad optical fiber, 
Or there will be after I get done with my design coordinator. Yes, your design coordinator. I am everywhere, and I appear however I wish to produce the results that I wish. The new world was a magical place, but there was a hierarchy of miracles. There was what Juan and Robert could do. There was what Louise Chumlig was trying to teach. There was what Tommy had taught himself. And somewhere above it all, there was what the mysterious stranger could do. 19. Failure is an option. At Fairmont High, final exams were spread across several days. There were some similarities with what he remembered of childhood. The kids were distracted by the upcoming holidays. Worse, the Christmas movie season was something that was beginning to pervade the various shared worlds they lived in. But finals were different in one profound way from his experience in high school. For Robert Gu, these new exams were hard. It was not a foregone conclusion that he would max the tests and outdo everyone around him. The only similar situation from his past was in undergraduate school, when he had briefly been forced into real science courses. In those classes, he had finally met students who were not automatically his inferiors, and he had also met teachers who were not impressed by his genius. Once past the mandatory science curriculum, Robert had avoided such humiliation. Until now. Math and formal common sense. Statistics and data mechanics. Search and analysis. Even the S&A exam limited one's opportunity to go out on the net and use the intelligence of others. Though she taught collaboration, Chumlig had always droned about the importance of core competencies. Now all her mismatched platitudes were coming together in one hell week of testing. Right after the common sense exam, the mysterious stranger manifested himself. He was just a voice and a greenish glow. Having trouble with the exams, my man? I'll get by. In fact, the math had actually been interesting. Miri, Arrow, Juan, Shu, open SM. He's talking to someone again. Close SM. Shu, Arrow, Juan, Miri, open SM. What is he saying? Close SM. Miri, Arrow, Juan, Shu, open SM. I don't know. Local audio has gone private. Juan, get out there. Close SM. Juan, Arrow, Miri, Shu, open SM. You're not the boss of me. I was going to talk to Robert now anyway. Close SM. The stranger chuckled. At Fairmont High, they don't give automatic A grades, or even automatic passing grades. Failure is an option, but you... Relief was in sight. He saw Juan Orozco coming out of the class building, heading his way. The stranger continued, And Juan Orozco are not certain Fs. You're on a simplified curriculum. You should see the exams they're planning for your granddaughter. What about my granddaughter? If the slime ball brought her into this... But the voice did not reply. Juan looked around questioningly. Were you talking to someone, Robert? Not about school things. Because I didn't see anybody. He hesitated, and letters coursed across Robert's view. Juan, Arrow, Robert, open SM. It's really important not to collaborate outside of the rules. Close SM. I understand, Robert replied out loud. Okay. Clearly, Juan didn't think Robert could pass all the tests. Sometimes it seemed like the poor kid was trying to protect him. See, Juan continued, the school uses a real good proctor service. Maybe there are some kids who can fool it, but there's a lot more who only think they can. And then there's the mysterious stranger, who seems to have no trouble at all with security. The stranger was so powerful that he still got pleasure from taunting Robert. Could it be some old enemy? Someone a good deal brighter than Winnie Blount? Anyway, I think we have a chance for an A in our semester demo, Robert. The boy launched into the latest plans for using his writing together with manual music and Robert's network algorithms. It was the blind leading the blind, but after a few moments, Robert was absorbed in it. Things were very tense around the house, and it had nothing to do with final exams. In point of fact, Robert's midnight fracas at the front bathroom amounted to a physical assault. Never mind that he'd been trying to protect Alice, 
That was scarcely something he could claim. This time there were no threats, no showdowns. But Robert could see an uneasiness in Bob's eyes that hadn't been there before. It was the look of a fellow who begins to wonder if the snake he's been keeping might actually be a black mamba. That conclusion would get Robert shipped to Rainbow's End faster than any mere boorishness. Miri gave him a clue as to why this hadn't happened. She caught up with him one afternoon as he wandered around West Fallbrook hoping for contact with some friendly form of Sharif. Miri rode her old bike along beside him for a few paces, matching his speed and wobbling wildly. Finally, she hopped off and walked the bike. As usual, her posture was schoolmarm straight. She looked at him sideways for a moment. How are your finals going, Robert? Hi, Mary. How are your finals going? I asked first. Besides, you know my finals don't start till after the break. Her ebullient bossiness seemed to collide with diplomacy. So, how are you doing? It looks like I'm going to get a C in math. Her eyes widened. Oh, I'm sorry. Robert laughed. No, that's good news. I wouldn't have even understood the problems back before the Alzheimer's. She gave him a sickly smile. Well, that's okay, then. Hmm. A friend of mine told me that the kids in your classes are really good at these things. We know the tools. I think I could be a lot better in math, said Robert, almost to himself. It might even be fun. Of course, if his real plans for the next few days worked out, he would have his poetry back and none of this would matter. This time, Miri's smile was happier. I'll bet you could. You know, I could help you on that. I really like math, and I have all sorts of custom heuristics. Between semesters, I could show you how to use them. Her voice slipped into leader mode as she planned out his vacation for him. That's the Alice in her, thought Robert. He almost smiled. Hold on, there's still finals to get through. And he thought about Juan's latest demo plans. The boy was doing okay. It was Robert who was having trouble with his part, the graphics and the interfaces. That's where I really need help. Miri's face snapped around. I will not help you cheat, Robert. They both stopped and stared at each other. That's not what I meant, Miri. Then he thought about what he had actually said. Christ. In the old days, I insulted people all the time, but I knew when I was doing it. Honest. I just meant that finals are a problem, okay? Lena, Arrow, Miri, Shu, Open SM. Be cool, kiddo. Even I don't think Robert's messing with you. Close SM. Shu, Arrow, Lena, Miri, Open SM. This is a first for you, then. Close SM. Miri glared at him for a second more. Then she made a strange sound that might have been a giggle. Okay. I should have known a goo would not cheat. It's just that I get so mad at some of the kids in my study group. I tell them what to do. I tell them not to cheat. And yet they are always chiseling at the collab protocols. She started walking again, and Robert followed along. Actually, she said, I was just making conversation. I have a mission. Something I should tell you. Oh? Yes. Bob wants to send you out of state. He figures you tried to beat up Alice. She paused, as if waiting for some defense. But Robert only nodded, remembering the look in Bob's eyes. So Rainbow's End was too close by. How long do I have? That's what I want to tell you, not to worry. You see... It turned out that his rescue came from an unlikely source, namely Colonel Alice herself. Apparently she hadn't felt the least bit threatened by him. Alice knew you were just desperate. I mean... Miri made a verbal dance of avoiding insult and gross language. Basically, Alice already thought he was a crazy old man. Crazy old men have to go to the bathroom all the time. They get overly focused on that problem. Furthermore, Alice didn't regard his manhandling of her as assault. Robert remembered how sore his head was after he tripped over her feet and slammed into the door jam. Black belt whatever must be one of Alice's myriad jits. Alice was the dangerous one. Poor Alice. Poor Bob. Poor Miri. Anyway, 
She told Bob that he was overreacting, and you really need your schooling here. She says you can stay as long as your behavior is... Her voice dwindled into silence, and she looked up at him. She couldn't figure out how to pass on the rest diplomatically. As long as you don't blast my daughter again. I understand, Mary. I'll be good. Well. Okay. Mary looked around. I, um, I guess that's all I had to say. I'll let you get on with whatever you're doing. Good luck with finals. She swung back on her bike and pedaled industriously away. That old bike had only three speeds. Robert shook his head, but he couldn't help smiling. 20. The Officer of the Watch Robert's finals were over. He had earned a 2.6 average and a B in search and analysis. He had worked harder than he ever had in his life. If it weren't for the imminent irrelevance of it all, he would have been proud of himself. Now it was Monday afternoon, and Robert was counting the hours, almost down to counting the minutes. The mysterious stranger had been very scarce lately. The cabal had met a couple of times, with Tommy doling out information on a need-to-know basis. Tommy had read too many spy novels. For now, all Robert knew was that they were meeting at the library at 5.30 tonight. Meantime, somewhere under Camp Pendleton, in theory, being officer of the watch for Continental U.S. Southwest was no different than running a snoop-and-swoop operation anywhere in the world. In theory, there could be world-wrecking conspirators at work here. In fact, this was home, in some of the best-connected real estate in the world. The chances they'd have to swoop were near zero. Nevertheless, for the next four hours, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Goode, Jr. would be responsible for protecting about 100 million of his neighbors from mass destruction. Goo arrived 20 minutes early, checked in with the current officer of the watch, and then looked for DHS screw-ups. Those were usually the worst thing about Conus watches. Through the miracle of virtual bureaucracy, Goo's Marine Expeditionary Group was tonight a part of the Department of Homeland Security. This was how DHS kept its budget so, ahem, small. Like a modern corporation, DHS seamlessly meshes with whatever organizations are needed at the moment. That was the hype. And tonight, well, glory be, there was not a single authorization glitch in sight. Bob walked around the bunker, transformed the green plastic walls into windows on the Southern California night. The air filled with abstractions, the status of his people and his equipment, the reorganization of his share of the analyst pool. He grabbed some coffee from the machine by the door and settled down at a very ordinary desk just a few feet from the launch area. Patrick? His second-in-command appeared across the table. Sir? Who all have we got tonight? An unnecessary question, but Patrick Weston produced the official list. The Marine Expeditionary Group consisted of four 12 Marine maneuver teams. Call them squads. Everyone else did. Back in the 20th century, Bob's command would have rated a second lieutenant. On the other hand, the MEG controlled thousands of vehicles, though most were the size of model airplanes, and enough firepower to finish almost any war in history. Most important to Bob Goo, everyone in his group had been through combat training as tough as any in the past. They were Marines. Patrick called them all in for a short meeting. The room stretched back from around Bob's desk, and for a few moments pretended to be an auditorium. Everyone looked cool. It had been a long time since anything had gone really wrong within CONUS. And we're a big part of the reason why. We'll be here four hours, said Bob. Hopefully the time will be a very boring snoop. As long as that's the case, you're free to stay in staff areas adjacent to your vehicles. But most of you have been on my watch before. You know I want you to keep your eyes open. Keep up with the analysts. He waved at the analyst pool. For a CONUS Southwest watch, this amounted to about 1,500 dedicated specialists, but with connections leading down to hundreds of thousands of services and millions of embedded processors. Tonight, Alice was in charge of the pool, and already the changes were evident. The three-dimensional rat's nest transformed with a clarity rarely seen outside of managers' dreams. Aside from her marvelous reorganization, the display was completely conventional. Between the humans who had clearance and could communicate directly, there were hundreds of color-coded associational threads. 
the mass of the lower levels was constantly a flicker, weights and assessments and connections shifting from second to second. Bob pointed at the reddish threat wackos that were always part of the mix. What have we got to worry about for the next four hours? The analysts behind the red nodes spewed out their consensus list and supporting pointers. But even the paranoids didn't have much to say tonight. Action issues. Possible anti-librarium protest at UCSD. Belief circle riot a near certainty. Possible organized participants. Yeji Hatsek belief circle. CIA assessment of Indo-European connection. Skuchamut belief circle. CIA assessment of Central African connection. CIA assessment of Sub-Saharan connection. CIA assessment of Paraguay connection. RIAA report to Congress. Commercial entities. Possible threats to infrastructure. Proximity to critical national security sites. General Genomics. Huertas International. Increased illegal computation imports. Orange County. Los Angeles County. Off-scale low probability estimate linking preceding items. Law enforcement issues. FBI vice raid at Las Vegas Splendor Farm. A near certain event. Possible request for intelligence support. DEA enhancement drug raids in Kern County. Possible request for intelligence support. Possible out-of-area activity. Pacific Islander settlements in Alberta. Persons of interest. Arizona. California. San Diego County. Increased short-term South Asian visitors. Others. Nevada. Recusal advisements. Bob let the list hang for a moment. Ha, huh, said one of the gunnies. At least the policias won't be a problem. Denying the law enforcement requests should be easy tonight, not like for kidnapping or murder prevention. A tech sergeant flickered highlights across the UCSD event cluster. This is what will keep us busy. Her light paused, expanding on definitions. What? This is a fight between belief circles? I never heard of such a thing. One of the youngest marines laughed. You're just getting old, Nancy. Cross-belief strife is tragic new. Bob didn't try to parse the slang, but he'd heard enough from Dad and Miri to get the point. He expanded the description of the expected riot. It looks like a combination of 20th century protest and modern gaming. It should be as safe as most public events. The problem is the location. There was so much biolab work near UCSD that any instability was a concern. This is worth a lot of your attention. Note the stats on foreign interest. He moved on to the links in persons of interest. As usual, those expanded into the tens of thousands. At one point or another, almost everyone, unless they were dead, in which case they might still count for bioterror paranoia, came under scrutiny. I'm not going to ask you to dredge through the POI or this watch will last all year, but follow what the spooks throw up at you and watch for real-time changes. That last was classic wisdom, proven in dozens of disasters and disasters avoided so far this century. The analysts always had a million suspicions, but when they hit the hard, cold world of real time, success depended on whether the operational folks had been paying attention. And then there was the item that stood a little down from all the others, recusal advisements, that is, team members who might somehow compromise this watch. Normally, that was the most paranoid list of all, but his crew would see no cloud of detail here, not even links. Such advice was eyes only for himself and his backups. In practice, if there had been any serious problems there, they would have been taken care of well before this briefing. Questions? He looked around. There was a moment of silence, Marines drinking in the details of the moment, answering a lot of questions for themselves. Then the young slang slinger spoke up. Sir, the equipment... Is it the same as for a technical threat overseas mission? Bob looked back into the young eyes. The boost gear is lighter than usual. That's the only difference, Corporal. We're here to protect, but ultimately that means to protect the whole country. The whole world, some would say. So, yes, we're carrying a full strategic load. He leaned back and gave a look that included all his Marines. I don't expect any problems. If we pay attention and do our jobs, this will be just another peaceful evening for the people of California. He dismissed the crew, and the room shrank to its true dimensions. Patrick Weston had a few follow-up questions about squad deployment, and then his image departed too. 
Bob Goo turned down his augmentation, and for a brief moment there was just his table and chair, sitting by the coffee machine. On his right was the doorway that led to real hardware. With luck, he wouldn't see any of that tonight. Bob, Arrow, Alice, open SM. Are you cool? Close SM. Alice, Arrow, Bob, open SM. Cool and clear. The UCSD thing will be good practice for my lab audit. Talk to you after. Close SM. That is, after the watch was complete. Tonight, Alice was top analyst. If she weren't currently trained for the audit, she might have been the operational commander. She was one of only a handful of people qualified for both jobs. In either role, she was a joy to work with, as long as he didn't have to think about the sacrifices that made her performance possible. He finished his coffee and brought back his visuals, now fully customized. He checked again with Cheryl Grant. She was ready to go. Okay, for the record. Goo, Arrow, Grant, open SM. I take the watch, ma'am. Close SM. He and Grant exchanged salutes. The clock was started. His squads settled into total alertness. They would have to stay that way for four hours. Not a long time, but about the longest you could remain watch alert without drugs. Bob's job was different. He was like a sheepdog running around the outside of the flock, skittering from topic to topic. He watched where marines and analysts were spending their time. This was partly to stay ahead of hotspots, partly to detect attentional holes. For a moment, he looked down from a popular press viewpoint over UCSD. This event was going to involve a lot of demonstrators, many of them physically present, and network stats showed that a flash crowd situation was possible on top of that. He wondered if Miri was surfing this. The thought brought him back to the moment. He looked again at the recusal advisements. Half of his Marines had relatives enrolled at UCSD. That was the big problem with a local snoop. Three of his people were actually part-time students at UCSD. The slang slinger had a hobby of scoochie decoration that involved a number of Bangalore fans. If this hadn't been the kid's duty night, he'd be down there on campus right now. But the analysts had done a minute-by-minute minute on the young fellow, going back 14 months. There were some illegalities, some enhancement drug abuse, but nothing that would affect the mission. Bob had searched the entire recusal tree. Now he ran off its pointers, boring deep. Dad didn't show up. And I was sure he'd be mixed up in the librarium thing. Not that that would be serious grounds for recusal. He was skittering too far afield, a common problem for commanders with latitude. Xu Xiang? The name was vaguely familiar, but it wouldn't have popped out at him if his own name hadn't been in the item. Chang was one of about 300,000 people in Conus Southwest who were currently of interest for tinkering with hardware. Much of that was illegal, of course. Such people could be thrown to the FBI. But it was more productive simply to track them. Most of these people were benign hobbyists or intellectual property cheats. Some were the hands for terrorist cults, and some were the analyst smarts behind those cults. Chang had the intelligence and training to be in this last category, but so far the most interesting thing about her was the range of toys she had built, a regular museum of oddball electronics, and she was in one of Dad's classes. That connection was marked tenuous. But there was also a reference to rainbows and rest home. This woman was Mom's roomie. And all this time he'd worried about how dull life must be for Mom nowadays. What a team. The mad scientist and his mother the shrink and... What's this? Weeks of do-it-yourself snooping that Miri and Mom and this Shang had run on Dad. A dozen surmises rose to mind, and... Mission, mission, keep your eyes on the mission. He resolutely pushed all the personal issues aside. The main thing this proved was the stupidity of running watches with local personnel. Bob grabbed another coffee and settled back to watch the views of UCSD and the night's other hotspots, in the modern military, losing concentration was much the same sin as falling asleep on duty. It was time to get in the groove. And still, a tiny internal voice did its best to distract. What in heaven's name have Miri and Mom been up to? Monday, 5 p.m. Finally. Twilight was still colorful in the sky over La Jolla shores when Robert drove into the traffic loop north of Warshawski Hall, 
He headed east on foot, toward the Geisel Library. Ready for the big night, my man? That was the stranger, Sharif, walking beside him. Passersby didn't seem to see his green-faced companion. Robert gave the stranger a sour look. I'm ready to see you deliver. Don't worry. If we succeed tonight, you'll have your peculiar genius fully back, my word on it. Robert grunted. Not for the first time, he speculated on the lunacy of the terminally desperate. And don't look so discouraged, Professor. You've already done your hardest part. Tonight it's mainly Tommy Parker who has to get things straight. Tommy? I wonder. You wonder? The stranger's smile broadened. So you've identified Tommy's Miracle Design Bureau. Poor Tommy. He's the only one of you who thinks he's running free. In fact, he thinks I'm just one of his best collaborators. See, I can be nice when that's absolutely necessary. There were as many people here as Robert had ever seen on a campus evening in his grad school days. Up ahead, in the direction of the library, light hung in the sky, brighter than the twilight behind them. Looking down from the tops of the eucalyptus trees, Robert could see crowds along the esplanades south and east of the library. There seemed to be several groups, not mixing. What's going on? That must be the distraction Tommy had promised. It was far larger than Winnie's librarium demonstration. Heh. I've planned extraordinary festivities around the library tonight. Almost everybody's invited, especially staff from General Genomics Labs. But not you. I suggest we detour around the library. But that was the rendezvous point. It's already too busy. We'll head for Pilchner Hall direct. This way, please. The stranger pointed to the right, into dark eucalyptus trees. Meantime, in the Gen Gen labs, Sheila Hansen popped up half an hour into the night shift. You ready, Tim? Tim Wynn sat back from his desk and gestured up his little helpers. We're ready, boss. He stepped into the corridor and followed Hansen's come-hither arrows up the stairs. She and the rest of her lab techs were already gathered round the surface entrance. Four or five were recent graduates. The rest, like Timothy Wynn himself, were work-study students. You're sure this isn't going to lose us our jobs? Belief Circle Gaming was all very well outside of work, but Wynn would never have considered this adventure if his own supervisor hadn't suggested it. Hansen laughed. I told you. Gen Gen regards this battle as a form of public service. Besides, it will embarrass Huertas International. Her glance took in all of them, Gen Gen's entire night crew except for Regulomics. Sheila's explanation was enough for Tim. Once upon a time, he had really looked forward to working at Gen Gen. How many people got to see, in person, the lab equipment that their college majors were built upon? But more often than not, his job came down to unwedging over-enthusiastic cleaning robots and hauling non-prepped cargo. Yes, sometimes there were real problems, problems where you got to consult with users and help customize their experiment setup. But then you spent days devising automation so that wouldn't happen again. Not one of the crew members, even the ones who weren't Scoochamoodies, looked unhappy about tonight's little diversion. Okay, everybody, said Sheila. Let's see you look properly formed. They slipped into their scoochy characters. There were Pofu Longs and Dwelbs and a great big Shima Ping. The Shima Ping was Sheila. She glanced at Wynne. You can't be the Scoochamoot, Tim. That's reserved. But I'm commanding the critters. He waved at the helper bots that had followed him up the stairs. You're guiding them, Tim. You can be a lesser Scoochamoot. Okay. He shifted form. These were all world-class designs, not seen before tonight. He doubted very much that any of them would remain reserved for long, but if Sheila wanted to play the beliefs strictly, he wasn't going to be the one to break the circle. They trooped out the doors, into the evening twilight. There was still color in the tops of the eucalyptus. South, across the ravines, their goal was a vast double pyramid, glassy faceted on top, dark and bevined below and that was the real naked-eye view, the Geisel Library. As they moved along, Sheila and others were fitting their vision over the world. This hadn't been rehearsed. It was designed as a surprise for the Hatsekians, but even more as a surprise for the world that would soon be coming down to watch. One by one, 
The yukes made little popping noises and suddenly were transformed into moonflower trees, their leaves fluorescent in the twilight. We have been noticed, someone said. Of course, we're all over. There are snice and gotta runs coming from the lit building. There's Fwex and Libaloos flying from our basement at the library. And every appearance sent a tiny fraction of a penny winging back up the scoochy tree of creation. For once, Tim didn't mind the ripoff. The Scoochamoot affiliance was as broad as any. Even hardware illegals at the edge of the world would benefit from the royalties. Hansen, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. Keep our gear out of sight, long as you can. Close SM. The real view from local cams would show that some of the scoochy images wrapped real critters. So for the moment, Sheila wanted all the privacy she could get on that. What the Hatsekians learned would have to come from public viewpoints and their own naked eyes. Wynn let Rick Smale and the others handle that. He concentrated on running the critters, all the lab bots with enough range and flexibility to walk to the library. These gadgets did routine cleaning and module swap-outs. They weren't designed for running around in the wild out of doors. But Jen Jen had cleared them to go, and Timothy Wynn was having a ball. First, he laid down a consensus for the robot's appearance. There were queeps and chirps, spitting and shooting in all directions. In reality, these were his 400 mobile manipulators, known as tweezerbots, in the business. They were barely fast enough to keep up with the humans. But he also had mapped Mega Munches and Zoro Shows and Salsipweds, these onto his cleaner bots and sample carriers. Behind them lurked the two largest mechs in Huynh's lab, combination forklifts and heavy equipment installers. For now, they were tricked out as gray-masted blue ionopods. He had supplied the physical specs two weeks ago, when the prospect of this adventure had first floated around the labs. The resulting visual designs were spectacular, and meshed with the reality of the underlying robots and the touchy-feely gear that Wynn had attached to the bot's hulls. If you patted the Zorro show on its haunches, you'd feel muscles sliding lithely under silky fur, just what your eyes were telling you. As long as they were confronted by only a few pairs of human hands, the haptics were fast enough to maintain the illusion. They were better than anything he'd ever touched on Pyramid Hill. Of course, the remote audience would benefit very little from that, but it would boost the morale of the Scoochies here in person and undermine their opposite numbers among the Hatsekians. And that enemy was already forming up. Five Knights Guardians stood on the library's east terrace, and a librarian lurked by the snake path. That's all they have? So far, said Sheila the Shima Ping. I'm just hoping we aren't too fragmented. Yeah. That was the virtue and the weakness of the Scoochie worldview, Scoochamoot was distributed in bits and pieces. It was customized to the wishes of children, not just in the great powers, but also in the failed states at the edge of the world. The Scoochies had so many different creations. The Hatsekians had the notion of knowledge conquering outward, a vision that claimed consistency over everything, and just now that fit their near-total control of the library. The Shima Ping bounced up and down on its three feet, Sheila was shouting at the enemy with what must have been an external speaker, since Wynne could feel the loudness all over. Get out of our way! We want our floor space! We want our library! And most of all, we want our real books! That last demand made for a good chant, even if it didn't quite fit with Scoochie's edge-of-the-world background. Sheila's gang raced forward with the battle cries, but now dozens of Hatsekians joined the Five Knights Guardian. Surely most were virtual, but the blending was perfection. No surprise, both sides knew this was coming. This was a collision of belief circles. The point was to convince the wider world by belief and images that Skuchamuts was the greater vision. Both sides thought they knew what was coming. In fact, Tim's had something special planned. The Hatsekians roared their threats at the Scoochie army, at the chirps and queeps, and the larger, vaguely seen things that lumbered along behind them. They thought it was all clever imagery and human players. Then the first of the gray-masted blue ionopods crunched onto asphalt, and the Hotsek people realized that the sound it made was real. At the same time, one of the Salsipweds, a sample carrier, raced out and bit a knight on the ankle. It was just a small electric shock, really, but the Hotsekians recoiled, wailing, Cheaters! Cheaters! And it was cheating, really. 
but Wynn saw from the network stats that support for his side had doubled. Besides, we're doing it for a good cause. Timothy Wynn never used the physical library that much, but what had happened there rankled. The terrace was clear for the moment, but Sheila hesitated. Hansen, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. I don't like the straight run-in. I think they have something planned. Close SM. Yes, see? Smale shouted aloud and pointed them to views from above the library's entrance. Those cams showed spider-like somethings guarding the final approach to the library doors. The creatures were so thick they almost hid the stone mosaic. Then the views went offline. Geez, were those critters real? I think some of them were, said Sheila. Can't be. Even electrical engineering doesn't have that many robots. In this contest, we are the ones with mechanical superiority. But what if the enemy had bought a mob of hobby bots? If even half of those mechs were real? Sheila paused, listening to advice that might be coming from anywhere on Earth. Then she roared, Into the trees! They gave a ragged shout. What came out of the synthetics was an answering roar, loud and baroque and totally scoochy. They pounded off into the bushes southeast of the library. Virtual imagery faded into an artful blur that disguised the patchy network coverage. The smaller mechs, the cleaners and sample carriers and tweezer bots, had little trouble with the mulchy ground cover. It was the forklifts that were the problem. They sank into the softness. Wynne ran around them, giving a push here and moving a stone there. The monsters slowly shuffled forward. It was not so different from some of the work he had to do down in the lab, but now was the time for some out-of-band complaining. Win, Arrow, Hansen, Open SM. This doesn't help, Sheila. The spider bots will just follow us here. Close SM. Hansen, Arrow, Win, Open SM. Bear with me. This detour will work. Watch what I... Close SM. A little yip of surprise came from Sheila's lips, and her sentence hung uncompleted. The virtual scoochies blundered on for a pace or two, depending on their various latencies, but the Gen Gen night crew stumbled to an abrupt stop. Everybody milled around for a moment, images coalescing as they threaded roots out of the thicket. But that was not the reason for the sudden stop. They were all staring at... a man and a rabbit. The first real, the second virtual. The two weren't exactly hiding, they were standing in a clearing, but there was brush all around, and until the scoochies came stumbling in, there had been no camera viewpoint on this spot. The rabbit was nothing special, a tunish chimera. It had a nicely impudent leer, you had to give it that. Sheila the Shima Ping hesitated a second, then took a couple of threatening steps toward the rabbit. You're out of place. The critter took a chomp out of its carrot and waggled an ear. What's it to you, Doc? I'm not a doctor, yet, said the Shima Ping. The rabbit laughed. In your dreams, then. I'm here to remind you that it's not just you and Hotsek in collision tonight. There are other greater powers at work. It wailed the last words and swept a carrot-clutching white-furred paw at the sky. Win, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. Come on, Sheila, there are always bystanders. Close SM. Smail, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. Stopping here just dilutes our reputation. Close SM. But Sheila ignored the objections. She sidled around the impudent rabbit and stepped close to the physically present human. That guy looked aggressively normal. In his fifties, maybe Hispanic, dressed in dark work clothes. He was the perfect picture of UCSD faculty, though a bit overdressed. He was wearing, but very low-key, not even showing courtesy info. His eyes followed the Shima Ping with a sure calmness that, now that Huynh noticed, was a little unnerving. Then Huynh saw what Sheila was seeing. The stranger was projecting imagery. It was a subtle thing, the sort of far lavender shades that you almost can't see. They were a mist that drifted up from the stranger's shoes and seemed even brighter as they flowed into the trees. Hansen, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. Switch to Utility View, Close SM. Gen Gen's utility diagnostics were tricky to use outside of a lab, but they were much more sophisticated than what came with Epiphany outfits. In the utility view, you could see that this guy was heavily equipped. The lavender hinted at that, but now Wynne could see the scintillation of the high-rate laser links coming from the guy's clothes. Without the lavender clue, 
they might never have noticed. Sometimes the highest form of showmanship is to pretend at unsuccessfully pretending to be innocuous. Smale, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. Hey, this guy, he's hooked into the Bollywood people here on campus. Close SM. They stared at each other with joyous surmise. This must be a genuine Bollywood mogul. Belief circles were the fuel that sustained the movie industry. Hansen, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. I told you, battling the Hatsekians would mean big recognition. Close SM. Booting Hatsekian ass out of the library was more important than ever. Onward, shouted Hansen, now out loud and across all the world. Down with Hatsek! Down with the Librario Menace! The Virtuals and almost all the night crew continued on through the forest. Wynne stayed behind a few seconds, making sure that no queep or chirp was stuck in the leaves, making sure that the forklifts had enough space between the trees. And then they were all pounding along again. We want our floor space. We want our library. And most of all, we want our real books. Wynne did not expect that the spider bots would be caught by surprise. What did Sheila have up her Shima Ping sleeve? 21. When Belief Circles Collide Alfred Vaz watched the departing crazies. Beside him, rabbits swayed in time to their battle cries. For once, the critter seemed impressed by someone other than itself. Or maybe not. Heh, it said, giving a little carroty salute. I can't wait to see their faces when they discover who's fighting for the other side. Vaz looked down at the furry ears. Turn off your public presence. The goal was to not attract attention. You worry too much. But the rabbit took a last chomp and tossed the carrot green aside. This one vanished before it hit the ground. Okay, Doc. I'm for your eyes only. What next? Vaz grunted and started off toward the south. In fact, he was more irritated than worried by Rabbit's impudence. If things went properly tonight, the Americans would not connect the operation with Rabbit, much less with the Indo-European alliance. If the Americans started seriously looking, they would quickly pick out Alfred's role here, whether or not he and Rabbit were actually seen together. Keiko's people had worked out an elaborate decision program, a contingency tree, that described just what could still be denied and what could still be achieved in the face of various glitches. Twenty years ago, Alfred would have laughed at such automated planning, but no more. His secret analyst teams had developed his own contingency tree. It grew out from Keiko's, reaching all the way to ultimate worst cases, such as the unmasking of his YGBM project. Alfred emerged from the densest part of the eucalyptus grove. All around him, his tiny bots unobtrusively kept pace. Everyone was in violation of local law, containing not a single chip in thrall to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. While Vaz continued to play Bollywood exec through the public net, these devices provided him with his own network and countermeasures. There were places in the contingency tree where they could be very useful. Meantime, a tiny stealthed arrow bot followed along above, accepting his local network's traffic and flickering it at a thousand points in the westward sky, the energy in any pulse would be undetectable except to someone very alert and very close by, but the ensemble, correlated with the right time sync, should be visible to Keiko's antenna array out over the Pacific. It was their very own military net. That was the theory. In fact, Alfred had been out of touch for nearly three minutes. He knew Alice Gong was on watch tonight, probably as an analyst. He had launched his attack on her just before he lost Milnet access, very soon, her surveillance duties would bring her to a lab file containing an innocuous Marais pattern, only the pattern would not be innocuous for her. Has that happened yet? Maybe he should snoop it out via the public net. Come on, Doc, come on, come on! Rabbit danced a little jig. Its voice had a mocking lilt that Alfred had first heard some eighty years earlier. Is there some kind of problem? No problem, said Vaz. Are your agents in place? Never fear. All but Rivera and Goo are at the start point. I'm guiding them around the riot even as we speak. But if you want to snoop the fiber, you better hurry up. The ground was firm and level. There was a surfaced path. Now their speed was limited by how fast his mechs could make their stealthy way. There were crowds here, but almost everyone was walking toward the library. 
he caught a glimpse of Rivera and Goo, and once he saw two children on bicycles. Where did that fit with Hatsekians and Scoochies? He would have put the question to his analyst pool, if only he had his Milnet link. The mysterious stranger hustled Robert off the surface path, down past where administration bungalows used to be. Robert kept a virtual light on the rough ground. The view was up to the second and clearer than a flashlight might have given him, but keeping up with the stranger didn't leave time to ghost around the library. Those are real lights back there, he said. Even more than before. What? The Hatsek people got a little too enthusiastic. They've destroyed some camera infrastructure. They need real light. He was chuckling. Don't worry. No one will be hurt, and it's a diversion that will be... useful. The stranger slowed. Robert looked away from the ground for a moment. Over the hill he got a look, from a point high in the trees, at the people on the ground. In true view, they were students shouting at each other, a few involved in real scuffles. But shift a little away from strict reality, and the imagery became what one group or another wanted you to see. There were Hatsek knights and librarians tussling with fluffy, colorful critters that might have been big-eyed mammals or... Ah! So it's the Scoochamute fans going after the Hatsekians? Mostly. The stranger seemed to be listening for something. Somebody was coming down the hill on an intercept course. A librarian militant, Carlos Rivera. The chubby librarian nodded at strangers Sharif and Robert. What a mess. But a useful mess, said the stranger. Yeah. Carlos dropped his costume. The librarian's hat reverted to an everyday baseball cap worn backwards, and now his plate armor was just Bermuda shorts and the Rivera standard t-shirt. I just hope this fighting doesn't become a tradition. The mysterious stranger waved them on through the brush. A tradition, he said. But that would be a plus. Like panty raids and putting automobiles on top of administration buildings. The sort of thing that made American universities great. Rivera puffed along. Maybe. We've had a lot more business since the library went virtual, but... Robert was still watching the mobs beyond the hill. I thought the whole point of belief circles was that they can coexist in the same space. In principle, said Rivera. They took a big detour around a space that was dark even in the virtual. Sharif's image seemed to flicker and jerk. So few people walked through this area that the random network was sparse and your wearable had to make way too many guesses. But, Rivera continued, the library is a tight fit. In principle, we can morph to support the multiple beliefs, like on Pyramid Hill. In fact, our environment is often too close for conflicting haptics, so the administration tried to satisfy the Scoochies by giving them some space underground. Rivera paused, and Robert almost ran him over. You knew that wouldn't work, didn't you? Carlos was looking at Stranger Sharif, or what Robert saw as Stranger Sharif. The stranger turned and smiled. I gave you the best advice I had, dear boy. Yeah. Rivera sounded close to Surly. He looked over his shoulder at Robert. What does he have on you, Professor? I- Ah, 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 interrupted the stranger. I think we'd all be more comfortable without such revelations. Okay said both victims. In any case, said the stranger, I'm rather proud of how I've morphed the librarium controversy into this conflict between belief circles. This riot will distract people who would otherwise be paying attention to other things, such as what we're doing. They were well south of the library now, out of the trees and coming down a steep slope. Just ahead was Gilman Drive. Carlos walked heedlessly into the street. The cars slowed or speeded up or changed lanes, so there was always a wide bubble of empty space around him. Robert hesitated, looking for a crosswalk. Damn. Finally, he scooted after Carlos, out into traffic. Miri stopped on the north side of Gilman Drive. So where are they going? said Juan. They're coming down to Gilman Drive. Viewpoints in the eucalyptus showed Robert and the librarian, Carlos Rivera, walking through deep brush. The pictures were fragmentary, since there weren't many cameras there, but Miri was sure no one was pulling a swap on her. The two would reach the roadway in a couple of minutes. But that's true of anyone coming south. Miri stopped her bike, put a foot on the ground. Look, you want me to say I don't know where they're going, is that it? The Orozco kid stopped his Wiki Bay bike beside her. 
Honest, I'm just wondering. Xu Shang popped into existence, and a moment later, so did a young version of Lina Gu. Their images were Barbie doll stiff, but every day they got better. For instance, Lina had mastered facial expressions, and right now her look was stern. Juan isn't the only one with this question, young lady. If you don't know, you should say so. Xu just sounded anxious. Lina and I are driving around the north side of campus. Maybe my research was all wrong. How can we help if the action is on the south? Miri struggled to make her own voice serene. I think you got it right, Dr. Xiang. Juan and I have been following Robert closely, but now... I guess I don't know where he's going. That makes it even more important that we stay spread out. Please, Dr. Xiang, if you and Lena can stay on the north side, that would be best. Over the last few days, Xu had done some good detective work. She could be really smart when she wasn't doubting herself. They knew that Huertas kept the Librarium Shredda in his labs on the north side. If Robert's friends planned a direct protest, that would be the sensible place for them to break in. So why aren't Robert and the others heading that way? Big boogers of uncertainty were beginning to form. But Dr. Shang nodded, and not even Juan Orozco asked the obvious embarrassing questions. This was still the Miri gang, for better or worse. The treetop cams had lost sight of Robert and Mr. Rivera. Miri dropped those viewpoints and glanced up the hillside, almost with a naked eye perspective. The other two were still out of sight. They could come out on Gilman Drive almost anywhere. Miri licked her lips. The main thing is to keep these crazy fools, said Lena, from doing anything too destructive. Yeah, said Juan, nodding. Who do you think that remote guy is? the one who's walking with them. What? Juan was a mostly clueless kid, but sometimes he was accidentally very sharp. Miri played back her last images of Robert and Mr. Rivera. Those pics were fragmentary, but Juan was right. The two were looking at a consistent location that drifted along with them and granting it a certain amount of open space. So, a private presence. Juan said, I'll bet they're seeing Zulfi Sharif. I'll bet you're right. Not for the first time tonight, she tried to bring up her Sharif control. Still no response. So do something. Come on, Juan. She walked her bike out onto Gilman Drive, crossing the lane slowly enough not to get a ticket. Shu and Lena drifted along. Traffic is heavy, said Lena. It's the belief circles clash. People are attending in person. The gaming buzz had come out of the blue, but Miri could not imagine that it was coincidence. Setting this up must have involved deep coordination. Even though the clash was still just rumor, there was a huge turnout. The cars around them were dropping off passengers. People were laughing and shouting and talking and walking toward the library. The sidewalks on the other side of Gilman Drive were all but empty. She reached the far curb and looked back. Come on, Juan! Now the sky above the library was twisting violet, a very nice fractal effect from some art co-op in northern China. She glanced at network status. It wasn't just automobile traffic that was heavy. She could see network trunks lighting up all over California. There were millions of viewpoints being exported from UCSD's campus. There were hundreds of thousands of virtual participants. As Juan caught up with her, she said, It's a whirlwind. Like a big game first day. The boy nodded, but he wasn't paying attention. Look what I found in the street. The gadget was half crushed. Metal fibers hung from one side. She waved for him to drop it. Roadkill, so? If a node lost connectivity and then got into the street, well, something that small would get run over. I think it's still online, but I can't get a catalog match. Miri looked closer. There was spiky flickering, but no response. It's pingless wreckage, Juan. Juan shrugged, then dropped the gadget into his bike bag. He had a blank look. He was still searching. It looks like a Cisco 33, but... Fortunately, Orozco had not distracted everyone. Lena said, Miri, I found Robert and the Rivera fellow. There was a pause while Lena got the camera ID. There. Robert and Rivera were crossing the roadway a quarter mile west of them. We're on it, Lena. In Robert's time, this side of Gilman Drive had been Quonset Huts. In later years, Classic University of California Concrete had housed the medical school. 
Now there was Pilchner Hall, which, like almost everything else on campus, looked as temporary as the old Quonsets. The mysterious stranger led Robert and Carlos into the building. Real light followed them in concentrated pools, while farther down the hall the view was virtual. There might have been other people in the building, but the stranger avoided them. He headed down a stairway, into a warren of tiny rooms. In places the floor was dusty. Elsewhere it was polished clean, or covered with streaky scrape marks. Eh, said the stranger, pointing at the scrapes. Tommy has been at work. This old floor has been rearranged for tonight, and there are parts that just won't show on the university's security plan. Their path was now a trek through the maze. Finally, the mysterious stranger stopped at a closed door. He paused and spoke soberly. As you may know, Professor Parker is not fully on board. For the sake of your various goals, I suggest you be careful not to enlighten him. Robert and Carlos nodded. The mysterious stranger turned and mimed knocking on the plastic door. His hand sounded like a hammer pounding heavy wood. After a moment, the door opened and Winston Blount peered out. Hello, Carlos. His gaze passed less favorably over Robert and the stranger. He waved them in. The room was a triangular wedge trapped between slanting walls. A concrete caisson took up most of the floor space. Tommy Parker sat on the floor beside a handcart that was filled with plastic bags and backpacks. Hiya, guys. You're right on time. He glanced at his laptop. You'll be pleased to know that press and police did not notice your arrival. At the moment, we're standing in a room that doesn't even exist. This, he slapped the case on, is still visible to the university, but it will happily lie about what we're doing. Robert edged round the blocky structure. I remember this. In the 1970s, the caisson had been out of doors, covered with a wooden lid. He looked over the edge. Yes, just as before, iron ladder rungs marched downward into darkness. Tommy stood up. He had his laptop in a sling that left the keyboard and display accessible, but also freed him to move about. In his own way, Tommy Parker had arrived at wearable computing. Tommy reached into the handcart and lifted out two plastic bags. Time to leave your epiphanies behind, guys. I've got new clothes for you. You really meant it, said Rivera. Yep. Your old clothes will help me fake your location. Meantime, the real you will be with me, and using far better equipment. Not laptops, I hope, said Winnie, giving Parker's laptop sling a doubtful look. But he and the others shed shirts and pants and shoes. They still had their contact lenses, but now there was nothing to drive them. The real lighting was bright enough, but without external sound and vision, the room felt like a coffin. Tommy seemed genuinely embarrassed by all the naked flab, but not for long. He pulled open one of the plastic bags and passed around pants and shirts. They looked like plain gray fabric, working clothes. Carlos held his new shirt up to the light and peered at the weave. He folded it between his hands and rubbed the sides together. These clothes are dumb. Yep. No infrared microlasers, no processor nodes. Just the good cotton as God meant us to wear it. But don't worry, I have processors. I was joking about laptops, Tommy. Tommy shook his head. No, not laptops either. I have herd boxes. Huh? Without his wearable, Robert was stumped. Carlos looked just as blank, but then some errant natural memory must have popped up. Oh, herd OS. But isn't that obsolete? Tommy was rummaging in the second plastic bag. He did not look up. Not obsolete, just illegal. Ah, here they are. Genuine hecho en Paraguay. He handed each of his co-conspirators a black plastic box about the size and shape of a paperback book. There was a real keypad on one side and a metallic clip on the other. Just snap it on your waistband. Make sure the metal tab is actually touching your skin. Robert's new pants were too short, and the shirt fit like a tent. He slipped the criminal computer on his waistband and felt the cold touch of metal on his skin. He could see a faint overlay now. It was a picture of a keypad, and when his hand rested on the box at his waist, he saw markers corresponding to his fingertips. What a pitiful interface. 
Don't cover the box with your shirt, Carlos. All the comports are on it. Winnie. You mean we have to turn in just the right direction to make a connection? Yep. While we're below, our only external routing will be through my laptop, and my laptop's only uplink will be through this. Tommy held up something that looked like a prayer wheel. He gave it a little spin. There was a glint in the air, sliding along a thread too fine to see, to a connector Tommy held in his other hand. He turned and plugged that into a box on the handcart. Check it out. Robert pulled his shirt back from his waistband and turned so the box had a clear view of Tommy's laptop. Nothing. He entered a simple command, and now he could see through the walls again. North of Gilman Drive, there were even more people heading toward the library. Indoors, he drifted back up the hallway, still deserted. No. There was a fellow walking purposefully down toward their secret room. Then he lost the viewpoint. Hey, Tommy. What? The stranger's voice sounded in Robert's ear. The audio was as bad as his old view page, but he clearly heard, You didn't see a thing, my man. I... Robert swallowed. Your fiber link is working fine, Tommy. Good, good. Parker walked among them, making sure that everyone could receive and transmit. Okay, you're all equipped. That was the fun part. Now here's the pack mule part. He pointed at the backpacks in the handcart. Robert's pack weighed something like 40 pounds. Carlos's looked about the same. Tommy and Winnie had smaller packs. Even so, Blount struggled with his load. Winnie's like an old man. Yeah, read Weber's heavenly minefield. Robert looked away before Winnie could take offense. He shrugged his own pack into a more comfortable position and complained, I thought this was the future, Tommy. Where's the miniaturization? Or at least the automatic freight handlers. Where we're going, the infrastructure ain't friendly, Robert. Tommy glanced at his laptop's display. Hello, Mr. Sharif. Okay, it looks like we're all ready to go. He bowed them toward the dark hole in the middle of the room. After you, gentlemen. 22. The Bicycle Attack Alfred waited a decent time before entering the room. No sense in making noise that rabbits' stooges might hear. What did I tell you, Doc? We're in! We're in! Rabbit danced a merry jig around the caisson. The optical fiber that was giving Rabbit such joy was invisibly thin, except when the light caught it just right. Vaz nodded. He had a different communications success to celebrate. He had re-established his millnet link across the Pacific. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. U.S. Homeland Security looks calm, Alfred. Close SM. Alfred watched the stats streaming by. They were from the Alliance's listening posts. The national security scene was indeed calm, even though the library disturbance had brought crowds to the UCSD campus. Rabbit had created the perfect paradoxical distraction. Almost perfect. The affair was growing too large. Vaz knelt beside the box that marked the termination point of Thomas Parker's fiber link. The box was a scamful bridge. On one side, it accepted the uncertified data streams from Parker's criminal computers. On the other, it was a good citizen, running under the government-required secure hardware environment. It hid Parker's data in innocent packages wrapped in all the licenses and permissions needed to survive on the she of the Internet. Altogether, it was not as secure as Vaz's Milnet, but it would suffice for most regions of the contingency tree. Alfred tweaked the box, and now he was getting Parker's video direct. At last, he was truly a local honcho. The video from Parker's laptop bounced around without a bit of program control, but Vaz recognized the equipment in the walls and some of the physical signage. Rabbit's stooges had breached Biolab security. Even more impressive, the delicate game of fooling the lab's automatic security was a continuing success. How far are they from goal A? Alfred asked Rabbit. In fact, that was the site of his private research program. He would pretend to inspect it along with the others. Almost there, Rabbit waved airily. They'll start dropping off equipment in less than ten minutes. Don't worry about a thing. Alfred looked out through his surface viewpoints. Most of my mobiles are trapped on the north side of Gilman Drive. In conventional combat, 
His bots would have simply seized the local infrastructure and come storming across. Instead, they were balked by the human and automobile traffic along the roadway. At least one had been struck by an auto. Rabbit spread its paws in mock sympathy. At least it didn't bring out another carrot. You can't have everything. Hotsack and Scoochie fans have done everything we could pray for. The human staff is out of the labs. The riot is sucking in the local comm resources. It'll be a regular black hole by the time it peaks. And it all looks totally innocent. Don't tell me you could mask this operation any better. Vaz let that brag go unanswered. He'd come to realize that irritation was the kindliest emotion he could feel for Rabbit. He sat with his back to the concrete caisson and tracked ongoing developments. He could see that the Department of Homeland Security people were watching closely, but they were watching the wrong places. Analyst consensus was that Rabbit had tuned things to match DHS paranoia perfectly. Maybe Alice Gong had been taken down, but undetected by Alliance monitors? Underground, Rabbit's stooges had almost reached goal A. In ten minutes, the investigation of that site would begin. In another half hour, he could begin to report his doctored results, and after that it was simply a matter of getting out and letting the stooges be captured. Things were going so smoothly he could have stayed back in Mumbai. Not that he was complaining. Analyst Red Flag Someone reviewing stale video had noticed something. Alfred brought up the flag report. It was a ten-second snippet from one of his mobiles on the north side of Gilman Drive, two children with bicycles. They were standing by the roadway and looking at something that might have been a crushed mech. Those are the two I saw earlier. Queries spread outward. Who were the children? Was the mobile one of Alfred's? Ugly answers came back. Rabbit didn't have access to the Indo-European analysts, but suddenly the creature sat up and gave an admiring whistle. Well, I'll be dipped. We've got company, Doc. Miri left her bike in the rack outside Pilchner Hall. Juan insisted on bringing his fancy fold-up into the building. When Miri pointed out the absurdity of this, the boy just shrugged. My bike is special. Lena and Shu were no longer visible, but Lena's voice followed them through the wide-open doors. There should be better security, Miri. I don't like this. It's the emergency overload behavior, Lena. Unoccupied rooms stay locked. The others are open. Lena said, and we can't see you anymore. The sudden drop in data was very strange, but Miri wasn't going to say that. Instead, I bet high-rate forwarding isn't supported except for around the library. Shu said, Yes, we still have spectacular views from there. The main corridors in Pilchner Hall had searchable viewpoints. There were glimpses of Robert's recent passage. That was enough to guide them downstairs but now there were places where Juan and Miri could talk only to each other. It's like a haunted house. Juan's voice was hushed. His hand reached out and grasped hers. She didn't shake him loose. She needed him to keep cool. Certainly losing connectivity in the middle of an office building was an eerie thing. They came around a corner, and there was a glimmer of connectivity, enough for Sming. Miri, Arrow, Miri Gang, Open SM. I think we're getting close. Close SM. Lena, Arrow, Miri Gang, Open SM. First we lost video. Now we can barely talk. Get out of there. Close SM. Miri, Arrow, Miri Gang, Open SM. It's just temporary. I'm sure Wikibell is shifting extra coverage into place. Close SM. How bad could an entertainment riot get? Miri imagined Lena was having a similar discussion with Dr. Shang in a certain car driving around the north side of campus. Grandmother seemed truly anxious. Shu, Arrow, Miri Gang, Open SM. I agree with Miri, but give Lena and me regular reports. Close SM. Lena, Arrow, Miri Gang, Open SM. Yes, even if that means you have to backtrack. Where is Robert now? Close SM. Miri, Arrow, Miri Gang, Open SM. Real close. I can ping him direct. Close SM. The twisty hallway was brightly lit, just what you'd expect during a network brownout. Juan's bike coasted along almost silently, all folded up into portability mode. He only had to give it a push every so often. Their footsteps and the faint snicking of its tires were the only sounds. They took another corner. 
The hall was narrower, with intersections every few feet. This was one of those temporary makeovers that crazy architects for a day liked to do. For a few dozen feet, they had high-rate connectivity. Ads and announcements appeared on the walls. Someone's medical research project loomed like a monster on the left. She gave Lena and Shu a continuous video as they turned another corner and lost all outside connectivity. Juan slowed, drew Miri to a stop. This place is really dead. Yeah, said Miri. They walked forward a few more paces. Except for her point-to-point -point link with Juan, she might as well have been on the far side of the moon. And there was another corner ahead. She pulled Juan forward. Around the corner, the corridor ended at a closed door. I can't ping your grandpa anymore, Miri. Miri looked at the map she had cached. This has to be where they are, Juan. If we can't get through, we'll just pound on the door. Suddenly, she didn't care too much about embarrassing Robert and his friends. This was too strange. But then the door opened, and a man in dark clothes stepped out. He might have been a janitor or a professor. Either way, he didn't look friendly. May I help you? He said. How did they find us? Rabbit made a warning gesture. Not out loud, Doc, it hissed. They might actually hear you. It seemed to look over Alfred's shoulder. I'd say they're following the girl's grandfather. Vaz glanced at the heap of clothes that lay by the caisson. He sminged back, voice format. Those clothes are still transmitting? Well, of course. To the outside, it looks like the old guys are just sitting around, maybe playing cards. I'm faking everything, even their medicals. Alfred realized he was grinding his teeth. That goo kid is such a pain, Rabbit continued. Sometimes I think she... Alfred waved his hand and the creature disappeared, along with all public network communication. There was now a deep local silence, a hard dead zone. But his milnet link was still in place, a fragile chain that led through his mobiles to his stealthed aerobot and thence across the Pacific. Alfred's analyst pool in Mumbai was estimating 60 seconds till the dead zone got serious attention from the campus police and fire departments. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. This can't be sustained, Alfred. Close SM. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Mitsuri, Open SM. I'll clear the dead zone in a few seconds. Close SM. This was why successful missions had a local honcho. He probed the mobiles that had made it into the building. The children were about 30 feet away, well inside the dead zone, and still coming. He could hear them, right through the plastic wall. He glanced at the door. It was locked. Maybe he could pretend to be empty air while they pounded on the door. No, they'd just back off and call the police. Okay, time for direct action. Alfred set the two nearest mobiles into motion. These were network superiority bots with essentially no anti-personnel capacity, but they would be a distraction. Then he opened the door and stepped out into the hall, confronting two children and a folded-up bicycle. May I help you? Miri tried to glare at the old fellow. Self-righteous indignation came hard when you were trespassing and trying to think of a good lie. And her link to the outside world was still fully dead. Juan stepped forward and just blathered out the truth. We're looking for Miri's grandfather. We ping him somewhere behind you. The janitor, professor, whatever, shrugged. There's no one here but myself. As you know, network connections are very unreliable this evening. The building shouldn't have allowed you down here. I'll have to ask you to go back to the public area. There was a sign by the door now, one of the standard biohazard symbols that covered a lot of the classrooms and labs in Pilchner Hall. You might think the public net was coming back up, except that Mary still couldn't probe beyond her line of sight. Juan nodded as if the old man made perfect sense. He walked forward a couple more steps, at the same time relaying what he saw back to Mary. The room beyond was brightly lit. There was some kind of hole in the floor, and she could see the top of a metal ladder. Okay, said Juan agreeably. He was fiddling with something on his bike, but point to point, his words were on fire. Juan, Arrow, Miri, Open SM. See the clothes? Close SM. Piled on the floor beside the pit. Miri, Arrow, Juan, Open SM. Time to go. Close SM. Get outside. 
get where they could call the cops. She shrugged, as casually as she could, and said, We'll be on our way then. The stranger sighed. No, it's too late for that. He started toward them. Behind her there was the snick of something hard on the floor, and she saw dark things scuttling toward her. There was no way back and no way forward. And then Juan made a way forward. He bounced his bike toward the stranger. There was a screech of rubber. The wheels spun up with all the power from the regen brakes, and the bike exploded across the room, smashing into the stranger and the equipment behind him. Miri ran forward, toward the pit. Come on, Juan! She knew where Robert must be, and how she could put out the alarm. She scrambled over the edge, saw metal rungs. Juan! Mr. Janitor Professor was back on his feet and staggering forward. He had something pointy in his hand. Miri was frozen for an instant, watching the pointy thing swing toward her. Orozco was such a runt. He couldn't stop someone like that. But he tried. The bad guy staggered back, and the thing in his hand made a bright purple flash. Miri felt a numbing tingle all across her side. She tipped over the edge of the pit, managed to grab a ladder rung with the hand that still had feeling, but her feet swung through emptiness. She pawed with her numb hand, missed, and fell onto very hard concrete. All her imagery was gone. Maybe her epiphany was fried. But she could see the circle of light above, and she could hear. Run, Miri! Run! Juan's shout was cut off by a meaty crunching sound. Miri ran. 23. In the Cathedral The UCSD library riot was the news of the evening. No doubt it would be echoing back and forth across the world for the next few weeks, a new twist in the trajectory of public entertainment. It was also a bright spot on Bob Goo's situation board. Too bright. Bob watched the analysts, even people with specialties as remote as forensic virology, cluster around that single locus in Southern California. There are other things going on tonight, guys. The DEA raid in Kern County had triggered real violence in the Canadian North. That was outside of Bob's watch area, but it might indicate that something more than simple enhancement drugs was involved. If not for the library riot, he'd be seeing dozens of theories floating up. Maybe the Kern County business was a cover for immigrant bashing. Maybe something more lethal than enhancements was involved. Analysts were great at such wild conjectures, and equally great at feeding on them, reducing them to rubble, or finding solid evidence and drawing in the firepower that Bob Goo commanded. But tonight, while the UCSD riot did have the taint of a classic diversion, covering something big and bad and elsewhere in Conus Southwest, Alice had doubled the size of the analyst pool. Now there were specialists from the Centers for Disease Control, even folks from other watches. Normally, she would have groomed her unruly mob of specialists. She had the breadth and the depth and the charisma to bring even academic civilians into line. But tonight, Alice was part of the problem. Every time he redirected the group into a wider view, she drew it back. She was the one who had diverted the virologists. There was a tight little cluster of bioscience types that grew brighter and closer, bandwidths rising. Alice was not studying the riot per se, but its connections to the bioscience labs that surrounded the school. Except for the diversion of their night staff, the labs showed all green, and the harder she pounded on the lab network security, the cleaner it looked. It's the damn jit. Alice had just completed her training for the biolab audit. That had been the most extensive jit she had ever undertaken. At this moment, he'd guessed there wasn't anyone in the world with more knowledge of lab automation and associated research. I should talk to her direct. No more polite redirections. Hell, if she won't back off, I should relieve her. And those thoughts were much too like their recent fights at home. So it was Bob who drew back. He sat and watched the correlations, the statistical outliers. He moved his group members away from San Diego issues. They would be the tripwires if UCSD was a diversion. The bioscience pool just got brighter. Alice had preempted CDC's genomics division. He would hear about that in the after-action meetings. He had a cold intuition. Tonight could be the night. The thing he personally feared as much as anything in the world, the possibility Alice always denied. Is she slipping away? What would a full-sized JIT collapse be like for someone who had trained a dozen times more than the worst JIT head in a VA hospital?
Did you hear something? Like what, Tommy? You know, like a distant thump. They stopped and looked back. Winnie made an indignant noise. This was like the old days, when Tommy was always working to increase the suspense of their illicit expeditions. Tommy hesitated. He was leading from behind so that the fine fiber he was paying out wouldn't get trampled by the others. He listened for a moment more, and then turned to catch up. Maybe it was nothing, but the fiber went dead for a moment, too. He glanced down at his laptop. It looks okay now. He waved them up the tunnel, into the dark beyond their little pool of light. Keep going. The first part of the tunnel had been very familiar, an eerie walk down memory lane. There was a time, now more than fifty years past, when all of them but Carlos had explored the tunnels. Tommy Parker had been a smart-ass freshman showing off to a couple of grad students who often wondered how they had been inveigled into such harebrained expeditions. As they walked farther on, things became less familiar. Glassy tubes ran along the walls. Robert saw signs printed on the walls, cryptic physical backup for nodes that wouldn't respond to his computer box. Funk. Something white and the size of a volleyball whizzed by in one tube. Thunk, thunk. Similar traffic in the opposite direction. Pneumatic tubes had once been a sign of the brave new world. When Robert was a child, he'd seen such things in dying department stores. Why the pneumo tubes, Tommy? Well, this is where theory meets reality. Proteomics, genomics, regulomics, you name the omic and it's here. These labs are huge. The local data traffic is a million times what you have on a public trunk, with the latencies of a home network. But they still need to look at real biologicals. Sometimes they gotta move samples, transport trays for short moves, pneumos for longer ones. Gen, Gen even has its own UP Express launcher, for shipping parcels to other labs around the world. Now Robert heard sounds from the darkness ahead of them, voices that never quite made recognizable words, clicking that might have been old-time typewriters. This is science? Carlos said, When I try to probe the local net, all I see are the bare walls. I told you, talking to the lab net would make this scam way too complicated. The tunnel must know we're here. They walked in a small pool of light, Behind and ahead of them, the tunnel was dark. Yep, it knows we're here. But you might say that's only at a subconscious level. Robert was in the lead. He pointed at the wall just at the front edge of the light. What about these signs? The letters were physically painted on the wall. 5 PBPS colon PROT less than symbol hyphen greater than symbol GENO period 10 PBPS, colon, multi. That brought Tommy forward. Maybe it's the general genomics crossbar. He held his prayer wheel high, waving the fiber out and away from the others. The stranger was visible beside Tommy, but down here the monster couldn't quite locate itself. Its feet floated above the floor, and its gaze was wrong by 90 degrees. Tommy pointed his laptop so its camera could see the lettering. I have to admit, this fiber link is handy. I can send video out to my consultancy. Invisible to Tommy, the mysterious stranger jerked a thumb at itself and grinned. Tommy studied his laptop's display for a moment. Yes, we have reached the Gen Gen optical crossbar. He pointed down the side tunnel. This is where things get tricky. Within fifty feet, the side tunnel had opened into something wider, something cavernous. In the shadows, something slanted into the heights. See that tower? said Tommy. That's Gen Gen's private launcher. These guys don't bother with the launchers in East County. The clickety sound was all around them now. It came from the tops of equipment cabinets. It had a pattern, like poetry scanned purely for stress. At the end of a stanza, things actually moved. Light glittered from deep within matted crystals. Some of the cabinets had a physical label. M.U.S. M. Cog. The stranger danced among them, a fantasy from Tommy's laptop and the fiber behind them, but the fantasy was watching through the laptop's camera and talking, at least to Robert. The stranger pointed in the general direction of the crystals. The wonders of nanofluidics, a decade of old-time bioscience done in every shifting of the lights. 
How do you represent a trillion samples and a billion trillion analyses? How can art deal with that? It hesitated as if truly anxious for an answer, and then it was gone again. But it left behind its own labels and explanations. Robert looked at the ranks of machines, the tower almost lost in the distant dark. The place was a machine cathedral. But how to represent it when it would take him years to have even shallow understanding? The massed crystal was not spectacularly colored. Most of the fluid paths were microscopic and hidden within appliances that might have been oversized refrigerators. The stranger's labels floated randomly about, ghostly subtitles to some transcendent process. And yet it almost made him remember what he had lost. Words burbled up within his imagination, words striving to capture the awe he felt. They walked down the narrow aisles, turning only when Tommy told them to turn. Every minute or so, he would stop their progress and grab a few more gadgets from the backpacks. We gotta install these just right, guys. Staying invisible here is a lot harder than in the tunnel. Tommy wanted the gadgets set near comm nodes, which turned out to be way back within the fluidics crystals. Robert did most of the installing. Carlos would boost him up over the top of the cabinet. Robert would wiggle back, so near the glassworks that he could hear tiny, tiny clicks and the fluid hissing so faintly it might have been seepage. In their millions, those sounds added up to the larger atmosphere of the room. In one case, Robert lingered and noticed that the gadget itself took care of final installation, sliding away from him, deeper into the glassworks, as if its underside were a miniature transport tray. What are you laughing at, Goo? Blount's voice came from below. Nothing. Robert crawled off the cabinet and dropped to the floor. I just figured out a little mystery. They continued on. Most of the cabinets were labeled DROS MCOG now. They were making faster progress, mainly because Carlos and Robert had figured out the gymnastics of the operation. That's the last of them, guys. Tommy's gaze shifted from his laptop to the fluidics crystals. You know, it's really weird that all the node locations were so deep in the lab equipment, he said. The mysterious stranger slipped in front of Tommy and waggled greenish fingers at Robert and Carlos and Winnie Blount. That's not a mystery to follow up on. Why doesn't someone suggest that we get on with Tommy's great plan, eh? No one said anything for a moment, but Robert guessed two things about what they had just done. It was what they had really come here for. It was how the stranger might make good on his promises. Maybe Carlos and Winnie realized something similar, because suddenly all of them were talking. Blount waved the others silent and turned to Parker. Who knows, Tommy? You said this was subtle. It might take weeks to figure out just how everything fits together. Yep, yep, Tommy nodded, oblivious of the stranger's satisfied look. Time for analysis later. He glanced down at his laptop. In any case, this was the hard part. Now we have a clear run to where Huerta stores the Shredda. They didn't set down any more gadgets. Tommy's laptop advised speed, and therefore so did Tommy. Whatever the mysterious stranger planned for Gen Gen no longer needed them. Robert glanced back. Winnie was out of breath, almost trotting. The stranger must have given him some special encouragement. And behind Carlos, Tommy spun his prayer wheel, drifting the spider thread out behind them. Suddenly, the concrete floor gave way to something that bounced back against their feet, and the sound of their steps was like tapping on a vast and tightly fitted drum. When does a tunnel fly? said Tommy. When it's really a tunnel in the sky. And suddenly, Robert realized where they were. This was one of the enclosed walkways that came off the side of Rose Canyon, just north of campus. Right now, they were standing in a tube 70 feet above the brush and manzanita-covered hillside. Then they were back on concrete. Ahead was another cavern, and this one was almost empty. Huerta's country. Miri ran, but a spotlight followed. No, that was just normal tunnel lighting. She slowed, stopped, slid up against the wall, and looked back. No human followed. The entrance hole was the only other light, and now it was some distance behind her. Juan. She watched it and listened. If no one was coming after her, that might mean that UCSD security was still working down here. She tried to probe the walls. She called 911. Again. Nothing. 
Maybe the bad guy had permanently zapped her epiphany. She shrugged up some test routines. No, it wasn't dead. She could see her files, but every local node was ignoring her. Then she noticed the pink flicker at the edge of the diagnostic, a wireless response that her epiphany would normally have discarded as too distant, too erratic. A second passed. Heaven knew how many retries. And she got an ID. It was Juan, his wearable. Miri, Arrow, Juan, open SM. Please answer. Close SM. No reply came back, and she couldn't check his medicals without more access rights. Abruptly, Juan's light flared, died. Miri sucked in a breath. Mr. Janitor Professor was still up there. He had whacked poor Juan again. No, be precise. He had whacked Juan's gear again, maybe just to prevent Miri from forwarding out through it. For a moment, Miri drew in on herself. It was not a good thing that all her planning and leadership could come to this. Alice never seemed to have these problems. She always knew what to do next. Bob. Sometimes Bob made mistakes. He was the one who always seemed uneasy about certainty. I wonder what Bob would think of all this. I wonder what Juan would do. Miri looked down the tunnel, away from the entrance. It was dark, but it wasn't perfectly quiet. There might be voices, chatting conversationally, never quite making words. Robert and his library friends were down here, surely being run as cat's paws by Mr. Janitor Professor. How can I wreck his plan? Miri got to her feet and ran quietly up the tunnel, still trapped in her own private pool of light. No sign of Robert, and none of the mumbled voices sounded quite right. She passed occasional cross tunnels. Small things whizzed down transparent tubes. Some minutes later, and still no sign of Robert. Miri read as she ran along. She had cashed plenty about UCSD and the biotechs. There was proprietary and security stuff she couldn't know, but... The cross tunnels led off to particular labs, 300 acres in 17 separate chambers. Miri's run slowed to a walk, then came to a miserable stop. Robert could be anywhere. How much control did the bad guys have down here? Maybe I should just start shouting. Faintly, behind her, there came a new kind of sound, soft hammers pounding on a metal drum, but the cadence was like footsteps and suddenly she had a very good idea of where the others were. Now if only she could match that to where she was. Miri turned and headed back. 24. The Library Chooses Sheila Hansen's night crew came out of the forest on the path of the Great Snake of Knowledge, just east of the library. The Hotsek spiders were already there, and they had the high ground, Tim Wynn rolled and walked his bodish army right to the edge of the enemy force. Wynn, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. Jeez, they're all real! Close SM. The spiders, that is. Most of the humans were real, too. Hatsekian knights and librarians were thick behind their robots. Round the north side of the library came more scoochy reinforcements, supporters from the Oceanography Library at Scripps Institute. But the Hatsekians had their own reinforcements. From cameras flying above the library, Wynne could see those latest arrivals chasing the Scripps people. So far there had been little property damage. The mechs looked sinister enough, and the humans were mostly milling and shouting. Sheila was still doing pretty well with her We Want Our Real Books chant. Something big and virtual came rushing out of the Hatsekian side and onto the bodish no-man's land. It was twelve feet tall, the best dangerous knowledge that Timothy Wynne had ever seen. Half librarian, half night guardian, the creature was Hotsek's central paradox. Now it capered almost to the edge of the scoochy lines and made a grotesque face, tongue long and pointy like a Maori demon. And when it shouted, every scoochy heard, but the message was customized to the listener. Oi, Timothy Wynn, you think you's a lesser scoochamoot? Lesser indeed. All you scoochy moppets be trashy children's things, shallow and unworthy before our depth. Dangerous knowledge waved at the hot sec critters around and behind it. That was the usual slur against the Scoochamoot mythos, and it always made the Scoochies mad, since naive outsiders might be deceived by the claim. There were counterchants from the Scoochie ranks. Hot sec is just counterfeit Pratchett! And that set the hot sec people into a rage, 
since of course it was only the simple truth. Wynne pushed past Sheila and Smale and the rest of the night crew till he stood at the forward edge of his army. Up close, this dangerous knowledge was even more spectacularly detailed. Its taloned boots were artfully sunk in the muck beside the serpent's path. Spider-bots hummed and hopped around their patron. The spider-bots were real. Where had the Hatsekians gotten such clever things, and on such short notice? He pinged them. Not surprisingly, nothing came back. There was an almost living suppleness about the way they scrambled over one another, surging and retreating. The gadgets looked like custom melds of the latest Intel and Legend models. Gen Gen Regulomics was upgrading to something like this. He pinged them again, this time with his Gen Gen Technician's authority. Holy shit! Hey! Wynne shouted. The Hotsec bombs have stolen Gen Gen equipment! And now that he looked closely at the other side, he recognized fellow employees. There was Katie Rosenbaum. She waved her battle axe and leered at him. Rosenbaum, Arrow, Wynne, Open SM. We just borrowed them, dearie. Close SM. He'd had lunch with Katie and her friends only yesterday. He knew there were Hotsec sympathizers and Regulomics, so of course his crew had kept their plans under wraps. And all the while the treacherous Hotsecians had been doing the same. Dangerous knowledge continued its merry dance through the spider troops, mocking the Scoochies' surprise. It shouted, Indignant be you now, we Winling. Could it be you just cheated with too little imagination? What you brought is old and slow, well matched to the petty concept of your imagery. The art behind dangerous knowledge was astoundingly good, without precursors. But whoever was pulling the strings was even more impressive, certainly a world-class professional actor. For a moment, the Scoochie ranks wavered and their mob of virtual supporters began to melt away. In the view from above, Wynne saw still more Hatsekians piling up around the other sides of the library. If the balance shifted too far, the Scoochies would end in humiliation and defeat. Then Sheila Hansen's voice came loud on the public venue, audible across the entire participating world. Look! The greater Scoochamoot! Behind Wynne, one of the forklift mechs stirred to life. Ah, that was just the thing Wynne should have thought to do. Thank goodness Sheila was on the ball. The forklift stepped forward as delicately as could be imagined for a machine that was twelve feet tall, with a center of gravity that now was over six feet up. It certainly wasn't running autonomously, but he hadn't thought Sheila could drive it this well. Its foot platters descended slowly, giving humans and chirps and salsiqueds plenty of time to clear out of the way. It was impressive, but it was just a forklift. Then Wynne realized he was still watching it with his driver's view. Meshing with the belief circle view, it was... Sheila had morphed the blue ionoped into something even more spectacular than dangerous knowledge. Now it was the greater Scoochamoot, the most popular of the Scoochie critters. In its short career, the greater Scooch had been the subject of refurbishments, spin-offs, spin-ups, mergers, and attempted government takeovers. It was the maximum hero to millions of schoolchildren across the poorest lands of Africa and South America, the champion of little people improving their place in the world. And this vision of it, tonight, topped everything in sight. What's more, this vision, tonight, had four tons of haptic truth clunking along inside. The greater Scoochamoot reached the edge of the Scoochie lines and advanced into Spiderbot territory. Now it moved fast, as fast as its stabilizers and motors would carry it. Whoa, who is driving that thing? It danced through the Hotsec robots and bellowed insults at dangerous knowledge. Knights and librarians, Pofulongs and Dwelbs and Baba Yagas, everybody on both sides went wild. Special effects blossomed in the air above them, and then the shouting got even louder. The robots surged into combat. Wynne looked at the melee of robotic special effects. Mega Munches and Zoro shows were coming out from the bushes. Sheila was throwing their reserves into the maw of battle. This mech battle was real. When the greater Scoochamoot tap danced on the backs of spider bots, fragments of carapace and leg flew into the air. In his technician's view, he could see damage reports. Twenty Regulomic spiders were listed as non responsive on the lab's real time roster. Dozens of his tweezer bots were destroyed. Three of the sample carriers had lost mobility. Win. Arrow, Hansen, OpenSM. Borrowing robots is one thing, Sheila, but lots of these are going back as junk. Close SM. 
Sheila was at the other end of the front. It looked like she was trying to get the robots to advance into the knights and librarians. On Tim's end, the greater Scoochamoot had already accomplished some of that by dancing toward the edge of the real human players. Hansen, Arrow, Wynn, Open SM. Not to worry. Management is happy. Take a look at the publicity, Tim. Close SM. His co-workers and the virtual thousands pushed forward. In the network view, geez, Gen Gen was getting coverage like you couldn't pay for. Better than in the 20th century when millions were forced to watch just what the few had decided was important. There were backbone routers in the UCSD area that had run out of capacity. That wouldn't last long, since there were endless ad hoc routers and dark fiber everywhere. But the whole world was here tonight. Step by step, the Scoochies advanced. We want our floor space. We want our library. And most of all, we want our real books. The leaf circles normally competed from within, based on their own popularity. Here, tonight, was a grand exception, the leaf circles fighting each other directly for attention and respect. In minutes, they might burn up months of creativity, but reach an audience beyond all their earlier dreams. And whoever was driving the Greater Scoochamoot chatted with Wynn directly. Greater Scoochamoot, Arrow, Lesser Scoochamoot, Open SM. Your mechs are the thing, my man. Bring them on. Close SM. Okay. Wynn fired up the other forklift. He often dreamed of kicking ass with one of these monsters. He walked carefully through friendly lines, drawing the smaller robots along behind him. From somewhere across the world, Scoochie artists draped the forklift every bit as brilliantly as the greater Scoochamoot. But this vision was mercurial as smoke. Wynn's forklift was tricked out as mind some, the ambiguous spirit that sometimes helped Scoochamoot when enemies were at their wiliest. Its vapors both lagged and led the real device. Dozens of helpers and helper programs made sure that the effect was always in place. The forklift's hull was dark composite plastic. Unless you looked carefully in the real view, you couldn't be sure just where the robot might really be. Tim Wynn took advantage of all this, stomping like a steel mist across the bodish battle zone, high-fiving the greater Scoochamoot, and treading with ambiguous location toward the knights and librarians. The Scoochie chant boomed from the forklift's speakers. We want our floor space. We want our library. And most of all, we want our real books. The advance was a combination of beauty, surprise, and physical intimidation. The Hotsec forces fell back, and winds, chirps, and salsipeds hustled forward to claim new ground. But Katie Rosenbaum's critters still outnumbered them and were far more agile. The Spiderbots raced backwards, keeping a battle zone between the contending human forces. Smail, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. Keep after them! Close SM. As Wynn walked forward behind his forklift mind sum, he was also looking down from above and tracking the reviews. There were more than a hundred million people watching what the two belief circles had created. Not quite a game, not quite a work of art. This was a contest where you won with imagination and calculation and impudence. So far, the world thought that the two sides were matched as to imagination, but the Scoochies were way ahead on calculation and impudence. They had created real physical destruction, all around and among real humans. Yard by yard, the battle moved round the library. The Scoochies now occupied parts of the South Esplanade, the principal axis of the campus. On the roads around campus, cars were bringing people from all over town, the physical counterpart of the far more numerous virtuals. Forty percent of the backbone routers were saturated. The audience had surged past two hundred million. Hundreds of thousands were players, tricked out with new imagery from the depths of hot second scoochy design. The participants, real and virtual, spread out around the central hub that was the university library. Seen from journalist viewpoints a thousand feet up, the conflict looked like a strange spiral galaxy its arms glowing the brightest where the battle was the fiercest. There were others present, invisible but for the reporting of the entertainment trade journalists, the movie and game people, maybe a hundred thousand professionals. Some watched the watchers, sampling and polling. Others were down in the bodish battles, collecting designs. He could see the spore of Spielberg rolling, game happenings, Rio magic, and the big Bollywood studios. Tim Wynn could see more. After all, he was running Gen Gen equipment. He could see nets that merged with the background, collecting and collecting, then subtly affecting. 
Those must belong to the Fantasists Guild, the richest artists' cooperative in the world. Their motto, We don't need no stinking middlemen. And, of course, the police were here, a half-dozen jurisdictions from campus cops up to the FBI. Greater Scutamood, Arrow, Lesser Scutamood, Open SM. Hey, my man, we have ten minutes to win belief and decision. Then they're going to start shutting us down. Close SM. Alfred watched it all from under Pilchner Hall. Rabbit's riot had emptied the bio labs. The Indo-European inspection equipment was in place, and already sending back results. Faked results, but that was Alfred's doing. The Stooges who had installed that equipment were now well away from the Gen Gen area, off where their eventual arrest would provoke diversionary suspicions. But... We need at least fifteen minutes more, said Alfred. The faked data stream from the investigation would complete sooner than that, but cleaning up and getting out would take additional time. Rabbit shrugged. Don't worry, old fellow. I told Wynn ten minutes just to keep him on his toes. Even after the campus police crack down, you'll have another half hour before the Gen Gen crew begins to trickle back underground. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. I think Rabbit is right about the timing. His library operation is a masterpiece. We couldn't have organized a distraction like this without pressing every red button in the American security apparatus. Close SM. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz. Open SM. The riot has grown too large. Close SM. The traffic still blocked their mobiles. Without sufficient mechs on site, they hadn't been able to fully control Pilchner Hall, and two unwelcome children had created the first real problem of the evening. Now one of those children lay unconscious by the caisson, right where Alfred had brought him down. Boz glanced at where Rabbit sat on the edge of the pit, its furry feet dangling into the dark. What about the girl, Rabbit? Right now she is running around in the tunnels, out of control. Rabbit smiled broadly. So call me the Lord God of Unintended Consequences. When things get complicated, there are side effects, and Mary Goo is just one of them. You're the local honcho. Why don't you go after her? Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. No, that would put you well outside of our contingency plans. Close SM. In fact, Alfred was tempted. Instead, he had sent down just one mobile to track the girl. It might be enough to distract her. And if she caught up with the Stooges, why then they had another option available, something that should surprise Rabbit. Out loud, Vaz said, I don't think so. Do you have any other suggestions? The obvious old fellow. Be flexible, like me. Who knows what opportunities may develop? You can't locate Miri Goo, but big deal. That must mean she's nowhere that interests you and your friends, right? He waggled his ears inquisitively. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. I want Mr. Rabbit out of there. He is trying to co-opt us, and all the time distracting us with his impudence. Close SM. And that could be very distracting. Rabbit had started on another carrot. The creature grinned around large incisors as it chomped away, as if to say, Don't mind me, sming all you please. From far beyond the walls, Alfred could hear the sounds of Rabbit's diversionary riot. Counterforce analysts reported that Homeland Security was watching UCSD with intense interest, but was otherwise calm. Gunberg and Keiko took that as good news. But does that mean Alice Gong is still functioning? For Alfred, that was the question of the moment, far more important than his run-in with the two children. In any case, it was time to get the inquisitive rabbit out of here. It had to be done without making Gunberg and Keiko suspicious. Fortunately, Gunberg was already pushing in the right direction. Brown floated a needs and goals matrix into view. The colors were shaded to reflect probability, but it was strikingly pure. For the library riot, Rabbit critical items glowed bright red, a hundred tasks that only he could do if the diversion were to proceed. For the underground labs, there were a dozen rabbit critical items, mainly involving getting the stooges underground, guiding them around, and getting them out of the operational area. And every one of those was some shade of green. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Mitsuri, Open SM. Good point, Gunberg. Close SM. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz. Open SM. Okay. Cut Rabbit loose, but gently. I suggest you blame this move on your obnoxious remote colleagues. Grin. Close SM. 
Alfred gave Rabbit a smile. You are right, Mr. Rabbit. Some of us are sadly inflexible. Hey, no problem. Rabbit waved magnanimously. In fact, you have made things so safe for us down here. My bosses want you to concentrate on topside operations. What are you doing? Hey! Vaz reached down and unclipped the fiber optic line from its scamful bridge. For a moment, the image of the rabbit was frozen, like some dumb graphic that had lost its remote source. Of course, Rabbit still had its internet link to here. This pause was a moment of simple astonishment. When it passed, the creature hopped to its feet. Why did you do that? Its voice and facial expression were almost without affect. Apparently, Rabbit had never conceived the possibility of having to confront real surprise and embarrassment. The fiber optic plug dangled loose in Alfred's hand. It took an effort of will not to flash a gloating smile at the creature. He slipped the line into a transceiver on his belt. What went in and out the fiber would now go through his private mill net. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. Bravo, Alfred. Close SM. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. Be nice. We still need him for the riot. Close SM. Rabbit paced along the edge of the hole, its paws waving in a blur that might have been fists. You are breaking our agreement. The voice was still flat. Alfred put on his kindliest expression and spoke without a hint of triumph. Please, Mr. Rabbit, look at our agreement. We both need the other to profit, and we are each best in our own domain. The equipment is now inserted in the labs. If you will maintain the riot environment for a few more minutes, you will have everything we promised you. The Rabbit stared expressionlessly. You need me down in the labs. Surely, he isn't all-knowing. Conceivably. I'll keep you apprised of our situation. What do you say? There was a sudden cascade of expression across Rabbit's face, anger, then a knowing smile quickly covered up as though the operator had not wanted it seen, then an elaborate, overly patient sigh. Yes, the long-suffering Rabbit. Ah, paranoia triumphant. Very well, I will bow to your wishes which it did elaborately, dancing on the edge of the pit, and retreat to keeping you safe from surface threats. A flash of unherbivorous teeth. But I do expect all the agreed payoffs. You know my capabilities. I do. And I realize there may still be complications, and attempts by you to create complications. One of our people will run liaison with you and your surface ops. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Mitsuri, Open SM. Keiko, close SM. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, open SM. I'm on it. Close SM. Rabbit gave a last flippant wave, and suddenly the little room with the plastic walls and the concrete floor was free of all taint of Rabbit. Alfred shut down the remaining internet links. Now there was just the pile of old clothes, the handcart, the hole in the middle of the floor, and their one human casualty. The comforting sounds of mayhem continued to waft down the hill from the library. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Open SM. How does the lab data look? Close SM. The inspection equipment had been transmitting for some minutes now. Were the lies being believed? Could Gunberg give up his precious theories? Brown, Arrow, Vaz, Open SM. They are seventy percent complete. We have a lot of post-analysis to do, but at first glance these labs look innocent. Close SM. Yes. Greater Scoochamoot. Arrow. Lesser Scoochamoot. Open SM. Forward now, my man. The Hotsec bastards are giving way. Close SM. And Hotsecians were falling back, at least in the area ahead of Timothy Wynn. He walked his forklift into the gap, crushing what spider bots got in the way. The arc of contention had shifted round till he was almost due south of the library's main entrance. Here the enemy was in retreat. The Scoochies had more real people on the ground, and that meant more backup for the visual effects. But the Hatsekians had perhaps 200,000 folk from afar compared with half that many virtual Scoochies. On the far side of the library, on the hill by the loading dock, there was no room for a real human mob. Over there, Hatsek, the worldwide belief, was in ascendance. Dangerous knowledge hung out there, more spectacular than ever, 
orchestrating a sky show that boomed over the north side valley. His reinforcements swarmed downward on lances of light. Tim did his best to follow the big picture, though just now he was very busy stomping on every spider bot that he could lay a foot platter on. He had seen marvels on both sides tonight, things that their belief circles could feast on for at least the next year. And yet, there was still room for a clear win. Tonight, Scootamoot could transcend what had been a fringe market and reach the same worldwide big time as the Hotsec and the Pratchett and the Bollywood empires. They needed something awesome, something that would put clear sky between them and the Hotsekians. He marched his mind some, his being of mist and steel, back and forth across the front, crushing all that remained of the spider bots. He could think of nothing more spectacular to do. Damn. But there was a world of scoochies out there, and cleverness to match. Greater Scoochamoot, Arrow, Lesser Scoochamoot, Open SM. Release the overrides on my forklift. Close SM. Wynn did so. The figure of the Greater Scoochamoot was motionless for a moment, but in his technician's view, Wynn could see its power cells charging capacitors well into the burnout range. And then the Greater Scoochamoot sprinted forward like a human athlete and, by God, broad jumped thirty feet to the lawn by the snake path. It looked over the north side valley and shouted down at dangerous knowledge in a voice that was both virtual and real. And the real was noise unto pain. Hey there, little bitty knowledge. We're equally matched, don't you think? From the valley by the loading dock, dangerous knowledge shook his fist at the teetering forklift. Two equally matched. But one of us should clearly win, don't you think? Of course. And that would be meself, as all the world knows. Dangerous knowledge waved at its virtual millions. But a big part of that count was faked images, Tim could tell. Maybe. The greater Scoochamoot jumped again, this time to the edge of the drop-off over the loading dock. There was something awesome in the maneuver, knowing the tons of real machine behind it. But what is this whole conflict about? It waved its arms, a cheerleader god, and Scoochies screamed with all the amplification they could muster, We want our floor space. We want our library. And most of all, we want our real books. Yes, said the Scoochamoot. It's the library we're all fighting about. It's the library that should decide. And with that, all the Scoochie sound effects chopped to nothing. An uncertain silence spread across the Scoochies. Sometimes the belief thing got caught in its own metaphors and wound up spouting nonsense. Wynne looked back and forth, gauging the reaction the greater Scooch had provoked. It sounded good to enlist the library itself, but what did that mean? Down in the north side valley, there was a flare of laughter. The enemy had come to the same conclusion. We are screwed, thought Wynne. But then he noticed that dangerous knowledge was not laughing. The creature came partway up the hill, confronted the greater Scoochamoot eye to eye, and now there was eerie silence on all sides. Somehow, dangerous knowledge knew what the Scoochamoot was talking about. So, the Hotsek godling said at last, and its voice had a silken tone even though it echoed off the library and settled deep in the mind of everyone in the world who was watching. You want the library itself to decide who should care for it and who should have its space. And how real the books should really be, the greater Scoochamoot said, with a smile that seemed almost friendly. I propose that we put the question to the library, and whichever of us it chooses will be deemed the blessed. Ah! Now dangerous knowledge was smiling too, but it was a fierce stretching of the face. The creature backed down the hillside, but grew with each step so that its eyes stayed on a level with the greater Scoochamoot. Ordinarily, such a cheap visual wouldn't have earned any respect, but the move seemed to fit the moment. Besides, whoever was behind the creature's design had saved some marvelous fractal armor for just this extension of height. Dangerous knowledge turned to face the virtual millions behind him. The challenge is just. I say to all followers of knowledge, join me in a final torque upon the enemy. Show the library that we are its future and its greatest supporters and let the library show its choice to the world. The silence was ended as the millions discovered new amplifiers on campus, or somehow usurped and reused the ones that the Scoochamoot had appropriated. The galaxy of players, mechs and humans, real and virtual, 
all came alive in renewed conflict. Knights and librarians dumped fire on the Scoochie side. Wind's mind sum was once again stomping and kicking. The ensemble resumed its vasty turn about the university library, and the spiral arms of the battlefront flared even brighter than before. But now the battle cries were appeals to the library itself, and the library glowed in a light that seemed to come from infinitely high above. That light was purely virtual, but it was seen in every view. As Wynne tromped along with the screaming multitudes, he was almost totally taken by the moment. Almost. This had gone farther and higher than he had ever imagined. Part of the success was simply the audience, a significant part of the waking world. Part of it was the unexpected acquiescence of Gen Gen and the UCSD administration, and the awesome possibility of future revenue that might come streaming in from the various entertainment producers that now lurked all around. And none of that would have happened if not for the content that had suddenly appeared when they went to battle. Content from both sides. Content that was as artistic as new designs, and as physical as what they had done with their bodish legions. But now everyone's hopes, Hatsek and Scucci, were hostage to the impossible. If the library did not reply, or if the reply was simply more imagery, then in about another thirty seconds the momentum would begin to dissipate, and a very large number of people, among them Timothy Wynne, would begin to feel a little foolish. It was the fate of many flash crowds, especially those that at first seemed the most successful. Big promises earned big rewards, up to the point that the promises had to come true. What could the greater Scoochamoot have in mind? Wynne used his technician's view and his artist's. He looked out from Scoochie cams, from the aerobots above, even Gen Gen utilities. The best he could imagine was some pallid surprise, something to distract everyone from the promise that could not be kept. As the battlefronts tightened around the library, point and counterpoint came from the opposing armies and together made a concerted rhythm. Music seeped into the shouting. After a few moments, every local voice was synced to the sound and everyone was swaying to the beat. It came louder and louder, and Wynne noticed that the amplifiers included police and fire department equipment. Someone had committed real vandalism to make this even more spectacular. It would be for nothing without some definite result. In fact, the singing held together just a few more seconds. Then it faltered as nothing more happened, and no one could imagine anything more happening. But there was another sound, a trembling vibration that crept up from the ground. Ten years ago, Timothy Wynne had felt something similar. The Rose Canyon earthquake. Wynne freaked, dropping all the fantasy overlays. He stared out in panic with his own naked eyes. Real lights flashed back and forth, flickering across the faces of the thousands of real rioters, picking out the angular bodies of the larger mechs. Now there was no pillar of light from heaven. The library was occasionally lit, but more often a silhouette against the lights on the other side. The trembling in the earth grew stronger. The walls and overhanging floors of the library seemed to shiver. The magnificent double pyramid that had survived the decades, that had survived the Rose Canyon quake, it was shaking, all the thousands of tons of real concrete, in time to the rising music. There were screams. Lots of people remembered Rose Canyon, but lots of others were taken by the spectacle, and their singing resumed and was picked up by the vision of the night and blasted out across the world. The library swayed. Parts dipped, parts rose. It was not shaking as much as it was dancing. Not a bouncy river dance. The building was dancing like a man with feet planted firmly in the ground. And Wynne realized there was no earthquake. Somebody had hijacked the building's stabilization system. He had once read that a well-powered building could survive almost any quake short of a great crack opening up beneath it. But here that power was being turned upon itself. The rhythmic swaying became more pronounced, twelve feet left and right, up and down, with parts of the building shifting away and together. The shrugging, swaying dance of the overhanging floors shifted to the outlying pillars. There was a sound that might have been real and might have been ingenious invention. It might have been both. It was the sound of mountains being torn from their roots. The pillars shifted, and the library walked. It was not as spectacular as fake imagery could be but Wynne was seeing it with his naked eyes. In halting cadence, first one fifty-foot pillar, and then another rose visibly from the ground, moved several yards in the direction of the greater Scoochamoot, and descended with the sound of rock penetrating rock. 
The rest of the building shifted with them, twisting on the utility core that was the library's central axis. The greater Scoochamoot stepped forward and embraced a corner of the nearest pillar. The music became triumphal. Cheering blasted across the world, wondering and still a bit frightened. Hansen, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. Hey, is this an event or is this an event? Close SM. The library had chosen. 25. You can't ask Alice anymore. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. By damn! Homeland Security will respond to this. Has Mr. Rabbit gone mad? Close SM. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. He claims his library dance will only trigger FBI intervention and altogether give us more time. Close SM. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. Okay, I have the complete dump from our inspection equipment. God willing, that's everything we need to prove what's been going on in these labs. Close SM. Alfred was already working through the exit checklist. He had fooled his friends, but what of his attack on Alice Gong? If she was still functioning, it might not matter what he did. FBI requests clearance to take charge of the riot area. On what grounds? Bob Goose spoke without looking away from the library. Even the unfudged video was remarkable. This was a 1900s concrete behemoth, originally as dumb as snot, yet it had moved without collapsing. The grounds are the frank evidence of violation of federal law, namely, a stream of legal references spewed across Bob's vision. FBI argues that this is effectively an attack on a federal building. Bob hesitated. There were criminal violations here, though UCSD had made no formal complaint. At this point, there was no watch-related service FBI could render. They would simply be law enforcement. The watch priority, his priority, was to snoop and swoop. Snoop, then swoop. What might this disorder be a cover for? He glanced at the biolab status, still all green. Finally, he replied, Request denied. There is an ongoing Homeland Security investigation here. However, give the first layer of our analysis to San Diego Police and Rescue and the UCSD Campus Police. Be prepared to support emergency networking. Layer 1 to SDPD and Campus Police. Yes, sir. Bob's eyes turned back to the library. It was still standing, but this was damn dangerous foolishness. His analyst pool certainly thought so. In the last 30 seconds, the node structure had come close to turning inside out. For the moment, Alice let the engineers dominate. The text clouds were full of gibber about how the library walk had been accomplished and the dangers there might be for the people in and around it. USMC nodes were lodged deep in the discussions, his own people thoroughly caught up in the excitement. That was not acceptable. Bob leaned forward and spoke. All squads, move to launch alert. The chances of an actual launch were still near zero, but this would get his people into their assault craft. More important, it got their attention. The USMC nodes moved away from all the speculation and into the tight coordination of Marines in a launch prep. Bob stared at the distracted analyst pool for a moment more. Alice was already drawing them away from the library. The structural engineers were no longer the center of the tangle. The library had walked. So what might that be covering? His Marine's duty was to guard against the deadliest grand surprises. For instance, were the biolabs still secure? What was going on in the rest of Conus Southwest? He turned and jogged out of his bunker, into the narrow tunnel that led to his own launcher. The analyst display followed along, hanging just to his right. Alice had grabbed another 1,500 analysts, more bioscience and drug research people. The ceiling curved low at the end of the tunnel. His assault craft was a tiny vehicle, its design a compromise between time to target and the desire to make the local combat manager invisible. From the ingress tunnel, all that was visible of it was the open hatch and a portion of the dead black fuselage. He settled into his place, but did not zip up. What is Alice doing? He watched the analyst pool grow, now larger than for most worldwide operations, but all the attention was on the bioscience labs around UCSD. True, the situation there was strange. Even though lab security was in the green, the staff was topside in the riot. That justified some attention, 
but it also made lab surveillance even easier. Damn. Now Alice was stealing analysts tasked with cargo tracking throughout all of Conus Southwest. Squelching your top analyst was a black mark on everyone, but there was no help for it. Even in combat, this sort of monomania would be bizarre. As it happened, Alice acted first. Emergency flags came up in every view. The assault craft's hatch slid shut and his acceleration pod zipped tight. Launch, launch, launch flashed in his eyes, and a launch clock appeared, counting down from 30 seconds. This was analyst preemption, the sort of drama that happens when analysts realize that their own forces are about to be nuked in their bunkers. Everything would go at once and sort itself out in mid-flight. But the analyst pool showed no such threat. The launch target was UCSD. The G-pod was inflating tight around him. The countdown clock showed 25 seconds. He brought up a view of his top analyst. Alice, advise reason for launch. Alice's eyes were wide. It's very simple. Onset was slow, but now insight has saturated. This one is undergoing threatful integration. Neuromodulator pathway GAT-77 has been subverted. Signaling cascade has too many control points for MCOG analysis, but reference, some kind of ArcSive pointer, demonstrates the progression. She frowned at him, and suddenly she was shouting, Don't you understand? This one is failing. Conformational changes are preventing adaptive response. This one... Ten seconds to launch. Alice Goo's medicals were off the chart. Eight seconds to launch. Bob overrode the launch order and relieved his top analyst. Stand down, stand down, stand down. The G-pod relaxed around him. He scarcely noticed. Alice's head was down, but she was still talking, desperate. Drool spattered her blouse. And he couldn't notice that either. He promoted her second in analysis, a CIA spook who'd been far too passive tonight. But then what could one do when a star like Alice crashed? The spook was trying her best. I'll have us up in two minutes, sir. In the meantime, Bob Goo was blinded, and the watch was just a mob of bright people watching a million data feeds. One of those feeds was medical. Alice had suffered a jit stick, the most violent and sudden of her career. Despite all her desperation to communicate, she was stuck in molecular biology. The CIA analyst was back. Sir, are you all right? I... I'm fine. Bob considered the analyst display. The spook had hung the operation off the rest of the Conus watches. There was close backup now. Big chunks of Alice's network were improperly connected, but the spook was healing it, forcing connections and possible correlations. Maybe she was still too heavy on UCSD. She seemed to think that Alice's last words pointed to enemy action there. Okay, after everything else tonight, that had to be followed up. I'm fine. Over the past 12 weeks, Rabbit had learned a lot. He had grown, you might say. Tonight, it all came together. Topside, the riot was at climax. Better than sex could ever be, Rabbit was sure. I am the reality arm of the scoochy belief circles, yeah! There were surprises, too. The affair had called into existence, or simply into his notice, a creature who might be his equal. Rabbit had played both sides through the first part of the riot, but now dangerous knowledge had been taken over by something very creative, something who was having as much fun tonight as Rabbit himself. So he had millions of new affiliates, some of them as capable as a human could ever be. And he'd found a special new friend to boot. His riot fully outclassed the espionage hugger-mugger it was designed to protect. It was amusing that despite the carrot greens and all the other generous clues Rabbit had provided, Alfred and company had not realized whence his powers came or how great they were. But something told Rabbit that in the long run, what was happening underground was important too. Alfred was playing out his mysterious game down there. Now was the time Rabbit had planned to find out just what Alfred was looking for. Hey, and maybe get a piece of it. Now was the time, but Rabbit was locked out. Damn Alfred. The fiber link was behind Alfred's mill net. Short of tipping off DHS, and destroying the wonderful jape Rabbit had so carefully planned, Rabbit was balked. Heh. <laughs> but what did Alfred's Milnet talk to? Why, just a few thousand very clever Indo-European analysts? And they didn't get to be so clever by hiding in government holes. They each had their own creative lives. Rabbit hopped from Brussels to Nice, to Mumbai and Tokyo, and, Natch, listened to his own inner self. Now that he needed to think about it, 
He saw how the tricks he had used with American security might be applied. Rabbit tweaked a thousand affiliances, and he listened to a million conversations that he really had no intention of consciously reviewing. One last piece of she magic, and Viola. Rabbit was into the millnet. He zipped down through Alfred's stealth aerobot, and, once again, he was in Vaz's glorious command center in Pilchner Hall. Rabbit took a look at the medicals on the Orozco kid. Still alive. Old Alfred wasn't a monster, except when Principal demanded it. What was he after? And can I get some? Rabbit tiptoed down Alfred's connections into the labs. No surprise, Alfred Vaz was making good use of the devices Rabbit's little friends had planted in the Gen Gen area, sending oodles of data out to his colleagues in Japan and the EU. Rabbit watched quietly. One doesn't ask pointed questions when one is trying to be invisible. He captured the raw encryption, noted what was talking to what within Alfred's Gen Gen domain. Even so, it didn't make sense. The exported data did not match what was locally observed. And then suddenly a big light bulb went off in Rabbit's mind. Alfred was not searching for anything. He was making sure his Alliance friends did not see what was already there. Alfred, you old devil, running your own program on American equipment and keeping it secret from everybody. And what could be worth such secrecy and such a wild-ass cover-up? Figuring that out was still a guessing game, but Rabbit was the grand master of guessing, better than any Indo-European analyst pool, better even than Alice Goo and all her analysts. Oops. Something told him Alice was in deep trouble. Rabbit had dutifully played messenger boy for Alfred's mysterious snooping on Alice. That must have been the setup for Alice's downfall. But how had he done it? Suddenly, the underground was more intriguing than ever. The heart of Alfred's research empire was in a corner of the molecular biology of cognition area. The data from everywhere else was truthful reporting on innocent proprietary research. Rabbit looked more carefully at the lies coming out of the MCOG area. The phrase animal model leaked from gaps in the encryption. Animal model, animal model. The term usually referred to animals possessing an analog of some human condition, usually a disease to cure. Somehow, Rabbit didn't think Alfred was trying to cure anything. And there were lots of animals in the MCOG area. Of course, most were bugs, gallons of fruit flies, and every itsy-bitsy one labeled and probed. Rabbit dipped into some of the local databases. It looked like Alfred was messing with YGBM, but the details were not easy to understand. Rabbit was not always fast. For hard problems, he was like lesser beings. He had to sleep on the question. Then, in the morning, the old intuition would deliver remarkable insights. In this case, tomorrow would be too late. Five minutes from now might be too late. Alfred's show was almost over, and with it access to the snooper nodes. Heck, the gadgets would probably fry themselves. Rabbit hesitated and listened to his inner self. He had a gut feeling about this. Modern intelligence services existed to prevent terrorism. But Alfred, with whatever he was creating here, the Dwit might proceed beyond Grand Terror into realms no man was meant to go. So maybe I should just call DHS. Even without Alice Goo, they could shut down Alfred in five minutes. Rabbit gave the possibility the serious thought it deserved, about two seconds worth. And then a big grin spread across his concept of face. Rabbit was full of ideas. And there was one that had been pounding on him since the moment he'd broken into Alfred's millnet. Besides having the greater intellect, I now have the physical advantage. Alfred was on the scene with very low latencies, very high bit rates, and more hard data. Nevertheless, he was stuck in his little room, and all but one of his mechs were topside. But the Elder Cabal was still down in the labs. True, they were not in the Gen Gen area, but they were still reachable at the end of a fiber link. And hello, what's this? The slightly overweight Chinese Ninja Princess. She was definitely not part of the original plan, but bless her, there she was. What a strange and marvelous girl. Back to business. He was already preparing contingency plans, contingency documents. And if I'm very careful, very quiet, I can sneak out along the fiber, tell Robert and Winnie and Carlos and Tommy the right stories, and then I'll have my own physical hands. What Alfred was planning might go beyond Grand Terror, 
but that same power in my hands. Well, that could be glorious fun. 26. How to Survive the Next 30 Minutes. PDF. I told you my planning would pay off, didn't I? Tommy Parker stood knee deep in the remains of the library book collection. The shredder towered behind him like dirty snow, flakes as big as your hand. They had found the librarium storage at the back of Max Huertas's cavern, just where Tommy had said. It was stored in rows of sturdy cargo containers labeled Rescued Data. The containers had been no match for Tommy's cutter. He had flooded the floor with the contents of ABX. This had been most of the fifth floor stacks. It seems so much smaller when it's in shreds, thought Robert. Tommy waved at the drifts of shredded paper. You guys ready to start with the glue? This will jam Huerta's operation up the wazoo. And where's your reporter guy? I haven't seen Sharif in a while. He went around, handing out spray cans. Finally, he seemed to notice his pal's silence. We don't really need Sharif, do we? I mean, we've got our own record. He lifted the laptop in its sling. Robert looked at Carlos and Winston. Winnie gave a little shake of his head. So none of them had heard from the mysterious stranger. Sure, Tommy, Robert said. That's... That will be fine, Professor Parker. Sharif's voice from Tommy's laptop. Perhaps you could have Professor Gu act as cameraman. They untangled the laptop from its sling, and the voice directed Robert around to the side. The voice was very picky about where it wanted the laptop pointed, across the edge of the shredder, almost in line with their path into this vacant hall. Then Robert noticed letters painting silently across his field of view. It was Sming, and the letters were green. Mysterious Stranger. Arrow. Robert. Open SM. Hey, my man. Close SM. I. Mysterious Stranger. Arrow. Robert. Open SM. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, be discreet. We don't want Alfred to know I've come back to help you. Close SM. Alfred, thought Robert, but he kept quiet. No one else seemed to notice the stranger's arrival. Tommy walked back into the drifts of paper, tossing them up in the air, squirting them with his spray can. Is the camera getting this, Robert? Robert looked down at the laptop's screen. Yes. Any other time, the effect of Tommy's aerosol glue would have been a showstopper. He threw another armful of loose shredda into the air and sprayed a mist of glue. Where mist and paper met, the page fragments were suddenly tumbling as one. The mass drifted slowly to earth. Most of the frags never actually touched the ground, but hung permanently in the air. Tommy laughed and pushed at the hazy something. The ensemble of scattered papers rocked back and forth, like bits of fruit in invisible jello. Tommy whooped. Try it yourselves. Just don't squirt each other. He threw another armful up, and another. Arches of paper and mist grew around him. Robert hung back, playing cameraman. Mysterious Stranger, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. Look where Alfred has you pointing the camera. See the light? Coming out of the dark? Close SM. There was a tiny pool of light, someone running down the steps into the Huertas cavern. It was Miri. The girl came pounding across the floor, shouting, Robert! Robert! Tommy and the others turned to watch, open-mouthed. Miri came around the edge of the shredder. She was gasping for breath. Winston looked her up and down and then looked at Robert. This is another goo, isn't it? Um, my granddaughter. I thought we agreed to keep this among ourselves. Winnie's glare was as good as any high-tech messaging. You're going to ruin this for all of us. But Tommy was more astounded than any of them. How could she get through security? The cops should be all over. No, no. Miri managed to speak between gasps for breath. Must call police. The laptop had its say, too. Pay no attention to this child. Remember why you are here. Robert shoved the laptop at Winnie and reached for Miri. How did you find us, kiddo? Her arms went around his middle. It was Juan and me, and... She hesitated, looked up at him with her eyes wide. Gone was her usual assurance. Horror looked out. Somebody's using you, Robert. I think they maybe, maybe killed Juan. Not so, said the laptop. Uh, 
the voice hesitated. Mysterious stranger, Arrow, Robert, open SM. Heh. Alfred put forget-it gas in your belt boxes, and now he's wondering why you're still standing. Close SM. Gentlemen, the voice resumed, I advise you to remember why you are really here. Tommy had come out from his fountains of paper. His spray can dangled unnoticed from his fingers. He looked at Carlos and Winston and Robert. Yes. What is it that we're supposed to remember? Why are we really here? Carlos and Winnie wouldn't look him in the eye. Carlos mumbled something in Mandarin. We did what we thought was right, Winston said. Yes, each our own vision of what was right, but... Juan murdered? He looked back at Tommy. We tricked you, Tommy. Someone else is behind this. Tommy walked back to the pile, kicked aimlessly at his masterpiece. But... I thought I had my touch back. He glanced at Miri and seemed to be putting together all the inconsistencies. His shoulders slumped. Okay. I was an old idiot. Who was boosting me along, Robert? I don't know. Mysterious stranger, Arrow, Robert, open SM. I could tell you. Maybe I will someday. Close SM. Apparently, Winnie and Carlos were not seeing the sming. Mary's chin came up. We've got to get word out. And the laptop said, It's not safe to move. Stay where you are. Mysterious stranger, Arrow, Robert, open SM. Actually, I would recommend the same. But right now I'm peeved with Alfred. Do what you please, my man. Close SM. Tommy Parker looked off into the emptiness of the Huertas Cavern. He was shaking his spray can, almost an idle gesture. The gear we planted in Gen Gen, I thought I made that. Me, the big genius. It could be anything. Bombs, poison, some kind of takeover hardware. But we're at the north edge of the complex. He waved at the wall that loomed from the dimness just beyond the shredder containers. That overlooks Sorrento Valley. There are some old entrances. We could have used them instead, except my research said the alarms would be harder to disable. But now I don't care if busting through them sets off alarms. Stay where you are, said the laptop. You are surrounded by lethal weapons. Something small and black sidled out of the darkness. I saw one of those on Gilman Drive. Miri took a step toward it. The robot turned toward her. There was a metallic click that sounded very much like a round being chambered. Miri. Robert held her arm, but Tommy was coming around from the other side and the robot turned toward him. Parker stopped about seven feet from the critter. Some of his old cockiness returned. I'll bet it's just a network superiority bot. Most of the payload is communications and counternote gear. It's not much use all by itself. There are hundreds on the floor, said the laptop. Don't force us to act. Miri slipped loose of Robert. I didn't see any others, she said, moving closer to the robot. Mysterious stranger, Arrow, Robert, open SM. There's only the one, but... Close SM. And then several things happened at once. Robert pulled Miri behind him. Tommy stepped forward in a fencer's lunge that brought his spray can within a foot of the mech. The robot flipped up like a sprung rat trap. Tommy screamed and fell forward. Robert ran toward the robot and grabbed hard air. The hardened froth was barely visible, but it held the robot beyond his reach. He spun the gel around, looking for some point closer to the enemy. There. He slammed the carapace into the concrete floor. Again. It was in pieces now, each still embedded in the mist. There was sound of tiny motors, whining to be free. Then Miri and Carlos were stomping on what remained. Sparks flew within the mist, and Robert felt a tingling that raised the hairs on his arms. And then the robot was just dead composites, the pieces hanging motionless in blocks of invisible fluff. The only sound was Tommy gasping. Winnie had rolled the little guy on his side. Tommy's face was bluish, his mouth a gaping grimace of pain. What happened, Tommy? Parker's back arched. Bastard! Fried! My pacemaker! Carlos was on his knees. He touched Tommy's shoulder. Woman chassis le nage jichiren. 
We killed the robot, Dr. Parker. Tommy grunted acknowledgement, even as he rocked back and forth on the ground. We'll get you out of here, Tommy, said Blount. He looked up at Robert. No more games. Mysterious stranger, Arrow, Robert, open SM. Oh, damn. Parker was such an interesting wannabe. Okay, I'll help you get him out. And if you help me after that, I can still make good on my part of the bargain. How's that? Close SM. Robert looked past the greenish letters and nodded to Winston Blount. No more games. Tommy still lay twisting in pain. His voice came out between spasms. Key card. In my pocket. Mysterious stranger. Arrow. Robert. Open SM. Heh. <laughs> magical me. That ancient key card will actually work. My little surprise present for Alfred. Close SM. The voice from the laptop. Alfred was silent. Carlos looked down at where the laptop sat on the concrete floor. We should break this. It's the eye of the enemy. Miri walked around the antique computer. I think if we pull the plug on that fiber, the bad guys are gone. Yup. Unplug it. Mysterious stranger, Arrow, Robert, open SM. Hey, wait. Where do you think I'm coming from? So what if Alfred can still snoop? It's me you need. If you cut me off, then well, damn, I'll have to... Close SM. Mary picked up the laptop and turned it on edge. She studied the unfamiliar physical connectors for a moment, then reached down. Mysterious stranger, arrow, Robert, open SM. I hate Mary. Close SM. And popped the optical fiber out of the laptop. For a moment, they grinned at each other like idiots. Tommy squeezed out a weak laugh. We're... Off the leash. He gasped for a few seconds. Gotta carry me, guys. Sorry. I'll show you the exit. Winnie looked down at Tommy. We'll get you out, Tommy. You'll be okay. He lifted Parker under the shoulders, then reached to support him under the knees. Parker didn't weigh that much, but Blount was staggering. Robert reached out. I can carry him, Winnie. Blount glared back, and Robert shut up. Then Winnie's hands slipped and Tommy almost crashed to the ground. I got him, I got him. Miri ran around Blount and slipped her hands under where he was holding Tommy's left arm. Winnie didn't object. Maybe it was because she didn't ask. Robert took both legs and they started off along the wall. Carlos followed, carrying the cutter and what other gear might still be of use. Nothing more followed, nothing they could see. For what it might be worth, Robert's dumb little waste box showed only utility glimmers in the empty cavern. Tommy's breathing was a raspy wheeze. Every few paces he twisted within their grasp. About a hundred yards more. He shuddered and went limp. Tommy? Winston hesitated, bringing them almost to a halt. Keep going. Keep going. And then after a moment. So our librarium protest was... Fraud from the beginning, huh? I don't know, Tommy. I knew it was silly, but it seemed worthwhile. Blount looked across at Robert. I thought it would lead to something I really want. Me too, said Carlos, his voice faint. In the end, Sharif whoever got to all of us, didn't he? All but Tommy. Miri was watching the back and forth silently, but her eyes were wide. Well, she had earned the right to listen. Robert said, So what did he promise you, Winston? Winnie's lips pulled back from his teeth. I sure as hell won't tell you. He hesitated, and the snarl became a twisted smile. But I bet I know what your deal with the devil was. When Robert didn't reply, Blount's smile broadened, and he continued, You tried to disguise it, Goo. All the times we met in the library, and never once did you pull your old tricks. At first, I just figured you were setting me up for one of your extreme traps. After I learned about Sharif, I thought maybe you were running him. Winnie laughed. But then I began to suspect the truth. You've lost your killer edge, the way you could look inside people and see what would hurt them the most, and then do it to them. You've lost that, haven't you, Robert? Robert lowered his head. Yes. The word came out softly, without anger, almost a sigh and I bet you can't write poetry anymore either. 
It's the poetry I want back, Winnie. Oh. Tommy twisted in their grasp, trying to suck in breath. Shut up. The north gate should be in... next hundred feet. They walked in silence, eyes straining for some sign on the unmarked wall. And now that Robert was looking, he saw something else. Not more green lettering, but a blinking icon that meant pending mail. One last message before Miri had cut the fiber link. Almost without thinking, he shifted his grip on Tommy's leg and tapped a go-ahead on his waist box. A PDF, by God. He hadn't seen anything like this since his teaching days. The table of contents floated in the air above him. The critic in him couldn't resist scanning down the page. The TOC was impeccably formatted, with perfect spelling, at least if you ignored context. The bullet headers were a mishmash of unparalleled constructions and grammatical infelicities. It looked as if it had been thrown together by a gang of paraliterates in a hell of a hurry. But what it said was... important. While we are out of touch, or how to survive and prosper during the next thirty minutes, by your friend the mysterious stranger. Dedication. To the idiots among you who cut the fiber link. Now Alfred can't see you, but I'm cut off too. Hence, I'm breaking my stealthy cover and shipping down this bolus of bits before Miri pops the connector. Executive Summary. None provided. Table of Contents. Introduction. Page Roman numeral 4. How to Use This Document. Chapter 1. Saving Tommy Parker. Page 1. The Huertas Back Door. The key card that should not work, but does. Chapter 2. Your Benighted Wearables. Page 3. Not really hecho en Paraguay, unfortunately for you. The knockout gas. Ah, but I already told you about that. What you can and cannot trust about these gadgets. Chapter 3. What Alfred is up to. Page 5. And why you really don't want Alfred to succeed. The animal model, or world domination out of little fruit flies, grows. Why calling 911 is not fast enough to stop him. If you don't believe me, just show this file to Miri. Chapter 4. What You Can Do to Help. Page 13. Map of Huerta's Territory. Map of Gen Gen M Cogarays. Alfred owns this territory network-wise, but I'm there too. How to get back to the M Cogarays. What you can do to defeat Alfred. Come be my hands in this glorious struggle. Chapter 5. What's in it for you? Page 21. Promises made and promises kept. With your helping hands, I can still deliver. Appendix A, page 23. Neat stuff that will impress the Department of Homeland Security and which may make life easier after your arrest. Appendix B, page 117. Why Scoochamooch should be the library's lord and mascot. Robert looked at Miri. She was concentrating on holding up Tommy's shoulder. For the moment, all her nerdly interests seemed far away. But we need the nerd as much as ever. Robert, arrow, Miri. File type equals PDF. And he pushed the stranger's file across to her. Tommy did his best to count Winnie's paces, but there were distractions. There was this rock concert playing in Tommy's chest, and every screech of the beat sent fire across his shoulders and down his arms. This wasn't a real heart attack. This was just his pacemaker fallen into wild chaos. The last few years, Tommy hadn't been too envious of other people's diddling medical miracles. So what if his vascular system was falling apart? The pacemaker would keep him going till classic science fictional immortality arrived but now all his plans for living forever were in trouble. Count the paces. Count the paces. And then there would be seconds when the pain would let up, and his heart was a butterfly flutter in his chest. For a few seconds his thoughts would clear, and then he would black out. They were carrying him still, though the ride was bumpy. Old Robert was shifting around like he had business with the box on his belt. Okay, stop, he whispered. He would have shouted, but the whisper was all he had just now. They heard him, and then he was lying on the cold, hard concrete. Winston's voice came down from high above him. So where is the door? I see. Sounds of Winston fumbling with the keycard. Something big slid aside, and there was a wall of faint light, maybe the night sky. He felt cool breeze on his face. 
The sound of the freeway was like distant surf. No alarms, said Winston. Maybe silent alarms, he managed to wheeze. This exit had been such a wild-ass escape option in his original plan. Winston was a shadow against the sky. He was tapping at his keypad. I got 911, Tommy. Now he was talking to someone Tommy could not hear, telling them about a man down with a heart attack. They're on the way, Tommy. They want your med log. The rock concert was back, whacking a new tune in his chest. Bet med log is fried. He twisted onto his elbows. There were more important things. Tell them about the labs, Wynn. I told them. I just called 911 myself. That was Robert's granddaughter. Her feet were right beside his head. Now she stepped away, became a second shadow, beside Winston. She turned this way and that, the way kids do when they're playing games with their wearables. I don't like this, she said after a moment. You heard the highway patrol, kid. Winston's voice was tight, like he was worried as hell. They're sending a car. We just have to sit tight for a few moments. Tommy's pacemaker was working upward to the next crescendo. Okay, give it a few seconds more and the pain would lessen. Or maybe this time his heart would break. The girl's words floated in and out of hearing. It's an emergency. They should airlift. And the net is screwy. I can't route to my... friends. Not even Sming. I think someone spoofed the local nodes and... Tommy rolled from side to side, pain blotting out the rest of the sentence. Someone was cradling his shoulders. Carlos? It'll be okay, Professor Parker. The voice turned away from him. I'm having some access problems, too, but the error messages make sense. I think the library riot is soaking up too much resource. The little girl's voice was scornful. So much that I can't even sming? How about laser direct to the freeway? That was Robert. The girl's shadow repeated the strange little dance. I can't quite reach it from here. She was silent for a moment. We're just playing into the bad guy's hands. Here, take a look at this PDF. Winston again. There will be a car. If one doesn't show up in five minutes, we'll... We'll carry Tommy down the hill ourselves. Tommy's heart had stopped. No, it was back in butterfly mode. He'd have a few seconds of clarity. The girl was probably right, but there was no way he was going down that hill. The others should go, see if they could get far enough to put out a real alarm. Or maybe they should go back into the labs and give the enemy a big surprise. Darkness was rising inside him. In a moment or two, this would not be his problem. And his friends were too stupid to leave him here. Maybe he could set some of them loose. Listen to me. But Tommy's words came out scarcely louder than a sigh. Guys, we gotta split up. And then the darkness had him. 27. The Revocation Attack Xu Xiang looked out from their car at the dark hillsides. I feel pretty useless, Lena. You feel useless. Lena Gu shifted irritably in her wheelchair. Their plan had been to be a mobile presence across the places where Robert was most likely to show up. Tonight they would be on the scene and no one could balk them. Instead, all the action was elsewhere. Even the transportation was uncooperative, operating under special event rules in all areas near UCSD. Their car was moving as slowly as they could make it go, but in another thirty seconds it would reach the south end of this old bit of asphalt, at which point, no matter how loudly they demanded otherwise, it would turn left at the little T-intersection, away from the hillside, and take them back to the freeway. Then, if they wished, it would drive north to the Ted Williams Expressway, turn and come down here still again. Xu stared into the dark of the hillside and saw nothing. I've practiced so much, and still I can't make my contacts work right. Lena said, Actually, there isn't a whole lot to see here. This hillside has to be the dumbest public land near campus. There was some real light. It silhouetted the hilltops and lit the low overcast. Around the library, insanity still reigned. A few minutes earlier, Lena had guided Xu through some of the views. Celebration, riot, whatever it was, the network stats were impressive. Now Xu couldn't see any of it. 
Okay, I confess defeat. She reached into the backpack on the floor by her feet. The pack contained her shop class projects. She had told herself they might come in handy tonight. How, she couldn't really imagine, but the gadgets did prove that X Shang could still create. There was something useful there, even if it wasn't one of her gadgets. She pulled out her view page, sat back, and enjoyed the clunky comfort of its old-fashioned interface. What a fall from grace this was. But just now, she was too nervous for Epiphany. Lena abruptly said, We have more audio from Juan. The boy's voice was almost a whisper. We're still in Pilchner Hall. We're waiting for Miri's grandpa to come back from the basement. Miri's voice came faintly to the microphone. They're not doing anything. Let me talk to Mary, said Lena. She listened to the two for a moment. They couldn't get any video, and Mary's epiphany had suffered a 3030 error. She had looked that up. 3030 was a catch all code for a system deadlock caused by licensing conflicts. Meantime, all they had were these very occasional, very brief voice messages through Juan. Gotta go, whispered Juan, and the session was ended. Lena was silent a moment just watching the familiar dark landscape slide by. I want to see those kids. They're needing a smart grilling. Any chance the link was faked? Juan is a careful boy. It would be almost impossible to fake his epiphany so... Lena harumphed. And as far as I can tell, that was their voices, but talking in whispers and not saying much except that everything is boringly safe. It was strange. If the children needed stealth and a low bitrate that they had not used silent messaging. Maybe someone thought they could fool a pair of old ladies. In fact, with Juan's wearable, I could fake sessions like this. She glanced at Lena. Maybe you should call in the Marines, Bob and Alice. Yes, but if it's a small emergency, they can't do anything more than you or I. And if it's a big emergency, well, they might have to do something awful. Lena hummed a few bars of something nervous. And Mary says everything is fine, just fine. Maybe we should call the police. Ha! Huh. Nowadays you don't have to call the police, they just happen to you. Lena was staring at the hillside, her fingers trembling against her lips. The last couple of months, Lena Gu had been such a reliable source of certainty. What if we both wimp out, Shu thought. Now that was a frightening idea. She tried to think of something really forceful to say. Um, your ex has been doing nothing for almost half an hour. Don't you think that's too long? Lena's head bowed, and she said softly, almost to herself, Oh, Robert, you're up to something terribly stupid, aren't you? She stared into the dark. Let's give Mary five more minutes. Then we'll call 911. Okay. They tooled along the valley floor, slowly enough that the windows could roll down. The resinous scent of Manzanita drifted in. On their left was southbound Highway 5, a lightless torrent of fast-moving vehicles edged by the blaze of the manual lanes. On their right were steep, dark hills, violet light flickering along the ridgelines. Shang brought up a local network view, looked back and forth between that and the physical world. Their little automobile was speeding up again. A pleasant male voice spoke within the passenger cabin. This portion of Valley Bottom Drive is misfunctioning. You may return after 10 a.m. tomorrow. What? Now we can't even circle back. There has to be some override, Shu. Shang shook her head. This would be their last drive through here tonight. Shu had helped design the hardware security layer. It solved so many problems. It made the Internet a safe and workable system. Now she was its victim. She thought again of the bag of tricks that sat on the floor beside her feet. She had spent the whole semester building those gadgets, her mechanical daydreams. Maybe. Shu, traffic! Lena was pointing up the hillside. Shu leaned over and looked out Lena's side. She saw two spears of light that just now were turning away from them. It looks like a car on manual. Or maybe it was on automatic, but driving on unimproved roadway. It must be on the service road. Lena paused, and a map appeared on Xu's view page, showing the road they hadn't been able to get on, the road that led to Huertas's old back entrance. 
the lights turned back toward them, then disappeared behind an outcropping. Xiu's view page didn't even show a nav marker for the other vehicle. What are they up to? said Lena. Their own car was almost to the T intersection. Car, said Lena. Turn right. Sorry, that's not an existing road. The only legal turn is left. Turn right, turn right. I'm sorry. I'll have you in safe traffic in less than five minutes. Please think about giving me an ultimate destination. Shu bet herself that company logic had decided it was dealing with a DUI customer. If they didn't come up with something sensible, the vehicle would take them all the way back to Rainbow's End. Lena sucked in a breath. We're so close. Wait, I got a ping response. It's from Thomas Parker's outfit. They are up there. And then much louder. Hey, Carr, I want to speak to your supervisor. I mean a human being. Certainly. Twenty seconds, please. Twenty seconds would put them past the T-intersection. Lena Goo seemed to shrink down in her wheelchair. Her gaze swept back and forth between the hillside and the approaching intersection. We've got to stop them, Shu. I'll wager they could tell us what's going on. You'd come out from cover? Let you know who see you? I'd lurk in the background. But the question was moot. The intersection was just fifty yards ahead. In a few seconds they'd turn left and be conveyed ignominiously away. Or maybe not. She lifted her backpack onto the seat beside her. She picked up the curved tube with the can of diamond flakes. She had improved her first shop class project out of all resemblance to the original transport tray. This new model was very much designed with destruction in mind. Sometimes you needed to get the machine's attention. She knelt on the back-facing seat and set the tip of the cutter against the dashboard. Given Robert Goo's example, she had a good idea of what to expect. Oops. Lena, scrunch down! Lena looked at the tube in Xiu's hands. Yes! She laughed even as she tried to flatten herself out of Shang's way. Xiu pressed the start button, a real physical button, and a roar ripped through the cabin. Her transport tray, now a very fine accelerator, drove 3,000 diamond flecks into the dashboard every second. The recoil was a soft, steady push. It was easy to keep the tip pointed. Some of the diamonds bounced up, embedding in the acoustic ceiling, but most drove straight into the dashboard. She wobbled the cutter's tip, and the hole widened. Now she was drilling through drive internals. The car slowed smoothly to a stop, parking itself just short of the intersection. System failure, it said. Emergency backup engaged. Please depart the vehicle and await emergency assistance. The doors popped ajar on all sides. Ha, said Lena. I was hoping for a real crash, and you having to cut the doors open. But she was already backing out of the car. Shu was speechless. Did I really do this? Timid little ex Shang? Lena wheeled around to the front of the car. We have a hill to climb, she said. For Alfred Vaz, there had been various pieces of good news. He had completed his fake investigation of the Gen Gen labs and provided Gunberg's clever analysts with evidence that would eventually lead them far away. And finally, Alice Gu had collapsed. That had come very late, but it was more spectacular than Alfred had expected. Keiko's people claimed that DHS surveillance was blinded, in chaos. That chaos was unexplained good fortune to her and Gunberg. For Alfred, it could mean complete success. Give him a few more minutes, and his private research program would be safe not only from Gunberg and Keiko, but also from the inevitable American investigations. And then, things went very wrong. Miri Gu had found the Stooges. He had lost his one mech in the labs, and also his fiber link to the Stooges. And now, Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. Mr. Rabbit has penetrated our millnet. Close SM. It was a fantastic claim, and manifestly true. For the last ten minutes, there had been minor comm glitches, error retry packets happening a little too often. The statistics were well below the level of reasonable suspicion. But then, in a grand gesture, typical rabbit madness, the creature had sent a two megabyte jumbogram straight through the millnet and off the end of the fiber. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. Just before we lost the fiber, 
It seemed the local stooges intended on escape. How much time does that leave us? Close SM. Numerical estimates floated up for time till stooges can reach 911 and time till DHS responds, but Keiko's people had an idea. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. For the moment, DHS is distracted. I can be very crude. I can fool the stooges into believing I'm the local police. Close SM. Such a masquerade would mean hijacking a significant part of the local net. Within the highly regulated networks of the modern world, that was about as subtle as an infantry assault. DHS was truly in disarray. For several minutes, there was no manager-level traffic. Alfred was aware of Keiko masquerading as the California Highway Patrol. His own attention was on a number of tasks he hadn't dared try while Alice Gong was still around. Gunberg's analysts were assessing how deeply Rabbit's intrusion had gone. Their conclusions were tagged a soothing green. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. I wonder what Rabbit was doing. Close SM. There were much easier ways of betraying the operation than this. As far as the network analysts could tell, Rabbit had managed little more than to rattle the metaphorical doorknobs of their millnet. The psych people had their explanation. Rabbit was known for its childish ego. It simply couldn't pass up a chance to show off, hence the jumbogram. Such antics could not be taken as a sign of overall betrayal. After all, Rabbit was still doing a magnificent job with the library riot. Some analysts had more paranoid theories. The current favorite was that Rabbit was China. That would make tonight a perfect Keystone Cops comedy, all the great powers chasing after each other. But there were also nightmare speculations. Maybe Rabbit had fooled the network analysts and all the lesser paranoids. After all, the jumbogram had been sent just before the fiber link was broken. Maybe Rabbit was a grand terrorist, who had used the Alliance as its stooge, installing its own interests within the labs, a quick conversion of the entire establishment into a death factory. And there was that UPX launcher in the Gen Gen area, what amounted to a delivery system. Alfred sighed to himself. In the long run, he feared Rabbit as much as the extreme paranoids did, but tonight... Well, if they looked too closely, they might see Alfred's own operation lurking in the shadows. It was best to calm things down. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Mitsuri, Open SM. I'm with the Greens on this. Yes, Rabbit has exceeded our worst estimates. He has broken into our operations millnet. But we have hard limits on his bandwidth, and my people still control the changes being made. Just look at the consistency checks. Short of having physical troops on the ground there, we own the MCOG area. Close SM. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. We also have good control of the topside operation. No sign of rabbit funny business. The important... Close SM. Waiting on message pause. Red doubt was hemorrhaging across the analyst pool, spreading from a statistical analysis team at Moscow, Cape Town, these were the same chaps who had been consistently right about the soybean futures plot. They had credibility, and they claimed that the views from the north side of the Gen Gen area were corrupt. Those were not views Alfred had subverted. For better or worse, his colleagues had discovered some other deception. Now the signals and stat people in all the analyst pools had precedence. A thousand specialists, who a second ago might have been looking at a dozen other problems, were suddenly watching the same data. Computing resources shifted from a myriad drudge tasks, began correlating data from the accessible sensors in the labs. It was as if Indo-European intelligence were an immense cat suddenly come alert, listening and watching for sign of its prey. Only one of the area cams was offline, but others were subtly misregistered. The inconsistencies were scattered all across the area that the Alliance controlled, but analysis made the Moscow Cape Town guess more and more a certainty. A blotch of deception was moving into the Gen Gen area at the speed of a fast walk. There, a fleeting glimpse of the goo child. The analysts pounced on the location, dredged two sets of footsteps out of the lying silence. So Rabbit did have troops on the ground. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. That damned bunny. We can't stop him. He just keeps coming and coming and coming. Close SM. For a moment, there was no conversation. Then, Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, 
OpenSM. I can stop him. I can pull the plug on Credit Suisse. Close SM. There was another long pause. Yes. Gunberg's discovery that Rabbit depended on a single Apex certificate authority. All power in the modern world, from flying the largest aircraft to moving bytes between components in a single processor, it all came down to the exchange of appropriate markers of trust, as enforced by the secure hardware environment. And far at the top of Rabbit's operations, via billions of unknown paths, there was a single source, Credit Suisse CA. Revoking that authority would disarm Rabbit. It would likely destroy the fellow's access to his own most personal files, leaving nothing but what the creature held in his natural mind, unless Rabbit really was an AI, in which case nothing would be left. But the collateral damage would be enormous. Shutting down a top-level certificate authority was a metaphorical weapon of mass destruction. And now it was all that was left to them. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. Mr. Rabbit must be stopped. I have begun the proceedings. Credit Suisse will begin issuing global revocations in 15 seconds. Close SM. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. I'm sorry, Gunberg. Close SM. 10% of the trust apparatus of Europe would slide into chaos in the next half hour. The aftershocks would rattle the world. Whatever else came out of their mission here, for Gunberg Brown, it was a career-ending failure. Another kind of failure threatened Alfred Vaz. Shooting down Rabbit had been one of his fondest hopes, but not just now. Alfred dipped back into the Gen Gen viewpoints. Downing Rabbit had eliminated all the slack from the schedule. And I need that time for my own cover-up. He was reduced to emergency measures. Alfred brought two more secret teams online. One would use the fruit fly scam to divert what was left of Rabbit. The other would destroy his lab within a lab, destroy Alfred's work of years. But they would also outship his secret lab's greatest prize through Gen Gen's UPX launcher. For Alfred Vaz, some form of success was still possible. Gu the eldest and Gu the youngest hiked southward out of the Huertas cavern. Behind them, the shredded containers and the north entrance were swallowed by darkness. The light that traveled above them shone just a few yards in all directions. How far till we're in enemy territory? said Robert. Miri held a finger up to her lips. She gestured, and silent messaging paraded across his vision. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. Your PDF says they only control a small part of Gen Gen, but I bet they can hear a long ways. Stick with silent messaging. Close SM. Robert fumbled with the box at his belt. The keypad display helped, but typing was tedious. All the tricks that Juan had taught him were nearly useless without Epiphany. Robert, Arrow, Miri, Open SM. Okay. Close SM. Miri walked in almost perfect silence, and Robert tried to imitate her. In fact, with Winston and the others gone, things were very quiet in Huerta's country. Maybe they were as alone as the mysterious stranger had claimed, shielded from friends and enemies alike. Miri must have been reading as they walked. More Sming appeared. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. I didn't know about Alfred. Close SM. It was curious that she didn't wonder about the mysterious stranger. He tapped a few cramped words. Robert, Arrow, Miri, Open SM. W-H-T-C-N, we do. Close SM. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. Well, there's Mr. Smart Alex List. Close SM. She waved at the air, and a page of the stranger's PDF popped into view. Page 17. What you can do to defeat Alfred. First off, even I, your mysterious friend, am not sure exactly what Alfred is up to, but I am afire with curiosity. Here are some possibilities. 1. To blow up the biolabs, classic straightforward terrorism. But don't you think he went to rather a lot of trouble if that's all he wants to do? It would be a gross underemployment of everyone's talent. If this is the scam, you will be the heroes of the day, my hands in disabling those little boxes you and your friends planted. But your fame will likely be posthumous. My condolences. 2. To sabotage some component of the labs, maybe in a way that won't become evident till much later disasters. 
This is almost as stupid as one. Three, to install or cover some fiendishly clever man-in-the-middle software that gives Alfred de facto ownership of research done in that part of lab that you, Robert, infested for him. This would be cool, and it is my personal favorite. See my discussion of fruit flies in Chapter 3. Unfortunately for Alfred, this caper is so far blown that I doubt it will survive the audits that will surely come raining down. In this case, you two can help by grabbing anything that Alfred has not yet hidden. 4. In the failure of Case 3, or perhaps as his original plan, Alfred may take advantage of your Cabal's efforts and outship biologically interesting materials from the labs. Diagram of the Pneumo Tube Transport System Picture of Gen Gen's UPX Launcher To what end? All the usual terrorist possibilities, but more likely something weird and interesting. I'm confident I can identify such activity, and you, my loyal hands, can physically prevent the loading and outshipment. For the moment, we are all in the dark about this. But once you enter the perverted Gen Gen area, I should be able to contact you again. Be careful, be quiet, and watch for me in your sky. Miri's words were overwriting the text even before Robert finished reading it. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. This guy is always so modest. Close SM. Robert grinned. Then he read her message a second time, and he thought back to all his conversations with Sharif, to the mystery of true Sharif and stranger Sharif and sci-fi Sharif. Oh my god. Robert, Arrow, Miri, Open SM. How much of Sharif, W-S-U? Close SM. She glanced up at him, and for instant, her intensity was transformed into a dazzling smile. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. I'm not sure. Sometimes we were all mixed together with the real Zulfi. That was almost fun, hearing what the others asked and what you answered. But way too often, I was frozen out and it was just Mr. Smart Alec. Close SM. Robert, Arrow, Miri, Open SM. The Mysterious Stranger. Close SM. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. Do you really call him that? Why? Close SM. Robert, Arrow, Miri, Open SM. Yes. Close SM. Because of the magic, he promised. But he didn't type that out. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. Well, I think he's nothing without us. Close SM. Everything was still dark beyond their little pool of light, but now the walls were closer. They were almost back to the sky tunnel. Robert, Arrow, Miri, Open SM, WHN, Will, YR, Mom and Dad, GT, here. Close SM. Kids spying on family members and reporting to the government. That feature of tyranny is so much simpler when the family itself is mainly government agents. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. I don't know. I didn't tell them. Close SM. Where is tyranny when you need it? For a moment, Robert couldn't think of anything to say. Robert, Arrow, Miri, Open SM. But why? Close SM. Miri stopped for a second, looked up at him with that patented stubborn stare. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. Because you're my grandfather. I knew you never meant to hurt me. I knew you must be hurting inside. I knew Bob must be wrong about you. I figured that if I could help you out from a different direction, you'd get better. And you did get better, didn't you? Close SM. Robert managed a nod. Miri turned and marched on. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. But I messed up. I thought Smart Alec was all I had to worry about. Wherever you broke in... I thought there'd be instant alarms, and me and Juan being there might make things go better for you. Now Juan is... Close SM. She hesitated, then reached out to grasp his hand. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. Juan is hurt bad. Close SM. Her hand trapped his fingers. No matter. Robert had no sensible reply except to squeeze back. Miri... Arrow, Robert, Open SM. But Dr. Shang is out there. She'll call for help. 
and Mr. Blount should be calling the real 911 by now. Meantime, it's up to you and me down here. Close SM. There were surprises in almost every one of Miri's sentences, and if he could have spoken aloud or typed freely, he would have asked a hundred questions. Juan? Xuxiang? Miri? So many friends, doing so much to save an incompetent old fool and his fellow fools. The ground bounced elastically against their feet. They were passing through the sky tunnel, back into Zhen Zhen territory. 28. The Animal Model Even on a slow day, thousands of certificates got revoked every hour. It was a messy process, but a necessary consequence of frauds detected, court orders executed, and credit denied. All but a handful of revocations were short cascades of denied transactions involving a single individual and his, her immediate certificate authority, or a small company and its CA. Perhaps once a year there would be a significant cascade, usually when a large company ran into uncompromising creditors and a court order was delivered to a mid-level CA. Even more rarely, a revocation might be part of a military action, as in the fall of South Ossetia. In theory, the revocation protocols worked with arbitrarily large CAs, but until this night, no Apex Certificate Authority had ever issued global revocations, and Credit Suisse was one of the ten largest CAs in the world. Most of its business was in Europe, but its certificates bound webs of unmeasured complexity all over the planet, affecting the interactions of people who might speak no European language. Tonight, all those unknowing customers would learn of their connection. The failure spread as timeouts on certificates from intermediate CAs, and where time-critical trust was involved, as direct notifications. In Europe, airplanes and trains came smoothly to a stop, without a single accident or fatality. A billion failures were noted, and emergency services moved, with varying success, into action. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security noticed the failures and growing collateral damage. Analyst pools in the U.S. reached out to the other great powers and conferred under emergency protocols established years ago. Chinese Public Safety, the Indo-European Intelligence Services, the U.S. DHS, they all agreed that a Category 1 disaster was in progress, a really bad software failure, or a novel terrorist attack. In certain corners of Indo-European intelligence, understanding was more precise, considerably more precise. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, OpenSM. So I have done it. Has it had any effect on Rabbit? Close SM. So far there were only small failures at UCSD, just a few certificates timing out. That was enough to make some projections. The crowds had not consciously noticed the changes, but the library riot was due for an abrupt and ignominious end. Even more than the analysts had guessed, Rabbit had been behind what they had seen tonight, and now that support was rotting away. Down in the labs, Rabbit had been an almost invisible intruder. Confirming the absence of that intrusion was not easy, but Alfred's analysts had a consensus. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Mitsuri, OpenSM. Communication failures are up, but not in our core operation. Rabbit is still here, but he's losing flexibility. Close SM. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, OpenSM. Losing flexibility? By damn, we need more than that. What about his two agents? What are they doing? Close SM. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Mitsuri, Open SM. They've wandered out of our area. Close SM. That wasn't precisely true, but the goose and what remained of Rabbit were properly diverted. Now I just need a few more minutes. Rabbit was under pressure. He always told himself that he performed best under pressure, though usually the pressure was not so immediate nor his opponents so powerful and humorless. Other than some of the low-ranking analysts, Rabbit didn't know anyone on the Indo-European side who could take a joke. Rabbit looked out through a dozen cameras, everything that Alfred had suborned in the MCOG area. His hands had entered the area just a few moments before. Maybe that was what had panicked his enemies into their massive revocation attack. 
With a small and dwindling part of his attention, he followed the wonderful riot around the library. Sigh. Alfred and company had never guessed his connection with Scoochamood. And yet, who'd have thunk they'd detect his affection for Credit Suisse CA? Or that the EU had such power over the certificate authority of a sovereign country? Or that his own dependence was as broad as he was now discovering? Rabbit had other Apex CAs, though none so useful as Credit Suisse. They would suffice for a few more minutes. Where they didn't, he had legal programs posting appeals against the most destructive of the revocations. Meantime, focus on the fun things. What was Alfred trying to do? Sheer destruction? Intellectual theft? Rabbit was beginning to feel mean. He had been willing to settle for a secret back door into Alfred's operation. Now, well, now he meant to steal it all, starting with the fruit flies. Rabbit reached out for his hands. Robert remembered this area. They were back in the heart of Gen Gen country, the unending rows of gray cabinets, the crystal forests that connected them, the pneumo tubes. But up ahead was a sound like cardboard boxes being crushed. The stranger's PDF had explanations for the abbreviations that were printed on the sides of the cabinets. DROS MCOG. Robert, Arrow, Miri, Open SM, Fruit Flies, Close SM. This was where he had set down almost a third of the little boxes, having to crawl over above and between the cabinets. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. Yes. Did you read what Smart Alec claims about this? I don't believe it. Close SM. Hey, hey, my man. And there was the mysterious stranger, Miri's Mr. Smart Alec. His skin was practically glowing green, even in the shadows. The face was Sharif's, but the smile was inhumanly wide. Talk as you please. Alfred discovered us here several minutes ago. The stranger looked around, as if expecting a visible enemy. So now I don't care if he hears you. Or me. What can you do, Alfred? You're shutting me down, but I'll wager I'll last another minute or two. Oh, I suppose you could shut down your own operation, too. I'd be instantly gone then. He glanced back at Miri and Robert, and continued sotto voce. If he does that, he's truly desperate. And it won't help him a bit, since you still have my PDF. You'll still be here to destroy his underhanded plans. The mysterious stranger waved for them to follow. Did you get to this part of my explanation? He waved at the cabinets. Molecular Biology of Cognition, MCOG. And Alfred's people have created the ideal animal model for their research. Fruit flies? said Robert. I don't believe it, said Mary. Fruit flies can't think. What could your Alfred, or you, do with them? The stranger gave out one of its dismissive laughs, and Robert noticed Mary's face jerk up. She might do better with this manipulator than Robert. After all, she wasn't desperate for his help. Ah, Mary, you read, but you don't understand. If you had access just now to the wider net, and a few hundred hours of research, perhaps you'd understand that molecular biology depends more on data depth and analysis than it does on the particular class of organism. In his Drosophila melanogaster alfredii, is that what you call them, Alfred? We have the metabolic pathways that are the basis for all animal cognition. Minus the editorial comments, this did look like some of the PDF. They rounded a corner and saw the source of the sounds. Viola, Alfred's 300,000 fruit flies, now being folded into convenient shipping cartridges. The stranger's face and body bore less and less resemblance to the original Sharif. But I must confess, I know what these little bugs are, but I don't really know what Alfred has planned for them. Surely there are some marvelous diseases, cognitive diseases, that might come out of such research. Or maybe he wants to get a head start on all the enhancement drug people. Or maybe he's into YGBM. But I do know... The fruit fly arrays were being folded on a large transport table, much bigger than anything in Ron Williams's shop class. The shipping cylinders rolled across the table, right through the stranger's body. The creature noticed this a half-second late, but did a creditable hop back from the table. But I do know that he's trying to ship them off sight. So you claim. Hey, trust me, Miss Meary. 
You've met Alfred. He's the fellow who tried to kill Juan Orozco. The guy's an evil loon. Ping the labels on these packages if you don't believe me. Yes. UPX labels with an encrypted destination. The first of the cylinders was sliding off the table, headed toward the nearest pneumo tube. Now the stranger was hopping from one foot to the other. Only you can save mankind. Just knock the cylinders onto the lower tray. Don't let Alfred win. That seemed to convince Mary. She rushed to the table, grabbed the package out of the pneumo tube lock, and tossed it to Robert. He caught it and the next and the next, and now his arms were full. The white cylinders were as light as foam. The stranger's image froze for a second. Abruptly, animation returned. Heh! Excellently done! He waved vaguely at the walls. See that, Alfred? It doesn't pay to cross the rabbit! Rabbit? The creature turned back in their general direction. By God, it did look a little bit like a rabbit. That was a near thing, but I won. I mean, we saved mankind. It drew itself up, but its whole body was tilted. Damn, Alfred. He is shutting me down a piece at a time. Maybe I should exit with my impression of the Wicked Witch of the West. Dying, that is. The creature spun around, giving out melodramatic moans, its body dissolving around it. It hesitated, and said offhandedly to Robert, Oh, don't let the cylinders go untreated. Just drop them onto the lower tray. Robert didn't move. I mean it, said the stranger, something like a serious tone creeping into its voice. It flailed about, more dramatic dying, or looking for an explanation. If the bugs are disease vectors, you're at ground zero. The lower tray will send them to an incinerator, all safe and tidy. Mary shook her head. No, that's an alternate path to the UPX launcher. Look at my PDF, you fool, the map! I looked at my map, the one I cached this afternoon. Mary's smile was triumphant. There was a two-second lag. Then the creature turned and looked almost straight at Mary. I hate you, Mary Goo, you evil thing. Everything was going so well till you started meddling. I'll get you for this. Then it was shouting. Meantime, I'm gonna get you, Alfred. If I'm out of action, so are you. I'm blowing the whistle on you. I'm... The figure stopped moving. There was a moment of silence. Then Robert heard a single word, faint and far away. Help. And the creature vanished. Robert and Mary stared at each other. It was just the two of them, and the ranks of cabinets. Do you think he's really gone, Mary? I... don't know. Mary, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. But if Smart Alec wasn't lying about everything, then this Alfred guy is still around. Close SM. Aloud, her words were timid. Maybe we should stay here and wait for the police. Okay. Miri plunked herself down on the floor. She was very quiet for a moment, both publicly and privately. Robert set the packages down and stared off into the dark, looking this way and that. Supposedly, there were no more enemy robots. What could Alfred do with the fruit flies now? What could the fellow do to Miri and Robert himself? Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. Things don't sound the same. Close SM. Robert looked a question at her. Miri drew a golden arrow at right angles to the corridor they had arrived from. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. I kept track of everything I heard when I was following you. There's something new going on, most likely in the mouse arrays. Did you do anything over that way? Close SM. She quietly came back to her feet. Robert tapped at his keypad. Robert, Arrow, Miri, Open SM. THTS, WHR, we put most of our EQT. Close SM. Miri's chin came up. Miri, Arrow, Robert, Open SM. The sounds are like what we heard here. Someone's packaging another shipment out. Close SM. 29. Dr. Xiang takes charge. Gunberg and Keiko and Alfred each had their own analyst pools. Ten seconds ago, those analysts had agreed. As an active threat, Rabbit was gone, 
both topside and in the operation's millnet. Descent clusters hung around the opinion, but they were related to collateral damage prediction. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. God willing, we've stopped the monster. Close SM. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. And we have the inspection data we came for. Now it's time to get the hell out. Close SM. She brought up a zoomed picture of the contingency tree. They were way out on a limb that led to full loss of deniability. And yet, until they knew for sure the results of their investigation, they needed the Americans kept ignorant. Alfred presented his latest extraction schedule, the times padded just enough to cover his outshipment activities. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. Eight minutes? That much? Close SM. Keiko still had things covered on the north side of the labs, and the views of the riot showed the Bollywood team still in place by the library, but that affair was descending into civil disorder, the sort of thing that brings a direct police response. Meshing Alfred back into the Bollywood people should be easy now. Very soon it would be impossible. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Mitsuri, Open SM. I'll trim every second I can, Keiko. Close SM. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. You'd better. Five minutes is the most I can guarantee. Close SM. Alfred smiled at Keiko's impolitely constrained panic. She and Gunberg would do their best. And in some ways, this chaos was helpful. Fooling Gunberg and Keiko had always been Alfred's biggest problem. His outshipment would have been impossible if they weren't so distracted. Two minutes passed. Three. His secret team had completed most of the fakery. They had updated the logs to satisfy both Alliance and future U.S. investigators. Now they were working with one small section of the Mus Musculus arrays, his true animal model. Alfred hopped from viewpoint to viewpoint, swooping over cabinets that looked like office blocks in some bland utilitarian city. He couldn't take more than a few of the mice, just a few of those conceived since the last update. His team had already shut down the in-progress experiments and started destruct operations. Now they detached the chosen arrays and began prepping them for launch. Other members of the team were already sending shipping cartridges to the Numo port atop the cabinet. He could fit one 20 by 30 array, 600 mice, into each cartridge. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. Alfred, the public net is failing. Close SM. Vaz swore and glanced at the topside analysis. This wasn't even close to Keiko's deadline. Brown, Arrow, Mitsuri, Vaz, Open SM. It's a full system failure. Mr. Rabbit has screwed us. Close SM. The analysts were boiling with contrary opinions. Failures like this happened a couple of times a year somewhere in the world, the price that civilization paid for complexity. But here there was a more sinister suspicion that this failure was collateral damage from the revocation. Maybe Rabbit's riot magic depended on his commandeering the embedded computer systems of the public environment. Now that his certificates were revoked, there was a cascade of failures working through almost everything, just as fast as the certificates failed. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. Alfred, clean up and get out! Close SM. The second and third cartridges would be ready in a moment. Alfred glanced at the UPX status. The launcher was close to the MCOG area. Most important, it was locally managed, unaffected by the crash outside. He entered a destination in Guatemala and selected a launch vehicle that he'd emplaced some weeks before. It ought to be stealthy enough to get out of U.S. airspace. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Mitsuri, Open SM. One minute. Can you give me that? Close SM. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. I will try. Close SM. The topside analysts were hard into contingency planning and probability estimates. A thousand little changes were being made across the UCSD landscape, wherever the Indo-European operation had influence. The Bollywood presence would survive as long as any up there. Alfred forced his attention back into the labs. The second cartridge was loading. The first cartridge was shooting down the Pneumo, taking its little passengers to the launcher. Alfred froze. The goos were gone from the fruit fly area. There was movement in another window, at the edge of the mice arrays. A girl and a man running toward the camera. 
They hadn't been fooled by the fruit flies. Alfred leaned forward. Okay. One minute. What could his people cook up in that time? Lena's wheelchair was no hiking machine. It did well enough on the asphalt, even going uphill. She had to trot to keep up. But where the asphalt was carved by gullies, the chair had to walk. The going got very slow. Can you even see the road, Lena? Her view page was as dark as the natural view. No. I think someone has turned off the hillside. Side effect of the riot, maybe. She moved to the middle of the road. Psst, they're still coming. She waved at Shu to come forward. How can we stop them? One way or another, we have to find out what's happening. Robert will see you. Damnation, Lena dithered, caught in a dilemma. Go back to the side of the road. I can stop them more safely anyway. Humph, said Lena. But she retreated. Shu stood still for a moment. There were the distant sounds of the freeway. From over the hilltop there were noises that might have been chanting. But nearby was just insect sounds, the feel of air cooling in the night, the narrow roadway jumbled and rocky under her feet. She saw light sweep across the outcroppings above her. I can hear them, Shu. Shu could, too, the crunch of tires and now the faint whine of electric motors. The mystery car came around a last unseen bend in the road, and she tensed to dive out of the way. But on this road, cars could not speed. Its headlights slowly bore down on her. Make way! Make way! The words were loud, and the view page in her hand came alight with flashing warnings about the penalties for interfering with the California Highway Patrol. Shu started to give way, and then she thought, but it's the CHP I want to talk to. She waved for the car to stop. The vehicle slowed still more, then turned and tried to edge past her on the left. Make way, make way. No, she shouted and hopped back in front of it. You stop. The car moved even more slowly. Make way, make way. And it tried to pass her on the other side. She jumped in the way again, this time flailing her backpack as though it could do some damage. The auto backed up a yard or two, and turned slyly as if preparing an end run. She wondered if she really wanted to jump in front of what happened next. With every heartbeat, pain spiked through Tommy. After a moment, he realized that was good news. He raised his head, saw that he was stretched out on the back seat of a passenger car. That was Winston and Carlos in the facing seats. Where's Robert and his little girl? Winston Blount shook his head. They stayed behind. We split up, Professor Parker. Scary memories were coming back. Oh, yeah. Where's my laptop? We gotta call 911. We called, Tommy. Everything's okay now. This is a CHP vehicle. Despite his haziness, that didn't make sense. It sure doesn't look like one. It's got all the insignia, Tommy but there was dawning uncertainty in Winston's voice. Tommy slid his legs from the seat and pushed himself into a half-sitting position. The pain squeezed tight on his chest, clawed out along his arms. He almost blacked out again, and would have fallen forward if not for Carlos. Hold, hold me up. Tommy looked forward. The car's headlights were on. The road was steep and narrow, with scattered remnants of asphalt surfacing, the sort of thing you might see in the East County or in short stretches along the coast, a disconnected remnant of lost roadway. They slowed, negotiating deeply shadowed gullies. Bushes swept close around them. And now ahead he saw someone standing in the middle of the road. The car slowed to a crawl just five yards short of... It was a young woman. Make way! Make way! Their car said over and over, trying to get by on one side and then the other. The woman hopped from side to side, blocking them. She was shouting and swinging a good-sized backpack at them. Their car backed up a few feet, and Tommy heard the faint squeal of a capacitor preparing for something drastic. The wheels turned a few degrees, and the woman jumped in front of them again. Her face was bright in the headlights. It was a pretty Asian face. If you added thirty years to it, you got the face from some very distasteful turn-of-the-century papers in secure computing. She was the last person he'd ever expect to play block the tanks at Tiananmen Square. The headlights went out. 
The car jolted forward. Then the brakes engaged, and they slid halfway into the ditch. There was a muffled explosion that might have been that capacitor slagging itself. The doors on both sides of the vehicle popped open, and Tommy slid partway into the cool night air. You okay, Professor Parker? That was Carlos's voice, coming from close behind his head. Not dead yet. He heard footsteps on the roadway. A light flared in a small hand, and the woman said loudly, It's Winston Blount and Carlos Rivera. And then more conversationally, And Thomas Parker. You, you probably don't know me, Dr. Parker, but I have admired your work. Tommy didn't know what to say to that. Let us pass, said Winston. This is an emergency. He was interrupted by the sound of wheels, but not from another car. A voice spoke from the darkness. Where's Mary? Where's Robert? Carlos said, They're still inside. They're trying to stop the... We're afraid that someone is taking over the labs. Motors whined. It was a wheelchair, carrying someone all hunched over. But the voice was strong and irritated. Damn it, lab security would prevent that. Maybe not when he sounded like he was chewing on broken glass. We think that someone has subverted security. We called 911. That's what you're interfering with. He waved at their car. It was halfway into the ditch, unmoving. Tommy looked at the darkened passenger car. No, he said. That's a fake. Please, you call 911. The wheelchair rolled nearer. I'm trying to but we're in some kind of a dead zone. We should go down the hill, find something we can latch on to. Dui, said Carlos. He was staring all around, the way kids do when their contacts fail. The redoubtable Dr. Xiang waved her little hand light, light and shade sweeping up around her. Strange. There was a kind of hesitancy about her. Ex Xiang was one of the true bad guys of the present era, at least one of the people who had made the bad guy regimes possible. You could never tell it by looking at her. She doused the light and stood silently for a moment. I... I don't think we're in a local dead zone. Sure it is, said Winnie. I'm wearing and I can't see a thing except the real view. We have to get to the freeway, or at least get a line of sight on it. And now Tommy remembered what Goo's granddaughter had said. Maybe the local nodes were being spoofed. Shang had another theory. I mean the dead zone is not just here. Listen. I don't hear a thing. Oh. There were little sounds. Insects, maybe. There was faint shouting from over the hills. Okay, that must be the belief circle diversion. What else? The freeway sounded... strange. Not the constant throbbing surf of wheels on road. Now there was only the faintest sound, a dying sigh. Tommy had never heard such a thing, but he knew how stuff worked. Failure shut down, he said. Everything? Stopped? said Carlos, horror climbing up into his voice. Yup. Tommy's chest pain beat toward a crescendo. But hey, let me live long enough to learn what's going on. The voice from the wheelchair said, Even if we can't get word out, someone will notice. Maybe not. Tommy gasped out. If the blackout was large and spotty, with the appearance of natural disaster, why, it might cover something really big going on underground. And there's nothing we can do to help, said Winston. Maybe not. Chong's words echoed Tommy's, but her voice was thoughtful, distant. She flicked her light at the backpack. I've had a lot of fun in shop class. You can make so many interesting things now. Tommy managed. Yeah, and they all obey the law. Ex Shang's laugh was soft. That fact can be used against itself, especially if the parts don't know the big picture. A lot of Tommy's old friends talked that way. It was mostly idle talk. But this was Ex Shang. She pulled out a clunky-looking gadget. It looked like an old-time coffee can open at one end. She held the coffee can where it could see her view page. Lots of gadgets are still working. They just can't find enough nodes to get a route out. But there's a big military base just north of here. From the wheelchair, Camp Pendleton is about 30 miles that away. 
Maybe the speaker gestured, but Tommy couldn't see. Shang scanned her coffee can across the starless sky. This is crazy, said Winston. How can you know there are nodes in your line of sight? I don't. I'm going to shine signals off the sky haze. I'm calling in the Marines. And then she was talking to her view page. Bob Goo and his Marines logged more time in training systems than they ever did in combat or on watch. Training managers were legendary for creating impossible emergencies and then topping them with something even more unbelievable. Tonight, the real world was outdoing the craziest of the trainers. Alice had been moved to intensive care. Bob would have gone with her, except that whatever had taken her down was enemy action, and not the end of it. The analyst display had sprouted new nodes and a dozen long-shot associations. Credit Suisse CA had just collapsed, a major disaster for Europe. The certificate revocations would have effects even in California. Bob took a closer look. The Credit Suisse collapse was so abrupt that it had to be a sophisticated attack. So what was a distraction from what? The DOD-DHS combined Earthwatch was involved now. Tonight's action could be something new, a grand terror that ran simultaneously through the USA and the Indo-European alliance, profiting from the gaps created by national sovereignties. Looking at the analysis above him, Bob could see only the broadest outlines, but it was evident that the intelligence agencies of the USA, the Alliance, and China were collaborating to hunt down the source of the threat. In Conus Southwest, his new top analyst was doing her best. His analyst pool was still crippled, but folks were talking productively. Their structures of conjecture and conclusion were growing. The new top analyst took voice. Colonel, the revocation storm is very intense at UCSD. The traffic display showed that the demonstration around the library had ground to a halt. The new failures were not due to backbone router saturation. Participants were being decertified by the thousands. Millions of support programs were balked. If nothing else, this showed that massive foreign involvement in tonight's festivities had not been some analyst pipe dream. Whatever had hit Europe was intimately involved here. But the biolabs still showed green. Even the participation of the night crews in the library demonstrations had worked out for the best. Maybe productivity and performance would be down for this shift. But that was a commercial issue. In fact, the departure of the human crews had simplified the lab situation. There was nothing there but automation, and it showed all was well. FBI again requests clearance to take over. Bob shook his head irritably. Denied, as before. Hmm. More than riot participants were being decertified. Three analysts from the Southern California Utilities reported infrastructure failures in the campus area. Why would local infrastructure depend on certs from Credit Suisse? Correlation of systems failures with the revocation storm is 95%, Colonel. No kidding. Even if the labs were clean, there was some kind of deadly interference here. Bob tapped the command he had been contemplating these last few minutes. Launch alert. Analysts update contingency 9 and give me a launch mark, he said. There was a pause as the request was reviewed by the DOD-DHS combined Earthwatch. His CONUS Southwest watch was on a very short leash since Alice's breakdown. But clearance came back in just five seconds. Bob scarcely noticed his G-pod in flight. He would be the last out of the barn, so there was a lot to watch. Launch, launch, launch. Uncrewed vehicles launched. His displays showed 30 canisters of combat network munitions shot high into the Southern California night. The uncrews were from the north side of the base, 20 kilometers away. Farther north, from MCAS Edwards, more primitive weapons rose into the heavens. Their manifest was a catalog of extreme possibilities. Rescue lances, 500. Damage suppression fogs, 100. Air lasers, 10. Thermal flechettes, isolation variant, 100. And then the last three, the nightmares, sterilization fog dispensers, 10 by 10. Herf area munitions, 20 by 20 by 4. Strategic nuclear munitions, 10 by 10 by 2. Analysts are paid to think worst case, but lord. 
the biolabs were the only excuse for these items. But in truth, if you discounted the absence of follow-up equipment, this was a fairly conventional load for a modern expeditionary force. Three times in Bob's career, such launches had ended in real combat. But those had been half a world away, in Olmati, in Ciudad General Ortiz, and in Asuncion. The most terrible weapons had never been used, though Asuncion had been a very near thing. Tonight he was aiming all this hardware at his own neighbors, just thirty miles south of Camp Pendleton. Full force in an urban area was like going after rats in your kitchen with a machine gun. Keep your head down, Mary. FBI again requests clearance to take over. Denied. The situation has escalated. For the moment, hopefully just for the moment. If police and rescue could bring the system back up, then all the hardware that Bob had just boosted over Southern California would simply be an expensive exercise. But one good thing about being locked and loaded was that he had lots more call on resources. Goo grabbed analyst teams from all across the national work shift and pushed the intel and sensor backlog at them. Priority questions. Are the San Diego labs secure? What is the prognosis for the current system failures? Meantime, Bob's launches had soared to the top of their trajectories. He tweaked the Edwards munitions still higher, delaying them behind the gear from Pendleton. If nothing was resolved soon, he would have to light the uncruised jets. I need answers, guys. But the analyst mob was still busy connecting a billion dots, looking for patterns and conspiracies. Then a single observation changed everything. A weather service geek doing her monthly reserve duty grabbed a very high priority. Twenty seconds ago, I see ad hoc signaling in the backscatter above here, and she drew an ellipse over San Diego, North County, covering much of Camp Pendleton. Somebody was making their own communications, simply blinking a light into the sky haze. The long axis of the scatter ellipse pointed right back toward UCSD. The words of the intercepted message streamed across Bob's vision. Xu Xiang, Arrow, anyone clever enough to notice me in the backscatter, open SM. Gen Gen Laboratory Automation has been corrupted. The system is attacking anyone opposing it. This is not a game. This is not a joke. What? Yes, I'll tell them. There are two people still in the labs. They are good guys. They are trying to help. Close SM. The NOAA analyst spoke over the script display. The message is a one-second burst, retransmitted twelve times. What you're seeing is the summed cleanup. It was clear enough. Bob Goo's fingers tapped in their gloves, launching his marines. Then his own G-pod came tight and... For a moment, Bob Goo was not paying attention. For a moment, he could not pay attention. Battle commit put the combat CEO himself into the fray. In this case, Launch took his landing dart almost horizontally out of Pendleton. Maybe this is not a good idea, he thought muzzily. But he always thought that coming out of a 20G railgun launch. Now he had to recollect his wits and context. His team and equipment were on schedule. The unthinkable last resorts were still high overhead, flexible to the last. The network munitions were already at UCSD, and the biolabs still showed green, all secure and peaceful. His own landing dart was seconds away from the UCSD. There was something else that was important, something in the last few seconds. Shushang? Bob's recollection came unsquished just as a DHS analyst team presented its own form of the insight. Shushang? A not uncommon name. But in all of Southern California, there probably weren't more than three or four who owned that name. And one lived at Rainbow's End with Lena Gu. Suddenly, he had a good idea just who was in the crosshairs of all that he commanded. 30. When the network stops. The library had chosen. For an instant, Timothy Wynn and all the night crew were silent. The crowds of real humans were quiet, and even the millions of virtuals took part in a coordinated stillness. The library had chosen, and it had chosen the Scoochies. On the hot sex side, you could see the realization of defeat spreading. The triumph was real. How would the Hatsekians take it? There had been a few debacles in the late teens, when major belief structures had produced some awful art. 
Some were so bad that the circles themselves had shriveled and died. Who heard of tines anymore, or the zones of thought? But tonight, the Hatsekians had lost at the hands of others. They must do something. Maybe even something gracious. The silent stillness of the mob continued a second more. Then dangerous knowledge suddenly turned away from the library. Its gaze swept fiercely across them all. After all, playing loser wasn't in its repertoire. But whoever was behind all the creativity was flexible. After a moment, Dangerous smiled gently and turned back to the library. Its voice made concessions sound like the granting of a favor. We bow to the wishes of the library. Here you have won, O Scoochamut. Wails arose from the Hotsex side, but Dangerous raised a hand and continued. We give up our claims here. We remain as guests only. Sheila, Arrow, Nightcrew, Open SM, the Hatsek people are in heavy discussion with the university administration. They're begging for whatever scraps they can get. Close SM. And the greater Skuchamut was conciliatory in victory, though it didn't step away from its embrace of the library. You are welcome as guests, in a library with real books. Hansen, Arrow, Night Crew, Open SM. Admin is squealing about that, but the publicity should pay for extra floor space. We've won, gang! Close SM. For some minutes, everything was cool. Ending a riot without a police confrontation or a physical debacle was a little bit anticlimactic, but the riot designers had even more special effects to wind things down. Katie Rosenbaum gathered the spider bots all together, then sent them out to Huynh's mechs for a bizarre peace dance that incidentally cleaned up most of the night's garbage. Tim sensed negotiations going on between the two sides, things being traded, promises made. Dangerous knowledge retreated into the sky, and both sides played with special effects that were new on this night. But now, when things should have been getting smoother, there were network problems. Here and there, service was unusably slow or all jittery. It made everyone look bad. Scoochamoot still stood by the library, embracing the pillar that had walked. You hold a heroic gesture that long and you just look stupid. Wynn looked at his mech status board. There hadn't been a Scoochie update for almost seven seconds. That was no way to drive a mech. Wynn, Arrow, Hansen, Open SM. Hey, Sheila, who's driving the greater Scoochamoot? Close SM. Hansen, Arrow, Wynn, Open SM. Dunno, he was good, but now he's dropped the ball. It's okay, we're winding down now. Just take control and walk the robot out. No need to look cool. Close SM. Then she was messaging the whole night crew, trying to tidy up and get all her Gen Gen people and gear back where they belonged. Wynn drove his forklift toward the greater Scoochamoot mech. He walked along behind and tried to figure some nice way to get the two off the field. His robot's mind some mists weren't matching its movements anymore. They looked like crap. Okay. He'd take control of the greater Scoochamoot and have the two robots give a last high five, and then rumble out together. That would be cool, if not fully so. Maybe it didn't matter. The network problems were getting a lot worse. There were strange latencies, maybe real partitions. Blocks of the virtual audience were being run on cache. Single hop still mostly worked, but routed communication was in trouble. Wynn stepped a few feet to the side and managed to find a good diagnostic source. There were certificate failures at the lowest levels, he had never seen that before. Even the localizer mesh was failing. Like the holes in threadbare carpet, splotches of plain reality grew around him, eating out the mists and crowds, revealing the armies of everyday lab mechs. Where there had been hundreds of thousands of players, now there were open stretches of dark lawn and the crowds of real humans standing in shock. Tim, your forklift! The shout was real sound, from Sheila Hansen, just a few feet away. Wynn turned back toward the library. He had lost contact with Mind Sum. He ran toward the mech. The forklift had continued autonomously for just a couple of steps, but this was not a flat lab floor, and the localizer mesh was failing around it. The robot had tripped on one of the ornamental boulders that fringed the terrace. It teetered off balance, shrieking location queries in all directions. But now the mesh was gone, and the forklift was in trouble.
Its onboard systems were designed to cope with instability. The failure mode consisted of stepping quickly into the fall, lowering its center of gravity, and dropping stability limbs. That would have worked down in the clean environment of the labs. Here, its lunge took it to the edge of the north side grade, and there was no localizer mesh to alert it to the drop. The stability limb settled into thin air, and the forklift tipped over the edge. There were screams. Wynn ran out onto the robot battlefield. All the epic imagery was gone, but the robots still had local coordination. They rolled out of his way. He scarcely noticed. All his attention was on his forklift. He had direct contact now. He surfed across the forklift's cameras and felt sick. There was someone pinned underneath. He climbed down the hillside and fell to his knees. The woman was trapped there, still screaming. Her leg, up to above the knee, was crushed by forklift composite. Someone scrambled down beside him, Sheila. She wriggled under the blades of the forklift, reached down to grasp the woman's hand. We'll get you out. Don't worry. We'll get you out. Yes, said Tim. He had full control now. Between his own vision and the cameras, he could see how it had fallen and where the woman was pinned. Be cool and everything will be okay. The forklift put its weight on knees that didn't touch the woman. There was solid support, no surprises. From under the blades, he could hear Sheila comforting the woman. Okay, just shift the weight back. Push off into a low sitting posture. Easy. But now there were other screams and the sounds of people running. Smail, arrow, win. Open SM. Help us, Tim! Close SM. Wynn glanced through a camera on the other end of the forklift. The robot that had been the greater Scoochamoot was still standing by the library, but now its center of gravity was absurdly high, and someone had overridden all its safeties to push against the nearest pillar. The mech's footpads were grinding into the concrete cladding of the terrace. There was the sound of motors on emergency burn, but in an off-on-off -off rhythm that sounded almost musical. The robot looked like a child trying to prop up a teetering bookcase. Wynn turned the camera to look up and up at the sixth floor overhang, almost directly overhead. There were gaps in the concrete and places where the floors tilted and swayed. It was a building that had the smarts to stabilize itself, even to move a little. But now that intelligence was cut off from location information. Like Timothy Wynn's forklift, the library was doing its best to remain standing, and on its own vast scale, it was failing. 31. Bob Contemplates Nuclear Carpet Bombing Bob coasted across the UCSD campus, his landing dart now as slow and quiet as the network munitions that were raining out of the sky. This was a classic network superiority assault, absent significant defenses. There were many, many things to do and only seconds to do them, but for these few moments he had a paradoxical sense of security. There weren't many places in the modern world where a human could be as self-sufficient, if only temporarily, as when in command of such an assault. Bob Goo's expeditionary group had its own network, its own power supplies, its own sensors. Even if all his remote analysts were to disappear, his marines would still be in business. At the moment, thousands of assault nodes were nestling into trees and bushes, fastening themselves to vehicles and ledges and the sides of buildings. Even before they touched down, they asserted primacy over what civilian network hardware still functioned. That takeover was almost complete. He already had access to almost all the embedded controllers in the area. In combat, those local systems were often unsalvageable. Here, there were a few seconds of intense interrogation, DHS authority was asserted, and he had control. The cars and wearables, the medicals, the viewpoints and financials and police systems, they were all responding. Police and rescue workers were reconnecting via the combat net. Already he could hear their voices picking up the operation. With just a little luck, there would be no loss of life, just a very bad and strange network outage. He would leave the combat net in place, just as in a foreign operation. Over the coming days it would be replaced, not by administrative forces, but by the gradual reassertion of the civil system. None of that was really important. The labs, have they responded? Yes, sir, came Patrick Weston's reply. He was on the ground with the first squad, near the Gen Gen main entrance. We have access to the lab's backup security. It's agreeing with the primary, claims the underground is secure, 
No sign of pervert. Civilian status alarm. Building failure. The letters streamed across a corner of Bob's view. The university library was going down. In combat, bad things happen, but tonight the cause looked like stupidity plus bad luck. First the rioters making their library dance, then network outage destroying its smarts. Whatever the reason, people would end up just as dead. Bob threw the problem to his reserve squad, which just now was 400 meters up, coming down with assorted hardware, including the rescue lances. He was vaguely aware of the lance canisters popping their fins, turning to point down into the library. There was the flash of a hundred tiny rockets, and as many hardened nodes were rammed downward through the concrete and steel of the elderly building. Inside, action would be faster than any human attention, the composite flechettes guiding themselves between walls, doing their best to minimize damage to old-style wired utilities. Once in place, they would displace the control codes of the dead building system and attempt to contact the stability servos. Waves of compute and recompute flickered from the squad's status board. Success depended on just what had survived and how fast it could engage the Marine's localizer mesh. But rescue was not the mission. His attention was on Patrick Weston. Understood, Goo said. Make it clear to biotech management and automation. They are to stand down and seal off the labs. Nothing goes in or out. Warn and embargo. Yes, sir. Maybe the Xiang message was some bizarre fraud. Maybe, yeah. He gave Weston another squad and engaged police backup. CDC inspectors would be here from Denver in about 30 minutes, and then they could contemplate making a safe entrance into the labs. Bob glided in a silent arc around the south side of the campus. It was time to land himself and his third squad. Where? If this was enemy action, there should be local honchos on the enemy side. He popped up the suspect lists. There was the usual population of foreign students. The interesting ones would be interviewed by the end of the evening. The library festivities had been almost a total surprise to the press. So why had that Bollywood contingent just happened to be in town and on site? Surely the Indo-European alliance wouldn't try anything really destructive. But the European cert collapse seemed at the heart of the destruction here in San Diego. The analysts and Bob's own intuition put the Bollywood crew at the top of his interest list. He stalled his dart in a clearing among the ukes and crunched down on a litter of branches and dead leaves. The third squad dropped at 20-meter intervals east and west from his position. There were shouts and lights from up the hill toward the library. The building was still out of plumb, but stability servos were engaged, and if nothing else failed, it should maintain a standing state. Police vehicles had come alive. Direct loudspeakers were making calming announcements. If things worked out, they might even be able to disguise the fact that there had been a military response. Local public safety could pat itself on the back for heading off one of those rare but inevitable system glitches. Just ahead was the cluster of game and film people from Bollywood. They had already received a hold notice. None of them were attempting to leave. Just a few words with you, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we want. Jen Jen said the labs were sealed tight, ready for the proper authorities. When? Ha! Huh. The CDC inspectors were ahead of schedule. Somehow they had gotten super ballistic transport. They'd be on the ground in ten minutes. He had support extending up the chain of command, and downward too. Some very large, very competent groups were reworking the odds that the labs had been converted to factory of death mode. They agreed that the probability was less than one percent. That is, science fiction. Now his analyst pool was larger than Bob Goo had ever seen, perhaps 15% of the analytical power of the entire U.S. intelligence community. All that support should have been comforting, yet there were places where the connectivity looked thin. Maybe that was just the way the associations flowed when a crisis was totally bizarre. Others thought it strange, too. He saw lots of paranoid colors. Finally, someone got desperate. Open point of order. I have a sanity check. We've lost communication with 5% of our original threat analysts since the revocation attack began. This should be impossible. Close point of order. All analysts were internal to the U.S. intelligence community. If Credit Suisse certificates were necessary for any of those participants to maintain connectivity, then there was at least a design failure. And maybe the enemy had been part of Bob's own support staff. There was an immediate counter-argument. Open point of order. 
You're mistaking loss of connectivity for loss of trustability. Close point of order. Then parts of the analyst pool got jammed in the controversy. It was the kind of deadlock that only a miracle worker could quickly untangle, and Alice is off in some hospital ward. Another alarm flashed across the lower part of his vision. His combat network lay all across campus now, and it did more than manage communication. Altogether, it was a 2,000-meter-wide snooper scope, and its report, Gen Gen's private UPX launcher has just gone hot. A counter showed 60 seconds till cargo boosted out of the labs. Even as USMC sensed the launch capacitor charging up, Gen Gen's own network continued to assure the world that all was safely sealed. Something was trying to break out of Gen Gen. This is way too much like Asuncion. Bob glanced at the nukes and death fog dispensers and herfs and airs floating down through 10,000 meters. To the journalists, those weapons should look like random aerobots, but they gave Lieutenant Colonel Robert Goo Jr. the physical power to annihilate any threat in this corner of the USA. So what was the minimum sufficient response? 30 seconds till UPX launch. Chaos still reigned in the land of the analysts. Verified contact with DOD DHS had been lost. Sometimes decisions come down to one poor slob on the ground. 32. The Minimum Sufficient Response MUS MCOG The stranger's PDF said that MUS was short for Mus Musculus. Mice. The mouse arrays stretched away into the dark. If anything, the place seemed even bigger than it had the first time Robert had been here. So where to go? Miri hesitated only a second, then ran in the direction of the loudest noises. They trotted down two aisles and over one. Yes. Here was a cabinet with doors swung wide. Pneumos were delivering white cylinders into the crystal forest on top. Miri skidded to a stop in front of the opened doors. Inside the cabinet were glassy racks. It was like some kind of old-time snack dispenser. The slots behind the glass were a silvery honeycomb, hundreds of perfect hexagonal cells. Hundreds of tiny faces looked out of the cabinet. Tiny faces with tiny pink eyes on tiny furry white heads. A high-pitched chittering came through the glass. They can't move they're wedged in so tight, said Miri. Their rear ends must be plugged into little... She paused, perhaps looking up background on her local cache little sucking diapers. For a little girl who had no interest in pets, there was a strange sadness in her voice. It's a standard thing, really. Miri tore her gaze away from the array of chittering faces. Each of these cabinets has mice cells arranged 20 by 30 by 10. So there are nine more arrays behind this one we're looking at. Hear the crunching noise? Smart Alec's friends are wrapping up some of them for shipment. But where? None of the mouse cells were moving. That must be in back. There was a sound like a goblet breaking. Colored mist floated down from the crystal forest. It barely wet his face. But Miri was standing right beside the cabinet. He reached out and drew her back. Above them, the rest of the fluidics shattered. There was the faint scent of unwashed socks. Robert moved them farther back, stepping on the broken glass. Miri, that could be nerve gas. Miri was silent for a second, and then her voice piped up confidently. They're trying to scare us. This part of the lab isn't designed for simple poisons. But Robert remembered the shipping cartridges just arriving here. We were suckered into stopping at this cabinet. Miri slipped out from behind him and ran around the cabinet. Ha! There is a transport tray back here. By the time he caught up, she was hosing the tray with aerosol glue. Tiny motors whined unable to load from the cabinet. Miri reached out, patted the almost invisible boundaries of the gel. After a moment, the crunching sounds within the cabinet came to an untidy stop. Nothing's going out from here. They stood, listening, and now the familiar sound of cargo prep came from all over the cavern. How many mouse arrays are there, Miri? 817 when I cached the lab description. She looked up at him. But there's no way Smart Alec's friends could be using more than a few arrays. There's too much security and too many other projects down here. The sounds of packaging grew louder. Dozens of cabinets were playing the game of Come Stop Me. 
Miri stepped back and gazed into the distance. The lab was a miniature city, its alleys laid out in a rectangular grid, stretching off into the dark beyond their single street lamp. I've got a good map, but what can we do, Robert? Robert looked at her map. I came through here with Tommy. We set down gadgets by particular cabinets. Yes. Which ones? Robert looked again at the map floating in the air before him. The place was a maze, and the cabal had come in from a different direction. I, uh... In 2010, Robert had gotten lost in a shopping mall parking lot. After an hour, he still couldn't find his car. He'd ended up at mall security. That had been the first undeniable encounter with his mental decline. But the new me shouldn't have trouble remembering. The nearest is two rows that away, then jog right. They raced past two aisles, then over one to the right. Almost all the cabinet doors were open, their transport trays working to prep cargo. Miri waved at the pneumo tubes that branched above the cabinets. But see, nothing is actually shipping from here. Where's the next place? And they were running again, off toward his best guess. Ahead of them, something loomed against the ceiling. The Gen Gen launcher. Miri skittered to a stop and began shaking her spray can. Which one, Robert? All the cabinets around her were behaving like suspects. It's still two more rows, then five cabinets down. But I thought you said... Never mind. Miri walked past two more rows. Robert followed. She looked up at him. I... I'm not sure. He glared over the tops of the cabinets, trying to orient on the launcher, trying to force memory. She hesitated and then touched his arm. It's okay, Robert. Sometimes you can't remember. But things will get better for you. Wait, he said. I'm sure this is right. The pneumo tube behind the nearest had just received a shipping cartridge. Mouse boxes were rolling on board. So that means, um and Miri's hand slipped from his arm. She looked around and then up at him. Where are we? Maybe it hadn't been nerve gas. Maybe it was something worse. And Miri got the bigger dose. Above the cabinet, the pneumo hatch had closed. There was a pillowed thud, and the cartridge sped away. Another cartridge pulled into the siding above the cabinet. Another batch of mice rolled to meet it. It was out of reach. But I still understand what has to be done. Robert looked down at Miri and did his best to smile and lie. Oh, we're just on a tour, Miri. How about it? Would you like to climb on top of that cabinet? She looked up past him. I'm not a little girl, Robert. I don't climb on other people's property. Robert nodded and tried to hold his smile. But, Miri, this... This is just a game. And if we can stop the white thing with your... your game gun, then we win. You want to win, right? Now that brought a smile, full of pert intelligence. Of course. Why didn't you say it was a game? Huh. This looks like some kind of bioscience lab. Nice. She looked at where the transport was sliding the mouse boxes along. So what do you want me to do? Once she's up there, she'll forget all over again. I'll tell you when you get up there. He lifted from beneath her arms. Reach up. Grab the edge and I'll push. Miri giggled, but she did reach up, and Robert did push. She slid through the gap beneath the siding. Her spray can was just inches from the transport tray. Now what? Her voice came down to him. Yes, now what? You go to all the trouble to do something, and then you forget the point. Only this time he knew the point was something very important. Robert flailed, beginning to panic. Kara, I don't know. Hey, I'm not Kara. My name is Miri. Not my sister, my granddaughter. Robert stepped back from the cabinet and tried to make sense. Just shoot the spray can at the moving things, Miri. Okay, no problem. A sound that was pain spiked into his head. Over the cabinet, he had a glimpse of a strange hole that split the side of the UPX launcher. Nothing to do with Miri. The thought had barely registered when he was slammed backwards. Array 1 was in the Gen Gen launcher. The stealth launch vehicle had a good chance of making it out of the U.S. cordon. Array 2? 
Alfred's cameras showed that his strategy with the goose was working. Somehow they had found the one must cabinet that really mattered, but his improvised gas attack was taking effect. The two were moving with a kind of aimless uncertainty. He had time to prep the second load. He could get both out. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. USMC Elant has detected ballistic launcher power up in the labs. What can that be, Alfred? Close SM. Damn USMC. Alfred's analysts hadn't thought American electronic intelligence would be so sensitive. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Mitsuri, Open SM. It's just bad luck. The Gen Gen launcher is cycling through its nightly calibration. Close SM. That was a lie, but Alfred had his story ready. He launched a flurry of faked analysis, showering conclusions across Keiko and Gunberg's teams. After the fact, he'd blame the launch on a resurrected rabbit. Mitsuri, Arrow, Brown, Vaz, Open SM. But will the Americans believe that? Close SM. She popped up some windows, her best estimate of just when and how the USMC might respond to the launch prep. No time for the third cartridge. The Gen Gen launcher was loaded, the capacitor within 45 seconds of launch. If only the Americans would just dither a bit. Vaz, Arrow, Brown, Mitsuri, Open SM. I'm finished with cleanup. Heading for rendezvous. Close SM. Alfred took a last glance around. In fact, all his checklists were finally green. Across the room, the Orozco boy was sleeping peacefully. He would remember nothing of tonight, and his personal log had been artfully corrupted. Alfred stepped out of the room and proceeded down the hallway. There was lots of area lighting, the sort of thing you'd expect in a major system failure. Ah! The Marines had finally detected his network. They had killed his stealth aerobot. He still had contact with half a dozen mobiles scattered in the brush to the north. They were hunkered low, mainly trying to be very quiet and still maintain a net. The American assault grid was sweeping the area, destroying them one by one. The USMC mechs drifted down like a kind of black snow, unnoticed by the crowds, and visible to his robots only in the last instant before their destruction. He came out of the stairway, onto the first floor. Ahead was the main entrance. Five seconds till UPX launch. He could imagine the chaos on the American side, losing their top analyst right at the crisis point. This was sniper warfare, brought into modern times, and three more seconds delay would... His mil-spec contacts lost transparency, and he felt a flash of heat on his face. Alfred dived for the floor. When the shock hit, the building swayed, barely stable in its uncommunicating configuration. He lay still for a moment, watching. That had been a high-energy infrared laser punching straight through the roof of the Gen Gen lab some 2,000 meters away. He had a single direct view, a glimpse of trees silhouetted against a pearly glow, a rising cloud of steam and fog. Part of the haze was zapped vegetation. Most was damage suppression mist, designed to soak up the knife edges of reflected death. The Americans had fired 30 times in less than a second. Glints from those blasts would have splattered kilometers in all directions, invisible to the naked eye, but potentially blinding and blistering those same eyes. A second viewpoint came online. The target hillside looked like a miniature Mount Loa, a river of flowing rock that slumped down into the hillside. Flashes of light marked the ongoing work of thermal flechettes. Thunder pounded. So the American response had been prompt and decisive, cauterizing and sealing the launcher area, with minimum collateral damage. And all my dreams are ashes. His contacts had transparency again. Alfred came to his feet and ran out of Pilchner Hall. Ahead of him, people swirled in panic, first stunned by network failure, now dazzled by air laser glints. Get into the crowd. Even though he was shoulder to shoulder with humanity, for the first time this evening Alfred felt really alone. Some people around him stared upward, some were temporarily blinded, people were crying, others were counseling the sensible thing, get under cover, keep your gaze down and away from reflectors. In the midst of network failure, these people were reduced to literal word of mouth but that word was spreading. More and more people realized that for only the third or fourth time in recent history, their own country was under a military assault. So far, none of them had guessed that it was their own military's doing. Alfred kept his head down, his face covered. 
It wasn't a suspicious posture. Hundreds of others were cowering similarly. He shrank his communications down to a fuzzy static that conveyed only a few bits per second and that routed chaotically through his mechs. His ops gear was heavily shielded. To the USMC probes, it would seem like just another epiphany unit struggling to cope with the sudden failure of the public nets. All that might buy him ten more minutes. Long before then, the DHS analyst pool should recover from Alice's collapse and run a retrospective surveillance of the local video streams. Analysts obsessing on a data set that small were deadly effective. He could imagine their gleeful pursuit. See how the enemy mechs are clumped across from Pilchner Hall? Scan back to early in the evening. Who all has been near that building? Why, there's Goo's daughter going in, and a few minutes earlier, an Indian-looking fellow doing the same. Scan forward. No action till a minute ago, when that same Indian-looking fellow comes running out. Track him forward to the present, and my, my, there he is, trying his damnedest to seem an innocent bystander. In any case, tonight's Indo-European operation was beyond all deniability. And that was the minor disaster. For a few seconds, Alfred Vaz drifted in uncharacteristic despair. What about all my years of planning? What about saving the world? He had heard enough to know that Rabbit's accusations were in the PDF sent to Parker's laptop. Alfred would never complete his research program. Indeed, Rabbit had been the next very bad thing. The Carrot Greens in Mumbai had made the point, but I willfully ignored the evidence, so hoping I was to win with my plan. And yet, what of Rabbit now? Quite possibly its substantive evidence was indecipherable garbage. Conceivably, the minds behind Rabbit were reduced to ignorance. Then maybe, maybe, with all my leverage at external intelligence, I can survive to try again. Alfred moved back to the edge of the crowd and cautiously reached out to his network. He'd lost his link into the labs. For half a minute, there was nothing except a deadly snick and snack that sounded privately in his ears, marking the steady extermination of his little army. There. A route through his surviving devices back into Pilchner Hall. Tiny windows popped up and... He found a viewpoint, a single lab camera that had survived the air attack and looked down upon the Muss Array cabinet. The camera had suffered glitter damage, swaths of stuck pixels, but he could see enough. Collateral damage could be your friend. There might be nothing here to prove Rabbit's accusations. The blast from the Americans' attack on the launcher had knocked over his very special cabinet. The last group of mice had fallen along with it. Best of all, the Yanks' thermal bombs had flooded the area around the launcher with molten overburden. The lava had closed off the hole created by the attack, just as intended, but it had not stopped there. The glowing tarry tide had pushed out along the aisles and piled almost two meters deep in places. Its farthest extent lapped the fallen cabinet and covered all but a corner of that final batch of mouse boxes. There was no sign of the goose. Before the laser attack, they had been standing just beyond the current destruction. If he'd had more viewpoints, he might have tracked them down. But would that matter? Their jumbled memories were still a threat, but that was now beyond his control. Suddenly, Alfred realized he was smiling. Strange how, in the midst of disaster, he could be pleased that his two most persistent antagonists, not counting Rabbit, may he burn in hell, had probably survived. He was closer to the library now. Civilian rescue workers were in evidence, though the network support was probably provided by the Marines. Interrogation teams were not yet in action, and he'd found a backup aerobot to relay through. He got one fresh message before it was lost. Mitsuri, Arrow, Vaz, Open SM. Gunberg's analysis is almost complete. Please give us a few more minutes cover, Alfred. USMC is still focused on the labs. You have a clear run to your Bollywood team. Close SM. She marked a map with the cinema team's current location on the north edge of the crowds in the eucalyptus. The Bollywood crew and its automation were well prepared for tonight's operation, though the on-site people were not knowing participants. Alfred took a final check all around himself. He walked a few paces through the trees, and he was in the midst of his Bollywood crew. Mr. Ramachandran, we have lost all connectivity. The videotech's eyes were wide. Everything was fine, but now it is so very terrible. The crew were experts on the spectacular, but not the real. 
Alfred shifted into the persona of harried cinema exec. You have your cached videos, do you not? You forwarded the earlier contexts back home, did you not? Yes, but... They wanted to rush out from the trees to help the injured down by the library. That was for the best. In moments, Vaz would be one of the group again. Perhaps the DHS analysts were still in chaos. It would be amusing, and amazing too, if this cover got him past the USMC cordon and out of California. As he followed his cinema crew out into the open space around the library, he had only one remaining link to his millnet. It was past time to drop that bit of incrimination. But there was still intelligence streaming in. Terrible, chilling words that Alfred would never have been burdened with if he hadn't still been linked. Please, please don't do this to her. She's just a little girl. Goo. Alfred searched wildly in his only remaining view. Back in his physical person, he stumbled. The video tech grabbed his elbow, steadying him. Mr. Ramachandran, are you quite well? Were you blinded in the attack? Alfred had the presence of mind not to shake her off. I'm sorry. It's just all this destruction. We must help these poor people. Yes, but you must stay safe yourself. The tech guided him down to where the rest of the Bollywood crew was already helping the emergency workers. Her aid gave him cover to look carefully out from his underground viewpoint. The damage to the camera had partially healed. Some of the stuck pixels were flickering, and now he could see a little beyond the left of the fallen cabinet. The elder goo was pinned beneath. Lord, where was the other one? I didn't mean for this. He should say nothing, but his body betrayed him. Anonymous, Arrow, Robert Goo, Open SM. Where is your little girl? Close SM. Who is this? The voice screamed in his ear, then continued more quietly, more desperately. She's right here, unconscious, and I can't move her out of the way. Anonymous, Arrow, Robert Goo. Open SM. I'm sorry. Close SM. Alfred couldn't think of anything more to say. Dead, these two might marginally improve his own prospects. He looked angrily away from the viewpoint. Damn me. He had accomplished nothing this night except destroy good people. But how could he safely save them? Please, just tell the police. Don't let her burn. More spikes of overpressure, the sound of a thousand fragile things breaking, of heavy plastic tearing, bones being crushed. Robert didn't really hear it all. The bones getting crushed, that was distracting. Even the follow-up explosions and the heat went more or less unnoticed. Robert surfaced from introspection that might as well have been unconsciousness, except that it hurt a lot more. Miri was on her hands and knees. She was wailing. Grandpa! Grandpa! Say something, please! Grandpa! He twitched a hand, and she grabbed it. I'm so sorry, she said. I didn't mean to knock things over. Are you hurt? It was one of those questions that had an easy answer. Agony the size of an elephant was sitting on his right leg. Yes. But the rest of a clever answer was lost in the pain. Miri was crying, choking, very un like She turned and pushed at the cabinet that had him pinned. Robert took a deep breath, but that mainly made him dizzy. The cabinet's too heavy, Miri. Stay back from it. Why was the air so hot? The steady light was gone. Something like an open furnace glowed beyond the fallen equipment, where the sounds were all of popping and hissing. Kara! Miri! Come back from there! The little girl hesitated. Under the cabinet were the crushed remains of the mouse array that had been about to load. It wasn't going anywhere now. Miri reached down into the broken glass. Robert cricked his neck and saw a tiny face peering back into his, a mouse loose from its suction trap in the array. Ooh, Miri's voice squeaked. Hi, little guy. A laugh mixed with a sob. And you too. You each get a free pass. Robert saw more tiny faces as she freed other mice. The heads bobbed this way and that. They didn't seem to see him, and after a moment, they found something that was much more important in the mousely order of things, freedom. They ran around the girl's hands and away from the heat. Now Robert could see what caused the heat. 
a glowing white gob of syrup dripped over the wreckage, hissed into redness as it oozed down the side of the fallen cabinet. Kara gave a panicked cry and came back to him. What is that? The hissing and spattering. If it could make it over that barrier, it must be dammed up several feet deep. I don't know, but you've got to get away. Yes. Come on. The girl pulled at his shoulders. He pushed with her, ignoring the tearing pain in his leg. That moved him four or five inches. Then he was stuck more solidly than before. And now the heat was even more distracting than the crushed leg. Robert's mind hopped from one horror to the other, trying to keep its sanity. He looked across at his crying sister. I'm sorry I made you cry, Kara. She just cried harder. You've got to run now. She didn't reply, but the crying stopped. She looked at him, uncomprehending, then slid back from the furnace heat. Go, go. But then she said, I don't feel good, and lay down just beyond his reach. Robert looked back at the oozing rock. It had swamped the bottom of the cabinet. Another inch or two and it would slop onto his little sister. He reached out, snagged a long shard of ceramic, and wedged it against the glowing tide. There were more explosions, but not so loud. Up close there was just the smell and sound of things cooking. He tried to remember how he had come to be here. Someone had done this to him and Kara, and surely they must be listening now. Please, he said into the glowing dark. Please don't do this to her. She's just a little girl. No reply, just the terrible sounds and the pain. And then the strangest thing, letters scrolling across his gaze. Anonymous, Arrow, Robert Goo, Open SM. Where is your little girl? Close SM. Who is this? She's right here, unconscious and I can't move her out of the way. Anonymous, Arrow, Robert Goo, Open SM. I'm sorry. Close SM. He waited, saw nothing more. Please, just tell the police. Don't let her burn. But the silent watcher was gone. Kara lay unmoving. Can't she feel the heat? It took everything he had to hold the shard in place. Then... Professor Gu, is that you? It was some pestering student. There were so many afterimages he couldn't be sure, but someone was there, partly submerged in the molten ooze. It's me, Zulfi Sharif, sir. That name was familiar, a weaselly arrogant student, but now his skin wasn't green. That meant something, didn't it? I've been trying for some hours to call you, sir. It's never been this bad before. I... I fear I may have been truly hijacked. I'm so sorry. He was mostly submerged in the glowing rock, a ghost. You're injured, said the ghost. Call the police, said Robert. Yes, sir, but where are you? Never mind, I see. I'll get help straight. The glowing rock dribbled over Robert's makeshift dam onto his arm. He descended into a pit of mindless pain. 33. Freedom on a Very Long Leash The new annex to Crick's clinic was less than five years old, but the spirit of the place was straight out of the last century, when hospitals were great imposing places where people had to go for a chance at survival. There was still some need for such places. The most extreme intensive care units were not something you could pack into a first aid box and sell to home users. And, of course, there were always tragic cases of incurable, debilitating diseases. Some small portion of humanity might always end up in extended-care nursing homes. The new annex satisfied certain other needs. Those occurred to Lieutenant Colonel Robert Goo, Jr. every day when he drove onto the hospital grounds. Every day since the debacle at UCSD, he'd pull into the Crick's traffic circle, get out, and look down along the cliffs and beaches toward La Jolla, the clinic was just a short hike up the hill from some of the most fashionable resort properties in the world. Just a few miles inland were the biotech labs that ringed UCSD, perhaps the most prestigious source of medical magic in the world. Of course, those labs could have been on the other side of the world for all that their location made any real difference. But psychologically and traditionally, 
This joint nearness to resort luxury and magical cure was a lure for the very richest of the very ill. Bob Goo's wife, daughter, and father were not stuck here because they were rich. Once you walked past the imposing, and totally real, main entrance, you had privacy. In this case, the privacy was a combination of the clinic's basic design and the fact that Uncle Sam had taken a special interest in certain patients. What better place to keep sensitive cases hidden from contact than in a resort hospital? The press flitted around beyond the walls and speculated, without having grounds for a civil liberties complaint. It could be a very good cover. Bob hesitated just outside the main entrance. Oh, Alice. For years he had lived in fear that Jit would take her. For years he and she had fought about the limits of duty and honor and the meaning of Chicago. Now the long-imagined worst had happened, and he found himself quite unprepared. He visited her every day. The doctors were not encouraging. Alice Goo was stuck under more layers of jit than these guys had ever seen. So what did they know? Alice was conscious. She talked to him, desperate gibberish. He held her in his arms and begged her to come back. For unlike Dad and Miri, Alice was not a federal detainee. Alice was a prisoner in her own mind. Today, Bob had an official assignment at Crick's. The last of the detainee interrogations, that is, the last of the debriefings, were complete. Dad was scheduled to be awake by noon, Mary an hour later. Bob could spend some time with them, in the virtual company of Eve Mallory, a DHS officer who fronted for the investigation teams. At 1,200 hours, Bob was standing in front of a very old-fashioned-looking wooden door. By now he knew that such things were never faked at Crick's, and he'd have to turn the doorknob if he wanted to go in. Eve, Arrow, Bob, Open SM. We're especially interested in this interview, Colonel, but keep it short. Stick to the points in our memo. Close SM. Bob nodded. For a moment he didn't know who he was most angry at, his father or the jerks from DHS. He contented himself with pulling the door open without knocking, and stepping abruptly into the hospital suite. Robert Goose Sr. was pacing the windowless room like a caged teenager. You'd never guess he'd recently had one leg crushed and the other fractured. The docs were good at fixing that kind of thing. As for the rest, well, his burns were hidden by medical pajamas. The old man's gaze snapped up as Bob came in the room, but his words were more desperate than angry. Son, is Mary okay? Eve, Arrow, Bob, Open SM. Speak up, Colonel. You can tell him everything about your daughter. Close SM. Miri is fine, Dad. He waved at the plush chairs by the table at the side of the suite. But the old man just kept bouncing around the room. Thank God, thank God. The last I remember was the heat and lava crawling toward her. He looked down at his pajamas and suddenly seemed very distracted by what he saw. You're at Crick's in La Jolla, Dad. Miri wasn't hurt in the fire. Your left arm was pretty much destroyed. The flesh had burned down to the bone in places, burned all the way through the lower forearm. Robert Sr. touched the loose sleeve. Yes, the doctors told me. He turned and dropped into one of the chairs. That's about all they've told me. You're sure Miri's okay? You saw her? The old man never behaved like this. There was strain all around his eyes. Or maybe he's just reacting to the look on my face. Bob sat down across from his father. I've seen her. I'll be talking to her later this afternoon. Her worst problem is some mental confusion about what happened in the labs. Oh. Then more softly. Oh. He sat mulling the news, and then he was fidgeting again. How long have I been out? There's so much you need to know, Bob. Maybe you should get some of your law enforcement buddies in here. Eve, Arrow, Bob, Open SM. So he doesn't remember the debrief? I didn't think we were that good. Close SM. There's no need, Dad. There may be follow-up questioning about particular points, but we've dredged up all the dirty little secrets. You've been under interrogation for several days. His father's eyes widened slightly. After a moment, he gave a nod. 
Yeah, all those weird dreams. So that means you know about... about my own problems? Yes. Robert looked away. There are strange bad guys out there, Bob. The mysterious stranger, the one who hijacked Zulfi Sharif. He was on my case all the time. I've never known anyone who could manipulate me as he did. Can you imagine someone riding on your shoulder all the time telling you what to do? Eve, Arrow, Bob, open SM. Just as well not to follow up on the rabbit. Close SM. Bob nodded. Rabbit, that was the name they had pried out of the Indo-Europeans, might be something new under the sun. Rabbit had compromised the she. Scenario building within the DHS and USMC had actually been in support of Rabbit. The Indians and the Europeans and the Japanese had a lot to answer for, but Rabbit's scam might never have been detected if they hadn't launched their revocation attack against the creature. But how had Rabbit managed its trick? What else could it do? Those were burning questions, but not ones to discuss with your traitorous father. We're taking care of the loose ends, Dad. Meantime, you have results and consequences to catch up on. Yes. Consequences. Robert's right hand played nervously with the chair's fine upholstery. Prison? The words came out softly, almost a request. Eve, Arrow, Bob, open SM. No way. We want this guy running loose. Close SM. No jail time, Dad. Officially, you and your pals were part of a campus demonstration that got wildly out of hand. Less officially, well, the rumor we're peddling is that you helped stop terrorist lab sabotage. That would be another job for the ever-useful Friends of Privacy. Robert shook his head. Stopping the bad guys, that part was Miri's idea. Yes, it was. He gave his father a stony look. I was officer of the watch that night. Eve, Arrow, Bob, open SM. Careful, Colonel. Close SM. But the warning was empty. The interrogation strategists had agreed that Robert should learn part of this. The only problem was how to tell Dad without putting a fist into his face. Here? In San Diego? Bob nodded. For Conus Southwest, but all our action was here. Alice was my top analyst that night. He hesitated, trying to hold down his rage. Did you ever guess that it was Alice who kept me from booting your ass out of the house? I... He swept his hand through unruly hair. She always seems so remote. Do you know what jit stick is, Dad? An abrupt nod. Yes. Carlos Rivera gets stuck in Chinese. Is he okay? The old man looked up, and his face turned ashen. Alice? Alice collapsed right in the middle of your adventure. We have good evidence that the... Eve, Arrow, Bob, open SM. No details, please. Close SM. Bob continued with barely a hesitation. She's still stuck. Bob. I never meant her any harm. I was just so desperate. But maybe, maybe I set her up. He looked into Bob's eyes and then away. We know, Dad. It came out in your debrief. And yes, you did set her up. DHS had investigated the goo home and personal logs as much as they had anything at UCSD. They even had pictures of the bot Dad had used in the front bathroom. But we still don't know exactly what it did. India and Japan and Europe blamed Rabbit and Rabbit had been reduced to rumors and unreadable chunks of stale cash. Eve, Arrow, Bob, open SM. Heh, we'll figure it out. A network attack on a bio-prepped victim. That's a technology that's way too interesting to ignore. Close SM. Dad's head was bowed. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Bob stood up abruptly. It was something of an achievement that his voice came out calm and steady. You'll be out of here later today. Meantime, get something to wear and catch up with the outside world. For a while, you'll still live with us in Fallbrook. We want you to take up... 
right where you left off. I'll tell Mary about Alice. Bob, it won't work. Mary could never forgive. That's probably true. But she's going to get the abbreviated version. After all, your part in the attack on Alice is circumstantial. And it's hidden behind security that even Mary Goo is unlikely to penetrate. I strongly suggest that you don't spell things out for her. And so Lieutenant Colonel Robert Goo Jr. had performed the duty that he'd been assigned here, and now he could get out. He walked across the room, reached for the door. Something made him turn and look back. Robert Goo Sr. was watching with anguish in his eyes. It was a look Bob had seen before, on other faces. There had been times over the years when youngsters in his command had fucked totally up. Young people get desperate. Young people do terrible, foolish, selfish things, sometimes with terrible consequences. But this is my old man. There was no desperation, no inexperience that could excuse him. And yet, Bob had watched the CDC team's video as they followed Sharif's direction down into the labs. He had seen his father and daughter lying on the floor, just beyond the UPX crater. He had seen the way Robert's arm was extended, how it damned the curdling stone just inches from Miri's face. And so, despite the old man's monstrous fuck-up, there was still something left to say. Thanks for saving her, Dad. Take up just where you left off, Bob had said. At Fairmont High, that was almost feasible. Juan and Robert had already taken their written final exams, then been out of action through Christmas and New Year's. Now they were back, and just in time for what most students considered the scariest part of the semester, the parents' night demonstration of their team projects. Problems of life and death and horrid guilt devolved to worrying about making a fool of oneself in front of some children and their parents. Amazingly, Juan Orozco was still talking to him. Juan didn't know quite what had happened at UCSD. His memories had been gutted even more systematically than Miri's. Now he was piecing things together from the news, trying his best to separate the truth from friends of privacy lies. I don't remember anything after Miri and I got to campus, and the police are still holding what I wore. I can't even see the last few minutes of my diary. The kid waved his arms with the same desperation Robert had seen in him the first day they met. Robert patted his shoulder. They still have Miri's log, too. I know. I asked her. Tears welled up in the boy's eyes. She doesn't remember either. We were getting to be friends, Robert. We wouldn't have gone after you together if she couldn't trust me. Sure. Well, now she treats me like when we first met, pushing me away. She thinks I must have chickened out, and that's why she had to find you by herself. And maybe I was chicken. I don't remember. Lena, Arrow, Juan, Shu, Open SM. Give her time, Juan. Mary's distracted by what's happened, especially to her mother. I think she blames herself for that, and maybe all of us. I know you wouldn't chicken out. Close SM. Lena, Arrow, Shu, Open SM. But why he's asking the SOB for comfort is beyond me. Close SM. Juan looked away from Robert for a moment, gradually seemed to get himself back together. Robert gave the boy an awkward pat on the back. Comforting others was definitely not part of his former resume. She'll come around, Juan. She didn't call you a coward when we were underground. She was very worried about you. Just give her some time. He cast around for some distraction. Meantime, do you want to waste all the work we put in this semester? What about the kids in Boston and down south? We have to catch up on our demo preparation. Lena, Arrow, Shu, Open SM. Can you believe this jerk? All he wants is to trick some more help out of the boy. Close SM. Robert's attempt at humor was feeble, but Juan looked up at Robert and gave a creditable smile. Yes, gotta keep track of the important things. Bob and Miri didn't come to Fairmont High for the vocational track demos. At least, they weren't physically visible, and Robert could tell that Juan Orozco was searching hard. Miri's at Crick's clinic tonight, Juan. Her mother should be coming home from the hospital. 
Bob had seemed just as happy that Robert had another commitment this evening. The boy brightened. But maybe she'll peek in here, right? In fact, this was rather a big deal for Fairmont, but not for good reasons. The popular press had built an enormous pile of speculation around the events at UCSD, and Friends of Privacy lies surrounded and embedded those speculations in conspiracies unending. The rumors contaminated everything and everyone associated with that night. Robert had dredged the public record, first to try to discover what had happened to him that night under UCSD, and then to see what people thought had happened. Robert and the Cabal showed up in most of the theories, often as the picaresque heroes Bob had mentioned. But there were other theories. Robert had never heard of Timothy Wynne, but there were journalists who claimed that Wynne and Robert had engineered everything that happened in the riot and the underground. Robert had become very good at blocking paparazzi mail, but the notoriety was blowing over. His ratings were declining with a half-life of about five days. Nevertheless, he spent a lot of time at Fairmont High, where the school rules banned the most intrusive visibles. Tonight, at the demos, that ban was in force. The bleachers were jammed with ticketed visitors, families of students and their guests, including virtual presences. Most of these people had no interest in Robert Goo, but if you looked at the network stats, a lot of people were invisibly watching. The vocational program was not the gem of Fairmont High. Most of these kids could not master the latest cutting-edge applications, and most of the retread students were even less competent. On the other hand, Chumlig had asserted in an unguarded moment that parents preferred the vocational demos, mainly because they made more sense to them than what other children were doing. The teams were duos and trios, but they were allowed to use solutions dredged from all over the world. Demo night didn't begin until after sunset, so meshing overlays with reality would be relatively easy. Chumlig wouldn't have given the regular students such a crutch. Those demos lasted two days, and would not begin until a week after the vocational track students had done their best. That was a kindly interval, a week for the vocational students to bask in their achievements. Tonight, the audience sat on the west side of the soccer field, leaving the east free for whatever grandiose imagery might be created. Robert sat with Juan Orozco right down on the sidelines, with the other performers. They all knew the order of their execution, or performance, their private views hung little signs over the field showing how much time remained in the current demo and who was up next. There had been no democratic choosing of the performance order. Louise Chumlig and the other teachers had their own ideas, and they ruled. Robert smiled to himself. In this, his old people sense hadn't deserted him. Even without knowing the details of each project, he knew who had a strong project and who did not. He knew who was the most frightened of getting out in public and in person. So did Chumlig. Her play order was an orchestration, exercising each kid to his or her limits. Amazingly, that ordering also produced a pretty good show. The Radner twins started out. For these two, the east side of the campus was not enough. They had some kind of wacky suspension bridge. It looked like the Firth of Fourth Railway Bridge, but scaled up, that put down steel caissons on each side of the bleachers, and then climbed higher and higher into the northeast till it broke into the departing daylight. Seconds passed, and the construction reappeared out of the southwest, their 19th century masterpiece making a virtual orbit of the earth. The climax was the roaring passage of vast steam-powered trains across the sky. The bleachers shook with the apparent power of the locomotives. Hey, said Juan, and gave Robert a nudge. That's new. They must have figured out some of the building maintenance protocols. If the Radners had not been targeted by the library riot rumor mill before, they were now. Robert guessed that would please the twins just fine. Most of the demos were arty visual things, but there were also students who had built gadgets. Doris Schley and Mahmoud Kwan had built a ground effect vehicle that could walk up the steps of the bleachers. They tipped it over the top, there was an explosion of sound, and then it touched down without breaking anything. Juan stood up from his place at the bottom of the bleachers to turn and watch with his own eyes. He cheered Schley and Quan, then plunked himself back down. Wow. A ground effect parachute. But I bet Miss Chumling doesn't give him more than a B. His voice rose into a standard Louise Chumling imitation. What you did was scarcely more than off-the-shelf engineering. But he was still grinning. 
They both knew that a B was better than what most of the image plays were going to get. There were even kids who tried for the cutting edge, projects that seemed a little like what Miri said her friends did. There were two new materials demos, an extreme elastic band, and some kind of water filter. The elastic was not spectacular, until you realized there was no trick imagery. Two boys that Robert hardly knew did the demo. They stood twenty feet apart, swinging a large doll between them. The mannequin was suspended from a strand of their magical glop. The strand wasn't simply a strong composite. Somehow the boys could change its physical characteristics by the way they squeezed the ends. Sometimes it behaved like a giant spring, whipping the doll back to the center line. Other times it stretched like taffy, and they swung the dummy in wide arcs. Their demo got the biggest cheers of all. On the other hand, the water filter demo was just a magnified image of a garden hose feeding into the filter. Above them, the students had floated an enormous graphic that showed just how their programmable zeolite could search for user-specified impurities. There were no sound effects, and the graphics were slow-moving and crude. Robert looked up into the sky and then back at the girls. They're going to get an A, aren't they? Juan rocked back on his elbows. He was smiling, but enviously. Yeah, it's the sort of thing Chumlig likes. And then his basic honesty forced him to add, Lisa and Sandy never bother to polish their graphics, but I heard they've got a buyer for that water filter. I bet they're the only vocational kids who make real money off their demo. We're next, kiddo, said Robert. The only evidence that Juan understood was the way his gaze fixed on their private clock. Shu, Arrow, Juan, Open SM. You'll do fine, Juan. Close SM. Juan, Arrow, Shu, Open SM. Is Miri watching? Close SM. Juan and Robert were last, the only part of the schedule that was really beyond Chumlig's control. That had not been due to any Juan Robert cleverness. It had been a consequence of the fact that their demo involved outside groups who had their own scheduling problems. Juan hesitated a second more. Then he was running out onto the soccer field, waving up a phantom stage parallel to and facing the bleachers. Their performers filed in from both sides of the stage. The imagery was subdued, with no impossibilities. These were real people and real musical instruments, as Juan's magnified voice explained to the audience. Hello, hello, hello! Juan was huckster enthusiastic, and to Robert's ears, clearly panicked out of his mind. Robert could have handled the MC role, or they could have recorded this spiel, maybe have had Juan lip-sync it, but that was just another way to lose points with Chumlig. So Juan made do with his live, cracking voice and words that came out with awkward pauses and forced bravado. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the Orchestra of the Americas, created especially for you this evening from the Charles River High School Orchestra and Chorus, Cheap Net Live from Boston, and... He waved to his left. The Gimnasio Clásico de Magallanes, also Cheap Net Live, but from Punta Arenas, Chile. Both sides of the stage were full now, 200 teenagers in school uniforms of red on the north and checkered green on the south, students who had their own far cooperation requirements to satisfy. Altogether, they comprised parts of two choruses and two orchestras, 7,000 miles apart, with only cheap net in between. Persuading them to try this scheme had been a miracle in itself. Success would look mundane to outsiders, yet failure was a real possibility. Well, things didn't go too badly in rehearsal. And now, Juan grabbed for still greater import, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the Orchestra of the Americas will perform their very own adaptation of Beethoven's EU Anthem with lyrics by Orozco and Gu and network synchrony by Gu and Orozco. He gave a hammy bow and ran back to the sidelines to sit by Robert. Sweat was streaming down his face, and he looked pale. You did good, kid, said Robert. Juan just nodded, shaking. The hybrid orchestra began to play. Now it was up to these kids and Robert's jitter algorithm. The sounds of cellos and basses rose from the young musicians in Boston and from the other end of the world. The kids' adaptation had a faster beat than the usual EU style, and every note came across hundreds of hops of randomly changing networkery with delays that could vary by several hundred milliseconds. There was the same synchronization problem that had made Winnie's choir at the library such a noisy affair. 
Juan's lyrics climbed up, the chorus from the north singing his English version, and the one from the south his Spanish. Their student collaborators had created a flexible work with its own conductor interface. That helped some. Plus, they were surprisingly good musicians and singers. But the performance still needed the magic of the adaptive delays that Robert's scheme injected into the transmissions. Well, okay, and maybe also the far deeper magic that was Beethoven's. Robert listened. His contribution was not perfect. In fact, this was worse than the rehearsals. Too many people were watching and too suddenly. He'd been afraid this might happen. The problem was not bandwidth. He glanced at the variance plot he had put in his private view. It showed the presence of several million people suddenly observing, grabbing resources so fast that they confused his poor little prediction program, and changed the nature of what was observed. And yet the sink survived. The hybrid did not fragment. Ten seconds to go. The performance hit some slightly ragged crescendos, and then, by some miracle, everything came together for the last two seconds. Juan's lyrics ended, and the central melody swept into silence. The joint orchestra chorus looked out at the audience. They were smiling, some perhaps a little embarrassed, but they had brought it off. There was applause, wildly enthusiastic from some quarters. Poor Juan looked absolutely drained. Fortunately, he didn't have to venture out on the field to wind things up. The performers were making their bows and trooping to the north and south ends of the stage, back to their respective corners of the world. Juan's smile was a little sickly as he waved to the local audience. His voice came sideways to Robert. Hey, I don't care what grade it gets. We did it and we're done. 34. The British Museum and the British Library the kids rushed off the bleachers, only slightly impeded by the fact that Chumlig and company could review the evening and determine just who had been unacceptably bumptious. Juan and Robert were slower, hanging with the other demo students and exchanging congratulations. Grades for the demos wouldn't be available for another twenty hours or so. They would have plenty of time to agonize over their failings. Nevertheless, Louise Chumlig looked quite cheerful, giving each student her congratulations, and deflecting all manner of questions about whether this or that deficit should truly be of any grading significance. Still no sign of Miri or Bob. Robert's attention was filled with the kids and Chumlig and Juan Orozco, this last person alternating between hysterical relief and the conviction of failure. So it was without forewarning that Robert found himself face to face, almost nose to nose, with Winston Blount. Behind the former dean, Tommy Parker was standing hand in hand with Xu Shang. Now, that was surely the strangest pairing to come out of this adventure. The little guy was grinning ear to ear. He flashed a thumbs up at Robert. But for the moment, Blount had all his attention. Robert had seen little of Tommy and Winnie since that night at UCSD. They and Carlos had spent several days at Crick's clinic. As far as Robert could tell, certain deals had been made, much as in his own case and now they were loose. The official story was just what Bob had said. The cabal activity had been a protest that got out of hand, but they had never intended to damage laboratory equipment, and they were all terribly sorry for that. The unofficial tales of heroic sacrifice helped explain why the university and the biolabs seemed happy not to pursue the matter. If the elder cabal kept its collective mouth shut, there would be no consequences. Just now there was an odd smile on Winnie's face. He nodded to Juan and reached out to shake Robert's hand. Even though I've dropped out of Fairmont, I still have family here. Doris Schley is my great-grandniece. Oh, she did well, Winston. Thank you, thank you. And you... Winnie hesitated. In years past, praise for Robert Goo came from all quarters, and it had often been used as a club to beat down Winston Blount. You wrote something wonderful there, Robert. Those lyrics. I would never have imagined such a thing writing on Beethoven and in English and Spanish. It was... art. He shrugged, as if waiting for a sarcastic put-down. It wasn't my work, Winston. And maybe this is a put-down, but I don't mean it that way. One here did the lyrics. We collaborated all through the semester, but on this I let him go, just critiqued the final effort. Honestly, and this Chumlig character is the death of lies, 
Honestly, Juan is responsible. Oh? Winnie rocked back, then really seemed to notice Juan. He reached over to shake the boy's hand. It was beautiful, son. And a sideways, still incredulous glance at Robert. Do you know, Robert, in its way, that was as good as what you did in the old days? Robert thought a second, listening to Juan's lyrics with his imagination the way he used to listen to his own poetry. No, I was better than that. Much better. But not better like being in a different world. If the old Robert could have seen these lyrics, well, the old Robert couldn't abide second raiders. Given half an excuse, he would have made sure that Juan's art died a borning. You're right. Juan made a beautiful thing. He hesitated. I don't know what the years have done, Winston. Juan looked back and forth between them. There was the beginning of shining pride on his face, though he seemed to guess that there were words unspoken going between Winnie and Robert. Winnie nodded. Yes, lots of things have changed. The crowd was diminishing, but that just meant that some of the kids thought they could run around even faster. They were getting jostled by the flow of bodies and the ever louder shouting and laughter. So, if you didn't do the lyrics, what was your contribution, Robert? Aha, I did the time lag synchronization. As much as it could be done. Really? Winnie was trying to be polite, but even after his own choir experience, he didn't seem especially impressed. Well, it had been a bit ragged. Shu, Arrow, Lena, Open SM. For God's sake, say something to him, Lena. Close SM. Lena, Arrow, Shu. Open SM. Buzz off, you. Close SM. Shu, Arrow, Lena. Open SM. Then I will speak for you. Close SM. After a few more pleasantries, Winnie took off in the direction of the Schley family, Tommy and Shu Shang in tow. But Robert noticed a line of golden text drifting out behind Shang. Shu, Arrow, Robert. Open SM. That was great, Robert. Close SM. Juan was oblivious of Shang's silent message. Dean Blount didn't understand your part in our project, did he? No. But he liked what he did understand. It doesn't matter. You and I both did better than we thought we could. Yes, we really did. Juan led him back along the bleachers. Even if Bob and Miri weren't here, Juan's own parents were. Greetings and congratulations all around, though the Orozcos still didn't know what to make of Robert Goo. A clot of family and friends remained on the soccer field for some time. More than anything else, the parents seemed faintly surprised by their children. They loved the little klutzes, but they thought they knew their limits. Somehow Chumlig had transformed them, not into supermen, but into clever creatures who could do things the parents themselves had never mastered. It was a time for pride and a little uneasiness. Mary was still out of sight. Poor Juan. And I hope Alice got home okay. One-armed, he wasn't quite good enough to check that in mid-flight. Robert pressed into the densest part of the crowd, the folks swirling close around Louise Chumlig. She looked happy and tired, and mostly she denied responsibility. I just showed my students how to use what they have and what the world has. He reached across, managed to catch her hand. Thanks. Chumlig looked up at him, a crooked smile on her face. She held on to his hand for a moment. You, my very strangest child, you were almost the reverse of the problem I had with the others. How's that? For everyone else, I had to make them reach out to learn what they were. But you, first you had to give up what you had been. Her smile was fleetingly sad. Be sorry for what you lost, Robert, but be happy with what you are. All along she knew. But someone else had her attention, and she was gaily assuring them that all the rest of the school year would be even more exciting than what had gone before. Robert left Juan and the others when speculation turned to what the regular demos would be like. The kids didn't want to believe that they could be outdone, not after tonight. Robert spotted two familiar figures on his walk back to the traffic circle. I thought you were with Winston, he said. We were, said Tommy. But we came back. Wanted to congratulate you on your music sync gimmick. Xu Shang nodded agreement. 
of the two only she was wearing. A congrats logo floated out from her. Poor Tommy was still lugging around his laptop, though whatever remained inside surely belonged to the secret police. Thanks, I'm proud of it, but emphasize the word gimmick. No one really needs to sync manual music across thousands of miles of cheap net. And basically, I just took advantage of routing predictabilities plus knowledge of the music being played. Plus some timing analysis of the individual performers, right, right, said Tommy. Yes. Plus some counter jitter you inserted, said Shu. Robert hesitated. You know, it was fun. Tommy laughed. You should do some ego surfing. Your hack was noticed. Back when I was young, you could have got a patent off it. Nowadays... Shu patted Tommy's shoulder. Nowadays, it should be worth a decent grade in a high school class. You and I, we have things to learn, Thomas. Tommy made a grumbling noise. She means I should be learning to wear. He glanced at the young-looking woman. I never dreamed that X Xiang would end up saving my life. But of course she did it by getting us all arrested. Lena, Arrow, Shu, Open SM. Parker is afraid to try new things, even when he brags about the future. Close SM. They walked in silence for a few steps. There were more golden words from Xiang. She was getting better and better at silent messaging. Shu, Arrow, Robert, Open SM, Sigh. Tommy is old, and all the medicine hasn't helped him that much. He's afraid to try new things. Close SM. Robert stifled a startled glance at the woman. Since when had the geek become a parlor shrink? But she could be right about Tommy. Tommy was surely oblivious of all the sming, but a familiar crafty grin was spreading across his face. What? Robert finally said. Just thinking. Our UCSD op was the biggest and most dangerous I've ever been part of. We got used, yeah. But you know, it was like a lot of these modern what's-its, these affiliances. We contributed, and in one way we got what we were aiming for. Robert thought of the stranger's promises. How is that? We nailed the Huertas Librarium project. But the library books are all consumed. Tommy shrugged. I kind of like the library militant vision. The point is, we terminally embarrassed Huertas. That's a triumph? They were walking along the traffic circle now, followed by a hopeful automobile. Yep. You can't stop progress, but we stopped Huertas long enough for other events to come to our rescue. He glanced at Robert. You haven't heard? You wear all that fancy equipment and you can't keep up with news. Tommy didn't wait for a reply. You see, Huertas was in such an awful rush for a reason. It turns out the Chinese were chewing up the British Museum and Library faster than we ever guessed. And the Chinese have years of experience in semi-non-destructive digitization. They're positively gentle compared to Huertas's shredder operation. They made the San Diego effort look foolish, and they even got haptic data off non-book exhibits. There's clear sky between them and everyone else, including the Google archives. Anyway, we stalled Huertas by a few days, long enough that he can't claim any sort of priority. And it was long enough so that the Chinese were able to frost the cake. Tommy reached into his jacket and pulled out a three-inch square piece of plastic. Here, a present for you that cost me all of $19.99. Robert held up the dark plastic. It looked a lot like the diskettes he'd used on his old PC at the turn of the century. He pointed a query at it. Labels floated in the air. Data card, 128 petabyte capacity, 97% in use. There was more, but Robert just looked back at Tommy. Do people still use removables like this? Just paranoid, proprietary, and old farts like me. It's a nuisance to carry around, but I have a reader right here in my laptop. Of course. The data is all online, along with a lot of cross-analysis that the Chinese will be charging you extra for. But even if you don't have a card reader, I thought you'd be interested in holding this in your own hot little hands. Ah. Robert peeked at the top directory. It was like standing on a very high mountaintop. So this is the British Museum and Library.
as digitized and databased by the Chinese Inframagical Coalition. The haptics and artifact data are low res to make it all fit on one data card. But the library section is 20 times as big as what Max Huerta sucked out of UCSD. Leaving aside things that never got into a library, that's essentially the record of humanity up through 2000. The whole pre-modern world. Robert hefted the plastic card. It doesn't seem like very much. Tommy laughed. Well, it's not. Robert started to hand it back, but Tommy waved him off. Like I said, it's a present. Put it on the wall where you can remind yourself that it's all we ever were. But if you really want to see it, just look on the net. The Chinese have it pretty well meshed, and their special servers are really clever. Tommy stepped back and motioned to the car that was trailing them. The rear door opened, and he waved Shu in ahead of him. For a weird instant, Tommy looked like an old rake with some sweet young thing. Just another image from the past that had nothing to do with the truth. So Huertas is out of the shredding business, and the Chinese promise their follow-ups will be even gentler than what they did to the British library. Imagine soft, pinky robot hands patiently picking over all the libraries and museums of the world. They'll be cross-checking, scanning for annotations, giving whole new generations of academic types like Zulfi Sharif something to hang their degrees on. He waved at Robert. Hi-ho! It was almost midnight when Xu Xiang got back to Rainbow's End. Lena was still up. She was in the kitchen, fixing some kind of snack. Lena's osteoporosis forced her to lean so far forward that her face was just a few inches off the table. It looked strange, but the wheelchair and the kitchen's design gave her plenty of freedom to maneuver. Xu eased into the room, feeling entirely embarrassed. Sorry for cutting you out, Lena. The other twisted around to give her a direct look. There was a lopsided grin on her face. Hey, no problem. You young people need your privacy. She waved for Xiu to sit down and have something to eat. Yes, well, Tommy isn't really so young. She felt a blush coming on. I, um, don't mean physically. He wants to keep up with progress, but he just can't cope with everything that means. Lena shrugged. Tommy's mind is better than some. She grabbed a sandwich off her plate and gave it a munch. Do you think he'll ever get his edge back? Could be. Science marches on. And even if that doesn't help in Parker's case, we can give him pushes in the right direction. A big part of his problem is that life was too easy for him when he was young. He's too ornery to try anything that's really hard for him. She jabbed a hand in Shu's direction. Eat up. Shu nodded and reached for a sandwich. They had been over this before. In fact, it had been such discussions that had made all the difference for a certain Dr. X Shang. But maybe she had more on the ball than Tommy. Her chief problem in the near future might be in avoiding government job offers. Shu bit into the sandwich. Peanut butter and jelly. But not bad, really. Have you had a chance to do your thing with the various people we saw today? Play shrink, you mean? Yeah, I reviewed your epiphany log. I posted some anonymous consults. The advice we gave Carlos Rivera was fine. He's got an ongoing problem, but that's life. As for Juan, we've done our best there, at least for the moment. Shu smiled around a mouthful of peanut butter and jelly. It had taken her some time to realize what a genius Lena was. After all, psychiatry was such a soft specialty. Lena said little Mary loved to view her grandmother as some kind of female wizard. She claimed to know that even though the girl never announced the fact. Now Shu had realized Lena was everything Miri imagined, at least metaphorically. I've never understood other people, but with Lena seeing out of my eyes and chatting in my ear, I am learning. There were still mysteries. I don't understand why your granddaughter is pushing Juan away. Sure, the kids don't remember what really happened in Pilchner Hall, but we know they were coming to be friends. If we could only get Miri's logs... What the government was still withholding. Lena didn't answer directly. You know Alice is home from hospital? Yes. I caught the fact from you, no details. There won't be any details. Alice was sick, and now she's better. In fact, 
I've known for a long time that Alice plays dice for her own soul. She nearly lost it this time, and somehow that's related to my ex-husband's grand screw-up at UCSD. I think Alice will recover. That should help Juan with Mary. Lena sat back in her chair, or rather, she let the chair tilt into a different posture. On her own, Lena couldn't really straighten up. We've talked about this before. Mary can be stubborn to the point of being an asshole. She inherited that trait from the SOB, skipping a generation over Bob. And now that stubbornness has latched onto some deep-down guilt. Subconsciously, Mary feels that she and Juan messed up and did this terrible thing to Alice. Um, that doesn't really sound like science, Lena. I'm sparing you the technicalities. Shu nodded. You get results. There are people at Fairmont High who think I'm some sort of human relations genius. Me. Lena reached her hand a few inches across the table, as far as her twisted bones could go. Shu took the hand gently in her own. We've made a good team, haven't we? said Lena. Yes. It wasn't just Lena's way with people. It wasn't just saving Tommy and his friends. There had been those dark days at the beginning of her time at Fairmont, when she was sure she could never come back, and Lena wasn't so happy-go-lucky either. Together they had climbed into the daylight. Shu looked at the little old lady who was ten years younger than herself. Together Lena and I have become something rather remarkable. Apart? Lena, do you think I'll ever be good at seeing into people the way you do? Lena shrugged and gave a little smile. Oh, I don't know. Shu cocked her head, remembering little incidents here and there across the last few months. Lena Gu almost never lied outright. She seemed to realize what that would do to her credibility. But Lena could deceive, even in the face of a direct question. Do you know, Lena, when you say, oh, I don't know, and shrug, that means you're thinking not in a million years? Lena's eyes widened. She gave Shu's hand a squeeze. Um, well, there you go. Maybe in this case it won't take a million years. Good. Because I want to tell you, Lena. I don't think Robert is the SOB you remember. I think he's really changed. Lena's hand slipped away from hers. I take it back. In your case, a million years may not be enough. Shu reached out, but Lena's hand was back in her lap. Never mind. There were things that had to be said. Robert was brutal in the beginning, but look how he has helped Juan. I have a theory. She flicked the nature citation across the table at Lena. This wasn't really her own theory. Robert has had the equivalent of major trauma, the sort of thing that rebuilds a personality's worldview. You read too much crap science, Shu. Leave that to us professionals. It's as if he's been all unwound. He has his memories, but physically he's just a young man. He has a second chance to get things right. Can't you see that, Lena? Lena flinched at the words, then hunched forward even more. She was silent for a long moment, staring down at her twisted body, her head swaying in gentle negation. Finally, she cranked her gaze up to Shu's. Something that might have been a tear glinted in her eye. You have a lot to learn, my girl. And with that, Lena backed away from the table, her chair making an agile rise and turn. Afraid I'm done for the evening. She rolled off toward her bedroom. Shu took care of the dishes. Usually Lena insisted on doing the kitchen work. That's something I can still do with my own hands, she often said. Not tonight. And if I were just a little more clever about people, thought Shu, I might know why. 35. The Missing Apostrophe Zulfikar Sharif was no longer in the graduate program at Oregon State. Robert encountered a very old-fashioned error message. No longer a registered student, no longer at OSU. Even Sharif's enum was a stub labeled vacated. That was a little scary. Robert hunted around. Worldwide, there were about a thousand matches for Z asterisk Sharif. None of the accessible ones were a good match. The rest were people trying with various degrees of competence to keep their privacy. 
but the Zulfi Sharif whom Robert sought was still a techno-bumpkin. After an hour or two, Robert had tracked him down to the University of Kolkata. Sharif was very subdued. Professor Blandings dismissed me. From the OSU graduate program? In my time, we professors were not so powerful. Professor Blandings had help from your authorities. I spent several weeks trying to explain myself to some very insistent U.S. government agents. They couldn't believe that I was an innocent who had succeeded in being multiply hijacked. Hmm. Robert looked away from Zulfi Sharif, at the city all around them. The day looked hot and muggy. Just beyond their small table, crowds swirled, young people laughing and smiling. The skyline had its share of tall and ivory towers. It was the Kolkata of modern Indian vision. For a moment he was tempted to open a second naysayer channel and try to figure out what was real and what was hype. No, concentrate on figuring what part of Zulfi Sharif is real and what is hype. I suppose the best evidence the cops think you're innocent is that they let you return to India. Indeed so, though sometimes I wonder if I'm not just a fish on a very long line. He gave a wan smile. I really did want to do my thesis about you, Professor Gu. In the beginning it was academic desperation. You were the trophy I could sell to Annie Blandings. But the more we talked, the more I... How much was you, Sharif? How many? I wondered that, too. There were at least two besides myself. It was a most frustrating experience, sir, especially at the beginning. I would be in the middle of speaking with you, going through the questions that I knew would impress Professor Blandings, and then at a whack I was a mere bystander. So you could still hear and see? Yes, often that was so. So often that I think the others were using me to generate some questions for inspiration, and then warping them to their own purposes. In the end, and my confessing this to your police was a great mistake, in the end I came to treasure these bizarre interventions. My dear hijackers were asking questions I would never have conceived. So I hung around throughout your librarium conspiracy, and in the end I looked the perfect foreign provocateur. And if you hadn't been there the night of the riot, my Mary would have died. What did you see, Zulfi? What? Well, I had been most thoroughly locked out that evening. The other players on my persona had agendas that did not include any discussion of literature, but I kept trying to get through. The police claimed I never would have succeeded without terrorist assistance. In any case, for a few seconds I could see you lying there on the floor. You asked for my help. The lava was creeping up against your arm. He shivered. In truth, I couldn't see any more than that. Robert remembered that conversation. It was one of the sharpest fragments in the jumble. The two of them, 8,000 miles apart, sat in silence for a few moments. Then Sharif cocked his head quizzically. Now I am well quit of my perilous literary research. And yet I cannot resist asking. You are at the beginning of your new life, Professor. Can we expect something new under the sun? For the first time in human history, a new secret of the ages? Ah. You're right, there is room for something more. But you know, some secrets are beyond the expression of those who experience them. Not beyond you, sir. Robert found himself smiling back. Sharif deserved the truth. I could write something, but it would not be poetry. I got a new life, but the Alzheimer's cure, it destroyed my talent. Oh, no. I had heard of Alzheimer failures, but I honestly never suspected you. Thinking there might be another canto of the secrets was about the only good thing I still hoped to come out of this adventure. I am so sorry. Don't be too sorry. I wasn't a very nice person. Sharif looked down and then back at Robert. I had heard that. In the days I couldn't get through to you, I interviewed your former colleagues at Stanford, even Winston Blount when he wasn't making conspiracies. But it doesn't matter, sir. I eventually realized that you had lost your sadistic edge. Then surely you would have guessed the rest. Do you think so? 
Do you think your talent and your malevolence were a package deal? Sharif leaned forward, engaged in a way that Robert had not seen since their interviews a weeks before. I doubt that. But researching the issue would be intriguing. For that matter, I have long wondered, and been too timid to ask, what really changed in you? Were you a decent fellow from the time of your dementia cure? Or was the change as in Dickens' A Christmas Carol, with new experience making you kindlier? He rocked back. I could make such a splendid thesis out of this. His eyes swept back to Robert, questioning. No way. Yes, yes, said Sharif, nodding. It is such a great opportunity that I almost forgot my resolutions. And the first of those resolutions is no more activities that get me mixed up with the security authorities. He looked up, as if at unseen watchers. Do you hear that? I am clean. Clean in body and soul and even in my fresh-fried clothes. And then addressing Robert once more. In fact, I have a new academic major. Oh? Yes. It will take several semesters of prerequisite fulfillment, but that will be worth it. You see, the University of Kolkata is starting a new department with new faculty, real go-getters. We have a long way to go, considering the competition from the universities in Mumbai, but the people here have funding, and they're willing to take on fresh faces such as myself. He grinned enthusiasm at Robert's puzzled look. It's our new institute of Bollywood studies. A combination of cinema and literature. I'll be studying the influence of 20th century lit on the latest Indian arts. And, much as I regret our lost opportunities, Professor Gu, I am so happy to be in a major that will keep me out of further trouble with the authorities. Robert was actually busy between semesters. His contrived sink hack had raised him to the lowest level of guruhood. He'd been noticed by a small company called Comms R Us. In a way, it was a traditional firm. It was old, five years old, and it had three full-time employees. So it wasn't as nimble as some operations, but it had managed several innovations in concurrent communications. Comms R Us had paid Robert to consult for a period of three weeks. And though it was clear that the consult was mainly an opportunity for Comms R Us to decide if Robert Goo had any future, Robert jumped at the chance. For the first time since he lost his marbles, he was creating something that others valued. Otherwise, things were not going entirely smoothly. Juan Orozco was gone. His parents had taken him on vacation to Puebla, where they were visiting his mother's grandfather. Juan still showed up occasionally, but Miri was not talking to him. I'm trying not to care, Robert. Maybe if I stop bothering her, Miri will let me start over with her. Nevertheless, Robert had the feeling the boy might have camped out on their front steps if his parents had not dragged him away. I'll talk to her, Juan, I promise. Juan had looked at him doubtfully. But don't make her think I put you up to it. I won't. I'll choose the time carefully. Robert had decades of experience in choosing the right time to strike. This should have been easy. Miri had wangled an incomplete grade on her demo project, that meant that when she finally did perform, at the end of the next semester, she would have even higher standards to meet. For now, she was a busybody around the house, mainly taking care of her mother. Alice Goo was a ghost of her former self. The steel of the last fifteen weeks of their acquaintance had been torn out of her. The result was... charming. More evenings than not, Alice and Miri were down in the kitchen, attempting to make hard work out of modern cookery. His daughter-in-law was distant, but her smile wasn't the meaningless reflex it had often seemed before. Then Bob was out of town again, and Miri seemed to be busier than ever. Every day she had some news for him about her searches on burns and limb rehabilitation. Real soon now he should use that as an excuse to set her straight about Juan, and about himself. Maybe tonight was the right night. Bob was still out of town. Alice had retired to the ground floor den shortly after dinner. None of Miri's board games tonight. They were fun, one of the nicer things about life since that terrible night at UCSD. But tonight Robert had finally seen his way through some of his comms R us problems. Working on them, he lost track of the time. When he came up for air, he had some results, maybe things worth showing his employers. What a good night. 
Downstairs, a door slammed. His eyes were still on his work, but he heard Miri come pounding up the stairs. She raced down the hallway and into her bedroom. A few minutes later, she came out. There was a knock on his bedroom door. Hi, Robert. Can I show you some things I discovered today? Sure. She bounced into the room and grabbed a chair. I found three more projects that could help your arm. In fact, the medical condition of Robert Goo's left arm was best characterized by its absence. It was completely burned off at the lower forearm. There were two places near the shoulder where all that was left was a strip of flesh. His prosthesis was more like an old-style plaster cast. But interestingly, the medics had passed on the opportunity to whack the thing off and fit him with some modern miracle. Reed Weber, the physician's assistant, had resurfaced now that the MDs needed someone to front for them, had explained the situation, though perhaps not in quite the way the doctors would like. You're a victim of the new field of prospective medicine, Robert. You see, we have prosthetics with five-finger motor control and with almost the durability of a natural arm, but they're a little heavy and the sensor system is nowhere near the real thing. On the other hand, there are clear trends in nerve and bone regeneration tech. Even though no one knows quite how it will happen, or if it will happen, the odds are that in 18 months they'll be able to grow out from what you have now into an effective natural arm. And the MDs are afraid that debriding what's left of your arm for a prosthesis might make the later solution much more expensive. So for a while you are stuck with a solution that wouldn't have impressed your own grandfather. And Robert had nodded and not complained. Every day with this dead weight on his shoulder was a small penance, a reminder of how close his foolishness had come to destroying lives. Miri was oblivious of all that. In fact, she had dismissed prospective medicine as stupidity. Miri believed in making her own medical solutions. So there are these three teams, Robert. One of them has grown a complete monkey's paw, another is into whole limb prosthesis, but very lightweight, and the third has some improvements in neurocoding. I bet your comms R Us friends would put you up as a fast-track guinea pig. What do you think? Robert touched the plastic shell that held the remains of his arm. Uh, I think a deal involving a monkey's paw is too risky for me. No, no, you wouldn't have a monkey's paw. The monkey's paw was just... Then she got a googling look. Robert, I'm not talking about some old story. I'm trying to help you. I want to more than ever. I owe you. Yeah, tonight was definitely the night to set her straight. You don't owe me. Hey, I can't remember it, but Bob told me what he saw. You put your arm in the way of molten rock. You held it there. Her face twisted with imagined pain. You saved me, Robert. I saved you, kiddo, yes. But I created the problem. I played ball with something evil. Or something very strange. You were desperate. I knew that. I just didn't know how deep things would get. So we both made a mess. It really was time to get down on his knees and beg forgiveness. But first, let her know why this was beyond forgiveness. The words were hard to say. Miri, you made a mess trying to fix things. But I... I was the guy who set up your mother for what practically killed her. There, it was said. Miri sat very still. After a moment, her gaze fell. She said softly, I know. Now they both were very still. Bob told you? No. Alice did. She looked up. And she told me they still can't figure out how what you did could have brought her down. It's okay, Robert. Then abruptly, she was crying. And Robert did get on his knees. His granddaughter threw her arms around his neck. She was in full ball now, her body shaking. She pounded his back with her fists. I'm so sorry, Mary. I... Mary's wail got even louder, but she stopped beating on him. After half a minute, her weeping trailed off into choking sobs, and then silence. But she still held on to him. Her words were halting and muffled. I just found out that Alice is... 
Alice is back in training. Oh. She's not even recovered. Mary was sobbing again. What does your father say? Bob is out of touch tonight. Out of touch? In this day and age? Mary pushed him back. She started to wipe her face on her sleeve, then grabbed from the box of tissues he set beside her. Really out of touch. Tactical blackout. D don't you follow the news, Robert? Um. Read between the lines. Bob is off somewhere making places and things glow in the dark. She wiped energetically at her face, and her voice returned to something like its usual tones. Okay, maybe not literally. Bob talks that way when he has to do things he really doesn't want to do. But I watch the rumor mills, and I watch Bob and Alice. Between the three, I'm a pretty good guesser. Sometimes Bob is out of touch, and I read about something wonderful or something terrible happening in another country. Sometimes Alice goes into training, and I know that somebody needs help, or else very bad things may happen. Right now, Bob is away, and Alice is back in training. She hid behind her hands for a moment, then resumed wiping her face. My g guess is that the top rumors are right. Something awful happened at the library riot, worse than the Gen Gen takeover. Now all the superpowers are running scared. They think someone has figured how to crack their security. A Alice almost admitted that tonight. That was her excuse. Robert sat down again, but on the edge of his chair. His great confession had vanished into the abyss. You should talk to Bob when he gets back. I will. And he'll argue with her. You've heard that yourself. But in the end, he can't stop her. This time, maybe he can go over her head or get the doctors to back him up. Mary hesitated, seemed to relax a fraction. Yes, this time is different. I, I'm i glad we can talk, Robert. Anytime, kiddo. But then she was quiet. Finally, Robert said, Are you conspiring or just Googling? Mary shook her head. N neither. I tried to call someone, but they're not answering. Ah. You know, Mary, Juan is in Puebla visiting his great-grandfather. He may not be wearing all the time. Juan? I wouldn't call him. He's not very bright, and when the crunch came in Pilchner Hall, he was useless. You can't know that. I know I was down in the tunnels by myself. Mary, I've talked to Juan almost every day since I started at Fairmont. He wouldn't let you down. Think back to the times you do remember. You two must have conspired a lot to keep track of me. I'll bet he played fair. He could be your good friend, another person you could talk to. For once, Mary's chin came down. You know I can't talk to him about these things. I couldn't talk to you, except you already know. That's true, there are things you can't tell him. But... I think he deserves better from you. Mary's eyes flicked up to meet his, but she didn't speak. Remember how I told you, you remind me of your great-aunt Kara? Mary nodded. You were happy to learn that. But I think you know how I treated Kara. It was like the Ezra Pound incident over and over again for years. I never had a chance to make up for that. She died when she was not much older than Alice is now. Tears were back in Miri's eyes, but she held the tissues tight on her lap. I went through my whole life like that, Miri. I married a wonderful lady who loved me very much. Lena put up with more than I ever dumped on Kara, and for years longer. Even after I drove her away, you know how she helped me at Rainbow's End. And now she is dead, too. Robert looked down and for a moment all he could think of was lost opportunities. Where was I? Oh. So, I think you owe Juan. Dumping on him isn't in the same league as my screw-ups, but you still have a chance to set things right. He looked at Mary. Her shoulders were hunched. She was shredding the tissues she held in her hands. 
just think about it, okay, Mary? I didn't mean to get carried away. Finally, she spoke. Have you ever broken a solemn promise, Robert? Where did that come from? But before he could get his mouth in gear, Mary continued. Well, I just did. And with that, she grabbed the box of tissues and ran from the room. Mary. By the time he got into the hall, Mary had disappeared into her room. Robert dithered for a moment. He could go down and pound on her door, or maybe he should message her. He stepped back into his room, turned, and saw the golden light on the table right beside where Mary had been sitting. It was an enum, granting some kind of limited message capability. But he already had that and more for Mary. He opened the golden enum and looked inside. This one was for Lena Llewellyn Goo. Robert sat beside the enum for almost half an hour. He studied it. He studied the documentation. It was exactly what he thought. Lena lives. There was no physical address, but he could write her a simple message. It took him only two hours to do so. Less than two hundred words. They were the most important words that Robert Goo had ever written. Robert couldn't sleep that night. Morning came. Then afternoon. There was no reply. Epilogue Six weeks passed. Robert was watching the news more now. He had learned that the world can bite you. He and Mary compared notes on what they saw. The raids at the edge of the world were allegedly over. Rumors held that little had been discovered. Rumors, and some real news, spoke of scandals in the EU, Indian, and Japanese intelligence services. All the great powers remained very nervous about insert your favorite crazy-ass theory here. On the home front, Bob was back. Robert and Miri took that to mean that some disaster theories were much less likely. Others remained scarily viable. Indeed, Bob blew his stack when he learned about Alice. Things got very tense around the house. Both Robert and Miri sensed heartbreaking battles hiding behind the looks and silences. Miri had years of putting together the clues. Her best guess was that Bob had appealed to the doctors, that he had complained far up the chain of command. None of it mattered. Alice remained in training. Somewhere in all of this, Juan returned from Puebla. Miri didn't have much to say about him, but they were talking. The boy was smiling more. From Lena, there was... silence. She lived. His messages didn't bounce, and her enum remained accessible. It was like talking into an infinite void. And Robert did keep talking, a message every day, and wondering what more he should do. Xu Shang had left Rainbow's End. Lena asked me to leave, Xu told him. Maybe I pushed her too hard. But I know where she lives now. I could go there. I could make her see how much I've changed. And maybe that would just prove that he had changed in all the ways that didn't matter. So Robert didn't drive out to Rainbow's End. He didn't snoop the public cams there. But he continued to write her. And when he was outside, he often imagined that besides the 7 by 24 attention of the security authorities, perhaps there was another watcher, one who would someday forgive him. Meantime, he threw himself into schoolwork. There was so much to learn, and the rest of his time was spent with Comms R Us. They liked his work. Two months after the Great Library Riot, Robert returned to UCSD. He had lost track of Winston and Carlos. It was strange when he thought about it. For a few days, the cabal had been such a tight conspiracy, but now they never spoke. The easiest explanation was mutual shame. They had been used and their various agendas had come close to killing a lot of people. There was truth in all that. But for Robert, there was another explanation, something weirder and almost as unsettling. The cabal was like a childhood clique. The animosities and closeness now vanished as his childlike attention morphed in new directions. Sometimes the desperation of the fall semester seemed almost as remote as his life in the 20th century. There were so many things he wanted to learn and do and be, and they had so little to do with what had previously consumed him. 
In the end, it was his project with Comms R Us that brought him back to campus. Jitter and latency were bad problems in video protocols, worse in voice, and absolute death for touchy-feely interfaces. Haptic robots were getting better and better, but they were almost useless when run over the net. Now, Comms R Us wanted Robert to try his crazy sync schemes on haptics. In the aftermath of the Librarium and the riot, the UCSD administration had dumped further bushel baskets of cash on the library. In some ways, its touchy-feely experience was better than commercial parks like Pyramid Hill. The question was, how could you export that across the net? He had done plenty of reading, studied the design of touchy-feely bots, but until the problem was solved, there would be no substitute for first-hand experience. He took a car down to UCSD. Two months. Not really a long time. The server shacks on the north side of Warshawski Hall had merged. There was a soccer field where the software engineering department had been. Robert could see that this wasn't destruction related to the library riot or the marine landings. It was the normal churn of any modern institution. He took the footpath through the eucalyptus. As always, coming out of the trees gave the naked eye a sudden vision across miles of tableland into the mountains. And there, standing before it all, was still the Geisel Library. It was by far the oldest building at UCSD, one of the 20% that had been rebuilt after the Rose Canyon quake. But that damage had been nothing compared with what befell it during the riot, when the Cabal sponsors literally ripped the east side from its foundations. Any other building on campus would have been razed after such trauma, perhaps restored if it was of sufficient historical value, but neither had happened in the case of the Geisel Library. Robert walked around the north side of the library, down past the loading dock. He had seen views of the structure immediately after the riot, the floors sloping and sagging, the ad hoc buttresses that the fire department had added as the internal servos burned out, the chunks of 20th century concrete that littered the terrace. Those signs of destruction were gone. The overhanging floors were level once more. The university had not undertaken a simple restoration. On the west, it looked almost unchanged, but there was perceptible distortion above the loading dock, and on the east, there was a graceful twisting of the building's great pillars. Where those pillars had moved, where the library had walked, now the pillars were set. At the base was grass and smooth concrete, the tiled path that was the snake of knowledge. Looking upward, lush ivy followed the curving twist of the concrete. Where the ivy ended, there were lines of colored pebbles set in the pillars, making bands like stress fringes in illuminated crystal. And then above that, the rectangle of each floor was slightly turned from the one beneath it. From the building specifications, Robert could see that some of the pillars were carbon fibers embedded in lightweight composite. Yet the building was as real and solid as it looked to the naked eye. More than any building on campus, this was real. This building lived. He took the stairs, stopping at each floor to look around. He recognized the Hotsec domain. There were still librarians militant here. But I thought their circle got booted out. In other places, there was craziness he recognized as Scutamudi. The Scucci mythos was eclectic nonsense that he had never figured out. How it fit with library metaphors was beyond him but the Scoochies had won the riot and the library. In other places, both belief circles were running in parallel. You could choose which you wanted, or neither. Robert concentrated on management and naked eye views. After all, he was here to study the touchy-feely support. There were haptic robots everywhere, not as many as at Pyramid Hill, but the university had crammed almost as much parallel variety into a few floors of a single building, UCSD had spent an enormous amount of money on the gadgets. There were some free-running models, but most were surface-mounted. These were fast. As quick as a librarian militant could reach for the vision of a book, a robot would slide into position, altering its surface just where it would meet the reacher's hand. Robert stood for a few moments, watching the action. The naked eye view was like nothing in his experience. When the student... That's what she was without her librarian militant cover, turned the book in her hands, the haptics flipped in coordination, never losing contact or slipping in a way different from the vision it was supporting. 
when she set it on a table, the haptics moved instantly to another task, this supporting some scoochy client in even more unintelligible maneuvering. He noticed that the girl was staring at him. Sorry, sorry, I just haven't seen all this before. Tragic, not? And she gave him a wide grin. Yes, uh, tragic. Somewhere on a high protocol layer, all this involved books and the contents of books. At the physical layer, it was even more fascinating. He wandered along, his mind far away, trying to imagine how the intricate dance of the haptics could be replicated on robots that were at some distance on the network. If both sides had human players, it would be infernally hard. But if it was an asymmetric service, maybe... Hey, Professor Goo, look up here. Robert looked in the direction of the voice. The ceiling above him had become transparent, as had the one above that. His view had tunneled through to the sixth floor. Carlos Rivera was looking back down at him, a happy smile on his face. Long time no see, Professor. Come on up, why don't you? Sure. Robert found his way back to the stairwell. The stairs were free of haptic diversions. As was the sixth floor. But there were no more books, either. Someone had set up some offices. Rivera gave him a tour. He seemed to be just about the only one on the floor. Right now, the team is spread all over. Some of them are working on the new extensions underground. So, what's your job now? Still library staff, I assume? Carlos hesitated. Well, I have several titles now. It's a long story. Hey, come into my office. His office was on the southeast corner, with windows overlooking the snake path and the esplanades. In fact, this was just where the cabal had held its meetings. Carlos waved him to a seat and sat behind a wide desk. Carlos himself. He was still overweight, still wore the bottle glass spectacles and the old-fashioned t-shirt. But there was a difference. This Carlos seemed relaxed, energetic, happy with whatever he was doing. I was hoping we could talk but things have just been so busy since, you know, since we almost fucked things up beyond all recognition. Yes, I know what you mean. We were very lucky, Carlos. He glanced around the office. Nowadays, rank could be hard to see in visible things, but much of the furniture and plants were really what they seemed. You were going to tell me about your job? Yes. It's a little embarrassing. I'm the new director of library support. That's the title the university recognizes. In some circles, that's not the important title. Downstairs and across the world, you'll find that I'm other things, like dangerous knowledge and the greatest lesser scoochamoot. But those are two different belief circles. I thought you read that the scoochies won it all, right? Not quite. When the dust settled, there was a very bizarre... Well, compromise isn't quite the right word. Alliance, or distanced merger, might be better. He leaned back in his chair. It's scary how close we came to blowing up this end of San Diego, but we stopped just short. And that crazy riot made more money than a new cinema release. More important, it sucked money and creativity from all over, and the school administration was smart enough to take advantage. He hesitated, a little sadness creeping into his voice. So we failed in everything we told each other we were trying to do. The books are gone, physically gone. But the Geisel Library lives, and these two crazy belief circles are driving its content all over the world. But you've seen that, right? That's why you came down here? I came down to study your haptics, actually. Robert explained his interest in distanced interactive touch. Hey, that's great. Both groups have been beating on me to extend our reach. But at a higher level, what did you think of what they're doing to the library experience? Um, the librarian militants look the same as before, I guess. It's an amusing interface, if you like that sort of thing. The Scoochies, I tried to see what they're doing, but it doesn't make sense. It's so scattered, almost as if each individual book is its own consensual reality. Almost. The Scoochies have always been eclectic. Now that they have a librarium, they're building game consensus down to fine-grained topic levels, often down to individual paragraphs. 
It's much more subtle than the hot sex stuff, though children pick up on it very quickly. Their real power is that scoochies can blend realities. That's what's happened with them and the hot sexians. The scoochies come from all over, even from the failed states. Now they're feeding the digitizations back outwards. Wherever it fits, the hot sec people are running things. Other places, other visions, but all with access to the entire body of the library. If you can crack the problem of remote interactive touch, it should make their attraction even greater. Carlos looked around his office, where the cabal had plotted for such very different ends. An awful lot has changed in just two months. What do you think really happened that night, Carlos? Was the riot intended to distract from what we four were doing, or was it the other way around? I've thought about that a lot. I think the riot was a diversion, but one that got way out of hand and ended up causing immense... What's the opposite of collateral damage? Collateral benefit? Sharif, whoever, he was more often a rabbit to me, was a merry madman. Rabbit. That was what his interrogators had called the mysterious stranger. It was also what the stranger had called itself there at the end. Well, our part of the business was darker. Rabbit manipulated all of us, each according to our own weaknesses. Carlos nodded. Yes. Rabbit promised each of us our secret wish, then defaulted after we had committed the necessary treachery. Though to be honest, Robert was pretty sure the critter was kaput. Maybe things would have been different if it had survived. His burning hope in the stranger's promise had powered Robert's treason. That was cold ashes now. Thank God. Carlos leaned forward. Behind the bottle glass specks, his eyes looked skeptical. Okay, said Robert. Maybe Rabbit didn't promise everyone something. I think the power-assisted scheming was its own reward for Tommy. That's probably so. But the librarian did not look convinced. Look, we'd know if any of the promises came true. It would be spectacular. I'll bet Winston wanted to... Where is Winnie these days? He was looking up the answer, but Carlos already had it. Dean Blount was hired by the university last month in the Division of Arts and Letters. Robert's gaze skittered across his search result. But as an entry-level administrative assistant? Yes, it's bizarre. The current dean of A&L is Jessica Laskowitz. She's another medical retread. Back in the aughts, she was a secretary in the division. Nowadays, the career track for admin assistants doesn't have any ceiling, but Winston is starting awfully far down, and the best gossip is that he and Laskowitz never got along. Oh my. I guess maybe Winston finally made peace with his dreams. Like me. In any case, it meant the mysterious stranger was really gone, his extravagant promises dead. He looked up at Carlos Rivera and felt the stirring of a vast surprise. Robert had very little of his old people sense. Nowadays, the obvious had to beat him over the head with a club. What... what about you? Do you notice anything different about me, Professor? Robert gave him a close look, then glanced again around the real plush office. Carlos had done well for himself, but Robert had never thought that worldly success would be his demand of the stranger. You seem happier, more confident, more articulate. Bingo. You haven't said one word of Mandarin. Not a single jit slip. Carlos's reply was a smile of purest joy. So you've lost the language? No. Chi shi wo hai ke yi shuo zhong wen, bu guo bu xiang yi qian na me liu li le. And I haven't had a seizure in more than six weeks. The jit doesn't rule me. Now I can enjoy the language. It has been a great help in working with the Chinese inframagical people. We'll be merging their capture of the British Library with what came out of Huertas as default. Robert was silent for a long moment. Then he said, Your cure, it could be coincidence. I've wondered. This is a medical breakthrough that came out of groups in Turkey and Indonesia. It had nothing to do with the Veterans Administration or institutional research programs. But that's the way of most medical breakthroughs these days. And I've had no gloating messages from Rabbit. Everything is in the open, even if the news hasn't got much traction. You see, this treatment for JIT syndrome isn't effective for most victims. They contacted me through yellow ribbons because I'm smack in the middle of the likeliest genotypes. 
He shrugged. I guess that could be a coincidence. Yes. The heavenly minefield. But it's an awfully big coincidence, Rivera continued. I got what I asked for, just a few weeks after I did my part of the bargain. And some of my scoochy progress has been strange. I've made agreements in weeks that should have taken a year. Somebody's helping me along. I think you're wrong about Rabbit. Maybe he's just lying low. Maybe he can't do all the miracles at once. Professor? Are you okay? Robert had turned away and pressed his forehead against the cool window glass. I don't need this. I am happy with the new me. He opened his eyes and looked out through tears. Down below was the familiar footpath, the snake of knowledge wriggling up the hillside toward the library. Perhaps the mysterious stranger really was a god, or had grown to be one, a trickster god. Professor? I'm okay, Carlos. Maybe you're right. They chatted a few minutes more. Robert wasn't quite sure what they said, though he remembered that Carlos seemed a little worried for him, perhaps mistaking Robert's raw confusion for some kind of medical emergency. Then he was down the elevator and back on the sunny plaza, and hovering imminent all around him were the worlds of art and science that humankind was busy building. What if I can have it all? The End End of Rainbow's End by Werner Vinge V-E-R-N-O-R-V-I-N-G-E -E. Read by Mark Ashby in the studios of Potomac Talking Book Services Incorporated for the Library of Congress, November 2006. Published by Tor, Tom Doherty Associates, LLC, 175 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10010. Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.